Hello everyone and welcome back to another True Crime Mysteries video. Thank you all for being here. Today we're discussing three honeymoons that ended in murder. Let's get into it. Honeymoons are meant to be the first adventure in a long and happy marriage. It's a time to bond, relax, and celebrate as a couple, and look ahead to their journey together. But for some, honeymoons turned into a nightmare full of terror, leaving newlywed brides murdered and sometimes their husbands as the prime suspects. Number 1. Christy Chen On July 7, 2022, newlyweds 36-year-old Christy Chen and 38-year-old Bradley Dawson checked into the luxurious, all-inclusive Turtle Islands Resort. Christy's parents were regulars at the elite private resort, and they paid for their daughter and son-in-law to spend their honeymoon there. They thought the beautiful beaches and breathtaking scenery would help solidify the foundation of the couple's lifelong commitment, but little did they know it would be the place where their daughter would meet a tragic end at the hands of her own husband. Christy worked as a pharmacist in Memphis, Tennessee, while Dawson worked as an IT professional for Youth Villages, a nonprofit which helps children. Christy and Bradley met in November 2021 and got married three months later after a whirlwind romance. And before their ill fated honeymoon, they shared a new townhome in Elsie Avenue in the Cooper Young area in Memphis. On the night of July 9th, Christy and Bradley were enjoying themselves at a party on the beach with the resort staff and other guests. Witnesses later said they appeared to be very drunk and that tensions rose between them when Bradley started dancing and acting inappropriately with another woman at the party. Christy argued with her husband over this, they left the party, and the argument continued on the beach till they reached their private bungalow, where their fight continued. Guests in the bungalow next to there said that they heard arguing, banging, a loud scream, and then silence. The next morning, the couple failed to come down for breakfast. While this wasn't exactly unusual, a housekeeper went to check the room. There, she found the body of Christy Chen on the bathroom floor. The post-mortem exam later reported that she had suffered multiple traumatic injuries to her body and shoulders, lacerations to her face, and blunt force trauma to the head. On the night of the murder, a night watchman said they saw Bradley Dawson walking along the beach before he went back to his private bungalow. There, he left his GPS watch and mobile phone, only taking his passport and wallet, before fleeing via a kayak across the water, three miles away, to a secluded beach on the Matakawalavu Island. From there, he wanted to head to the mainland by boat, hoping to leave Fiji, but he never made it that far. A local man found Dawson wandering on the beach on July 10th around 3 p.m. The man said that Dawson appeared to be disturbed and was bruised and bleeding from his palms and feet, injuries he stated had come from falling into a nearby coral reef. The man offered Dawson water and help, and he started rambling about how he used a kayak to paddle to the island between 2 and 3 a.m. after having a fight with his wife. However, the kayak that Dawson claimed that he'd used to travel to the other island had never been found. Before being found by that man, Dawson had been missing for 36 hours and police had been on the hunt for him since Christie's body was found. A team of police officers soon arrived on Matakawali Island to take Dawson to custody. He was taken to Fiji's main island where he was charged with murder. Dawson maintained that Christie's death was an accident. He told the police that he'd gotten into a drunken fight with his wife in their bungalow, which later escalated to a physical confrontation, resulting in a shattered window and cracked toilet. He said to the police, Christy was next to the toilet, she was hurt, there was blood and a cut on her face. Then he told them that he freaked out and fled using a kayak. He claimed that when he left, Christy had been fine. However, that doesn't match the evidence, and it certainly doesn't explain why he was found miles away with only his wallet and passport. If convicted, Dawson faces life in prison. He had a bail hearing set for September 14th, which was denied. He has pleaded not guilty and is awaiting further court dates, but his lawyer has stated that it could take up to two years for the Fiji government to prosecute. He's being held in jail while he awaits trial. In an interview with Good Morning America, an ex-girlfriend of Dawson said that he was often jealous and controlling and that on one occasion he pushed her, 
They broke up, and Dawson married another woman in 2019. That marriage ended in divorce, which was finalized this past January, one month before he met Christy. Number 2. Annie Dewani Annie Adocha was born on March 12, 1982, to a family of Indian origin. Her family used to live in Uganda, but were forced to leave in the early 1970s after the country's president expelled all Asians living there. They were granted residence in Sweden and settled in Maristad, where Annie was born and raised. Annie had two siblings, a sister and a brother, and she doted on both of them. Annie was described as the heart of the family, always making people laugh and always making people feel loved. She was a sweet child who grew into a sweet and caring adult. For as long as anyone could remember, Annie had always dreamed of being a mother and had looked forward to growing up, getting married, and having a large family. After university, Annie moved to Stockholm, where she worked as an engineer for a telecommunications company. Stockholm was also close to her sister, which she loved, and she spent as much time as she could with her young niece and nephew, who she adored. Annie met Trianne Dewani, a British millionaire in London in 2009, after a mutual contact gave Trianne Annie's details and he arranged a date. According to Trianne, he was instantly attracted to Annie, for he found her as ambitious as he was. However, the feeling wasn't exactly mutual. Annie told her sister that she wasn't particularly interested in Trianne, but after a few dates, she grew to like him. The couple maintained a long-distance relationship until Annie moved to the UK in March 2010, and they moved in together into a house in Bristol. A little over a year after their first meeting, Shrian flew Annie to Paris on a private jet and proposed to her. They spent the next three months in Mumbai, India, planning a lavish wedding. And on October 29, 2010, the couple tied the knot in a spectacular wedding that lasted for three days. They planned on having another civil ceremony in the UK for friends who had been unable to attend the Indian wedding. According to Annie's sister, the honeymoon plans had been something Trianne was supposed to put together, and it had surprised her when it was revealed they were going to South Africa. It was planned to be a six-week honeymoon. Later, the Hinosha family revealed that the smiles and the fairy tale romance were just a facade. Amy Denborg, Annie's sister, said that Shrian was a controlling perfectionist, and Annie didn't really like that. A few days before the wedding, she sent her sister messages saying, fighting a lot with Shrian, wish I'd never got engaged, and it's rumored that she had been crying on the plane over to South Africa, sending a series of texts implying that she would be unhappy for the rest of her life. After the couple landed in Cape Town International Airport on November 7, 2010, they took a domestic flight and stayed at the Kruger National Park for four nights. They returned to Cape Town International Airport on November 12, where they met and spoke with private driver Zola Tongo, who drove them to the Cape Grace Hotel. Shran had opted to use a private taxi service instead of the hotel's shuttle service because it was cheaper. According to Shrien, Tongo gave them a tour around the city before dropping them off at the hotel, and the couple agreed to retain him as their private tour guide. After checking into the hotel, Shrien left Annie and went off to speak with Tongo. He later said that they were simply discussing tour plans and that he sought his help in exchanging money to the local currency. On November 13th, Shrien and Annie had dinner at the hotel. They looked like any other ordinary honeymooning couple. They were smiling, holding hands, and being affectionate with one another. But their happiness was short-lived. They awaited Tongo, their cab driver, outside of their hotel, and once he picked them up, he took them to an area called The Strand where the couple had dinner. After dinner, they got back in the cab. Shrian claimed that Annie had wanted to see a more authentic view of South Africa and was offered to be taken out to an area called Gugaletu. Annie was wearing stilettos and a mini dress, an outfit more suitable for a fancy dinner, not the kind of outfit that was appropriate for exploring. Guguletu was known to be a high crime area. It was also an area that tourists are highly encouraged to avoid. Tongo and Dewani would have known the violent nature of the area, and Annie's sister stated that Annie hadn't been young or naive, she was well-traveled and knew the dangers of the area. 
she doesn't believe Shrian's story that Annie had planned to go to that rough area at night. According to the data collected by the South African Institute of Race Relations, over 700 people were murdered in Gugula 2 between 2005 and 2010. This amounts to one murder every two and a half days. Shortly after they turned onto the main road in the township, two armed men hijacked the vehicle. After driving a short distance, Tongo was ejected from the taxi. They held the couple at gunpoint and robbed Shrian of his wallet, designer watch, and mobile phone. Then they drove for about 20 minutes before pushing him out of the vehicle. Shrian claimed that the hijackers told them that they would be unharmed if they cooperated and would be dropped off separately. Hours later, around midnight, Shrian makes it to the police. He reported the hijacking as well as his wife's kidnapping and told South African police that he had been unable to find her. The next morning, at 7.50 a.m., they found the car with Annie's body in the back seat. Her Giorgio Armani wristwatch, a white gold and diamond bracelet, her handbag, and her BlackBerry mobile phone were stolen, but her $25,000 engagement ring had been left behind on the seat next to the body. Annie had died from a single gunshot wound to the neck. The bullet had hit a major artery, and she bled out. On November 17th, Annie's body was returned to the UK on a British Airways flight, accompanied by her newly widowed husband. Six months later, after her death in a Hindu ceremony, her family scattered her ashes in her favorite area of Viren Lake, close to her hometown in Sweden. Initially, the investigation progressed quickly. 26-year-old Zoel Mangeni was detained three days after Annie's body was discovered and was charged with murder, robbery, and aggravated circumstances, as well as kidnapping. Police were able to identify him thanks to his palm print being discovered on the abandoned vehicle. He later confessed and stated that Annie was shot because she wouldn't give the men her handbag. He had claimed the killing had been an accident, and they had only meant to scare her. A few days later, their cab driver, 31-year-old Zola Tonga, and 26-year-old Mizumboro Kwabe were charged with murder, robbery with aggravated circumstances, and kidnapping. A tip from an informant directed the police to Kwabe. Zola initially told authorities that he was ambushed and pulled from the taxi, but he denied any involvement. But when the authorities presented him with evidence connecting him to the kidnapping scheme, he admitted guilt and confessed his involvement to the crime. His confession blew open a whole new scenario that had never even been explored yet. He alleged that he'd been approached by Shrian Dawani and asked for assistance arranging the murder of his new bride. A fourth man, Monde Mabalbo, a hotel worker, was arrested for his involvement in helping to organize the robbery. The three men later supported Tongo's claims and told the police that Shrian Dalwani was the mastermind behind his wife's murder. On November 23rd, Dalwani spoke to the son and rejected all speculation that he was somehow involved in the carjacking, saying, People who suggest this could not have seen us together. This is apparently CCTV footage taken from the hotel the morning after Annie's body was discovered. It is Shrian Dalwani and the man he is speaking to is Zola Tongo. They are talking in the hotel lobby, a meeting he denied. Dewani also wasn't forthcoming with South African law enforcement following Annie's murder. He had left South Africa soon after Annie's murder, and South African law enforcement claimed he didn't cooperate with their investigation, causing further suspicion. However, it was later revealed that Kwabe and Tongo were offered reduced sentences in exchange for guilty pleas and testimonies against Shrian Dewani. At the same time, Mondo Malamambo was granted full immunity from prosecution for the promise of truthful testimony against Dewani. On December 7th, Tongo pleaded guilty to armed robbery and the kidnapping and murder of Annie Dewani. Crimes he alleged were instigated by Shrian Dewani. He was sentenced to 18 years in prison. On February 18, 2012, Kwabe's counsel said that court was unable to provide a fair trial for his client and claimed that he was coerced into confession, but the court denied the claims and he was sentenced to 25 years in prison. As for Mangeni, he pleaded not guilty despite having admitted to his role in the crime. His lawyer claimed that he was coerced. He was suffocated with a plastic bag before signing a statement admitting to his involvement in the killing. 
further saying that the police resorted to irregular methods because of the scrutiny they were under to solve the high-profile case. However, the courts accepted all of their initial statements, alleging that the crime was a contract killing. It was determined through the courts that Mangeni was the one that had been the one to shoot Annie and was sentenced to life in prison. He died in custody from a brain tumor on October 18, 2014. After a long legal battle, Shrian Dewani was extradited from the UK to South Africa on April 7, 2014. Upon arrival, he was arrested, charged, and ordered to stand trial for allegedly arranging the murder of his wife. He was charged with five offenses, conspiracy to commit kidnapping, robbery with aggravated circumstances, murder, kidnapping, and obstructing the administration of justice. He pleaded not guilty to all five charges. But why would Shrian want Annie dead in the first place? According to the prosecution's case, Shrian led a secret life, one that involved a playboy bachelor lifestyle that he wasn't willing to give up, and he wanted a way out of his marriage. They alleged that he was forced by his family to get married, and that he never wanted to. They said that he planned a contract killing and recruited Zola to orchestrate a hijacking in which Annie would be killed, and they would release him unscathed. CCTV footage showing Shrian giving money to Zola was displayed to the court. Shrian was captured on camera, turning to face the hotel security camera before disappearing from view. Another video showed him walking towards a small room with Zola while toting a bag containing money. Additional footage showed him in a five-star Cape Grace hotel, where Zola can be seen sitting on a leather couch, Shrian asking a cleaning man to allow them privacy. Landing in Cape Town, Looking at the beautiful town, the city is, is fantastic, but, but our, our feet doesn't, we, we can't walk freely, like sort of every inch, every step we take, it's like Annie is there, and, and the, the, her memory comes back. We don't want him to come out and do more crimes. He's not, not eligible for that. He is not. He is not prepared for that yet. I think if, if they let him out, they're making a big mistake. The defense argued that the case should be dismissed because of the lack of credible evidence. On November 24, 2014, Dewani was acquitted and exonerated for all involvement with the crimes. The judge ruled that there was not enough credible evidence to link Shrien to the crime and explained her ruling by saying, Mr. Tongo, who was the only witness who could link the accused to the conspiracy, gave evidence to the court, which is impossible and contains so many mistakes, lies, and inconsistencies that one simply cannot know where the lies end and the truth begin. In the circumstances, I make the following order. The application in terms of Section 174 of the Criminal Procedure Act is granted. The accused is found not guilty on this charge, and Mr. Malombo is granted indemnity, is not granted indemnity from prosecution. In 2022, Zola Tongo was granted parole after 12 years in prison, a move that wasn't well received by Annie's family, who attended the parole hearing. We may never truly know what happened that day, if Shrian was involved or if he'd simply been a scapegoat to secure reduced sentences. There are still many questions left unanswered, even after all these years, and despite three men being convicted of Annie's murder, it still doesn't feel like justice was served. Today, we feel really, really sad because we never heard the full story of Shrian. We heard that Shrian has led a double life and that Annie knew nothing about it. And we just wish that Trian had been honest with us, and especially with Ani. The knowledge of not ever knowing what happened to my dearest little sister on the 13th of November 2010. That, that's going to haunt me, my family, my brother, my parents, for the rest of our lives. We've had four years of sleepless nights. and. We, will we ever be able to sleep? We've had tremendous support from the South African public and 
many others around the world. And we're grateful to all of them and thank them from the bottom of our heart. We as a family will make no further comments. And we respectfully ask the media to give us some time and space for reflection. Thank you. Number three, Michaela McCarvey. Known as the Pearl of the Indian Ocean, Mauritius is a much desired destination for millions of travelers, especially honeymooners. But on January 10th, 2011, the beautiful tropical island was the scene of a heinous crime that took the life of new bride Michaela McCarvey. Michaela Hart was a 27 year old Irish language teacher from County Tyrone, Northern Ireland. She met John McCarvey in university in 2005, and the two fell head over heels in love. More than 300 friends and family came together on December 30th, 2010, to celebrate the wedding of John and Michaela. And on New Year's Eve, the wedding celebration melded into a birthday party as Michaela celebrated her birthday as well. A stunning bride, and the couple seemed so happy. They spent the first seven days of their honeymoon in Dubai and were due to spend the rest of it in Mauritius. On January 8th, they checked into the Legends Hotel, a five-star resort that had excellent reviews and was popular for Irish visitors. It was in the fishing village of Grand Guab, northeast of the country. On January 10th, 10 days into their honeymoon, John and Michaela had breakfast in the hotel. Then John went to the golf course while Michaela sunbathed. When they met again, they enjoyed a poolside lunch. Michaela left the table around 2.44 p.m. to walk the short distance to their deluxe room, 1025, to bring down some biscuits to enjoy with a cup of tea. John took pictures and watched some videos as he waited for his wife to return. But 15 minutes later, he noticed Michaela had been gone for a while, longer than it should have been to grab something, so he looked for her. On his way to the room, he realized he had forgotten his key, so he went to the reception. A bellboy opened the door for John, and they found Michaela's body in the bathtub, with the water still running. John lifted her from the bath and tried to revive her, but it was already too late. In an autopsy report, it was revealed that Michaela had several abrasions and bruising to the front of her neck and her collarbone, and the coroner ruled her cause of death to be asphyxiation. It was hypothesized that when Michaela had returned back to their room, she had interrupted a burglary in progress and had been murdered as a result. In Mauritius, Michaela's murder received significant media attention. When a murder takes place in a nation that depends on tourism, of course there will be a pressing need to get the case closed as soon as possible. And given that arrests were made only one day after Michaela's death, it appeared that this case would be resolved quickly. On January 11th, three men who worked at the hotel were arrested for the murder. All three men worked as cleaners for the hotel. They appeared in court in Mauritius on January 12th. Two of the men were charged with murder, and one of the men was charged with conspiracy to murder. The three men all pleaded not guilty, and the case went to trial. The Coy had been granted immunity if he spoke against the other two cleaners, and he alleged that he heard a woman scream. He ran over to room number 1025, and saw the other two men flee the room. He said that both men were wet and appeared to look worried. He also alleged that one of them threatened him later. Thikoi committed suicide years after the trial, though it has been noted as being a suspicious death. Two hotel security guards were also arrested the days following the murder. They were charged with aiding and abetting a crime. Both suspects were shortly released and had all charges against them dropped since they came up with an explanation for why their fingerprints had been in the room. They had helped John when he had called for help upon finding Michaela's body. On January 17, 2011, thousands of mourners attended a special mass that was held simultaneously in Mauritius and Ireland in memory of Michaela. The trial of the two hotel workers accused of murdering Michaela began in Mauritius on May 22, 2012. John told the court that the police had handcuffed him and manhandled him on the day of the murder. They considered him an initial suspect, and he was held in custody for five hours and examined for trace evidence. He even said that one of the officers told him, Why are you crying? You're still young. You can go find another wife. The DNA samples were sent to be examined by forensic experts from England. 
he revealed that there weren't any DNA traces belonging to the two accused. During the trial, the major crimes investigation team of the Mauritius police force faced several criticisms for the handling of the case as they didn't question all the hotel guests. As they didn't question all the hotel guests and staff that day or even preserve the crime scene, they were even accused of coercing the initial confessions made by the two suspects. On July 12th, the judge told the jury of six men and three women not to worry about ramifications their verdict may have on the reputation of Mauritius, as they weren't politicians and it wasn't their job to save the image of the country. The jurors deliberated for two hours before reaching a unanimous verdict, declaring both men not guilty. In a statement released after the verdict, the McCarvey and Hart family said that the seven-week trial had been harrowing and no words could describe the sense of devastation and desolation they felt. On July 15, 2012, a Mauritian newspaper called Sunday Times published 12 black-and-white appalling photographs of the crime scene, including a photograph of Michaela's body on the front page. The Hart and McCarvey family described the act as insensitive and demeaning. The Irish government issued a formal complaint with the government of Mauritius. And on the morning of July 16th, police raided the Sunday Times office and arrested the newspaper's editor, charging him with causing outrage to the public and religious morality. Following the trial, the family of John and Michaela sued the Legends Hotel for £1.6 million. They received the settlement in August 2015 and used it to fund the Michaela Foundation, which ran for 10 years and encouraged young people to lead a life without limits and had goals of continuing the work Michaela did to continue teaching and preserving the Irish language. John remarried in 2016 with the blessing of the Hart family. A new investigation was launched in 2014 after the not guilty verdict, but nothing substantial was uncovered. In 2017, an elite task force was set up to investigate further, but no new evidence was found that warranted reopening the case for a retrial. And in 2022, one of the initial suspects was arrested a second time. He'd been one of the security workers at the hotel, and it was believed that he had been the one to duplicate the room key for Michaela's room. This is one of those cases that seem like, unless there's a confession, it will always remain a mystery. Good afternoon and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you're new to the channel, hello and welcome, and if you're returning, welcome back. Today, we have part one in a two-part series. We are discussing the solved cold case of missing person Bonnie Haim. Let's get into it. Bonnie Lynn Pescudo was born May 20th, 1969 in Jacksonville, Florida. She grew up as a middle child of six children. She was described as having a loving and vivacious personality. She loved surrounding herself with friends and family and loved to laugh. At 16, Bonnie began dating the already graduated Michael Haim. Haim was handsome, charismatic, and very charming. Bonnie's family loved Michael, and when Michael proposed, her family was ecstatic. The two were married on September 12, 1987, the fall after Bonnie's 18th birthday. Upon her graduation and wedding, Bonnie started working as a bookkeeper. She worked at Bernie's Tool and Fastener, a construction supply company that Michael's aunt, Yvonne Haim, and uncle, Bertie Haim, owned. Michael worked there as well as an office manager. Once Bonnie married Michael, things began to change. Behind closed doors, her charming husband became cantankerous. A year after her marriage, Bonnie and Michael had their son, Aaron. Bonnie was described as a devoted mother. Her son was everything to her, and she loved him dearly. Aaron always came first, and everyone around Bonnie knew that. Did it come to your attention in uh, December of 1992, going into January of 1993, that Bonnie was going to leave Michael. Yes. Were you supportive of her in that decision? I stood by her. I, I was supportive in her decision. You said I have some hesitancy. Did you well, want to stay together? That wasn't my call, my judgment. I supported her and her... Um, decision to leave him. Is one of the ways you knew that she was going to leave him the fact that you went searching for apartments with her to see where she was going to take 
Aaron and go live. Yes. I approach the witness, Your Honor. You may. I'm showing you what to do. The enter into evidence. This case is in the 153. I ask you to look at the second page of State's Exhibit 153, uh, Ms. Haim. Do you recognize the signature of uh, Ivan Haim on that document? Yes. And what is the purpose of you signing that document? Renew our objection. Understood. Is it the approval? This was um, just an employment verification. Okay. So you are verifying Bonnie's employment for prospective uh, apartment? Yes. Did you actually go to these apartments with Bonnie to see where she was going to live? I did. Did you also, uh, with Bonnie, figure out what daycare Aaron would be going to? I don't know that she, I don't remember that. I, I remember her inquiring about daycares. I don't remember too much what daycare she went to. The apartment she was looking at, were that, was that those apartments in Orange Park? Yes. And was, where was she living at the time that she was going to leave? She was living in her home on Dolphin Avenue. And where is that located in Jacksonville? That's on the north side of Jacksonville. Where were you living at the time? Orange Park. So she was going to be living close to you? Yes. Those around the couple knew that their marriage was on the rocks and had been for years. The freedoms that Bonnie had expected with adulthood eluded her. Her husband controlled Bonnie in all regards. She worked where he could keep an eye on her. Her car, their house, their bank account were all in her husband's name. She had secretly opened a bank account in her own name and was squirreling away small amounts of money, going as far as having the bank statements delivered to her at the office instead of at home. Michael discovered the statements and forced her to close the account. Instead of a bank account, she would give her friend cash to hold on to for her. By January of 1993, she had over $1,200 and she was ready to leave and take her now three-year-old son, Aaron, with her. She had planned to leave when Michael was on a work trip. She had a deposit down for an apartment and enrolled her son in a new preschool. On January 6th, something happened when Bonnie got home from work. She'd come home with Aaron a little late, around 7 p.m. She was later than usual, but she had several stops after picking up Aaron from daycare. She had stopped at the dry cleaners Walmart and took Aaron to McDonald's for a quick Happy Meal. Yvonne had expected Bonnie that evening. The two were planning a baby shower for a co-worker, and they had planned to write invitations that evening. However, around 8 p.m., Bonnie called Yvonne and told her that she couldn't come over because she and Michael were having a discussion. Yvonne recognized that Bonnie was upset. She was sniffling on the phone and sounded like she was crying. Yvonne offered to bring the things over to Bonnie's house if she needed some company, but Bonnie said it wasn't necessary and she would see her in the morning. The following morning on January 7th, Bonnie and Michael had been expected to be in the office early the next morning. That day, a nurse was coming in to do physicals for all of the employees on the company health insurance. Everyone was asked to go in an hour early to ensure that it didn't disrupt business. To avoid any disruptions with their health insurance, they needed to be there that day for the physical. By 8 a.m., Yvonne and Bernie had become very concerned about Bonnie's absence. Bonnie knew how important it was to be early that day, and it was unlike her to be late for work or miss a meeting. Immediately, they knew something was wrong. One of Bernie's employees came in and told him that Michael had called around 7 a.m. that morning and told him he wasn't coming into work. Bernie thought this was odd and was also irritated because Michael and Bonnie knew how important it was for them to be there. Bernie called over to Bonnie and Michael's house and Michael answered. Bernie asked him why he wasn't coming in and Michael said that he was sick. And when Bernie asked to talk to Bonnie, it was at that point that Michael told him Bonnie wasn't there. Bernie pressed on asking where Bonnie was and Michael said that he didn't know and that they had an argument and she left last night. So uh, everyone was supposed to be at work a little earlier than normal? Yes, sir. So you didn't interfere with your daily business? That's correct. And you could get all that? Uh, pardon me? So you could get all the insurance stuff done? Right, so we could get all the insurance paperwork done and everything. And was that going to be insurance paid through by the business? Uh, yes, sir. So uh, what happened when you got there? Well, we got there and um, we, were, we were getting, I was getting an IV or whatever you call it, taking blood out and uh, I 
uh, Mike, my manager, Mike Robinson, he uh, came and told me that Mike called and said he wasn't coming in that day. Prior to hearing that information from the manager, Mike Robinson, were you, did um, the defendant ever call you and ask where Bucky was? No, sir. And were you aware up until then that he was, whether he was coming in or not? Until uh, Mike Robinson mentioned to me he called in, wasn't coming in. No, I was not aware. So with that information, what did you do? Well, I, I called Bonnie to see where she was at. And, and where did you call? I called their home on Dolphin Avenue. Okay. Prior, and this is on January 7th, 1993, the day that she went missing? Yes, sir. The night before, were you aware of Bonnie calling your home? Or you calling Bonnie's home? She called our home and spoke with Duvan. And you were aware of that? Yes, sir. So going back to the 7th, when you made the phone call, what happened? Uh, Michael answered the phone and he said he wasn't coming in today. And that's okay. I said, let me speak to Bonnie. And he said she wasn't there. So before asking about Bonnie, did the defendant say anything about Bonnie not being home? No, sir. And when he told you that she wasn't home, did you ask where she was? I did. What was the response? He said they had an argument and she left. Did he give you any other details at that time? No, sir. And knowing Bonnie's character, did you find that unusual? I find it very unusual that she would leave Aaron, period. What's the next thing that happened? The next thing happened, um, I received a phone call from one of my police friends, and he asked me if I knew where Bonnie was at, and I said no. And he said, we just found her purse in a dumpster, and you better get over here pretty quick. And so who went to, uh, where'd you go? We went, my wife and I, Ivan and I went, uh, I couldn't drive fast enough for her to get there, but we went to the Red Roof Inn at the airport. And so it was you and Ivan, your wife? Yes, sir. And who, who else was at the Red Roof Inn when you got there? When we got there, it was, uh, there was a room set up, and uh, Michael and his father was there, and a police officer was there. And what happened when you were in that room with the police officer and the defendant? Well, we went in, and there was a purse on the bed, and... My wife asked, Mike, what's going on? What's, what's, what's going on? And basically, Mike told the van, said, what is she doing with all that money? What was your relationship with Evan, was, uh, with your wife, Evan, and Mike? What was their relationship? They were best friends. And was that commonly known? Yes, sir. From um, the time that you got the phone call from Bonnie Ham the evening of the 6th to the time you ended up at the Red Roof Inn, did the defendant ever call you or your wife asking where Bonnie Ham was? No, sir. You mentioned that your brother John was at the scene at the Red Roof Inn too. Yes, sir. Can you describe what he was doing at the scene? He was sitting on the bed beside Mike. Did he appear to be interested in how the police were going to be conducting their investigation? No, I don't. I didn't really talk to him at that time. No. Later, did you notice your uh, your brother? Um, being overly protective of judge, Michael. Judge, leading judge. Sustained. Did you notice anything unusual about your brother and Michael's behavior in the hours after the discovery of the purse? That particular time or after the next day or when are you talking well, about? We'll start with right well, now. Well, he, next day. well, he was overly protective of Mike and he wouldn't let Mike go anywhere by himself. Did you notice that at the Red Roof Inn, or was that, did you notice that later? 
at the Red Roof Inn, they were just in the room, and I didn't really talk to them after that. So, after that. <clears throat> did the defendant ever come, did you vote for Bob? A lot of times, yes. Sir. How did you go about doing it? I would get some of my employees, and we'd go out in the woods, we'd ride around, we'd do that. We did it for two or three weeks. And um, were some of these searches led by the police? They were there certain times, yes, sir. Okay. During any of the occasions that you searched with your coworkers and or the police, was the defendant ever participating? No, sir. And since January 6th, has he ever called you or your wife and asked where Bonnie Hame went? No, sir. Did you make a call to uh, work that morning? I did. And what time did you do that? I called. Our office opens at 7 in the morning, and I called at 7 because I knew someone would answer at 7 o'clock. And I talked to my basic assistant, Mike Robinson, and told him that I wouldn't be coming in today. And that, you saw Mr. Robinson in court today, I mean yesterday, did you not? I did. I mean, it, it was hard to recognize because it has been a long time since okay. I've seen him. And did um, you tell him, what did you tell him? I basically said I wouldn't be coming in today. Did you tell him you had been up all night? I don't know if we had a conversation about okay. that. Well, did you tell him that you weren't well? Well, the day before, the, you know, a few days before, I've, I've been having some sinus issues and drainage, so I wasn't up to my normal self as far as feeling, but that, that, that didn't come up in our conversation. And you, but you didn't tell him that uh, Bonnie had left and she hadn't been home, right? No, no. Mike was, Mike was just a worker. I was a part owner of the company, so he, I would not have to tell him if I didn't work the whole week. It wouldn't be any of his business. Well, I mean, did you want to share your personal business with him? <laughs> Absolutely not. Okay. Did you later get a call from Bernie? Uh, I believe after 8 o'clock sometime I did get a call from Bernie. Well, what was that conversation about? I believe he was looking for Bonnie. Okay. And did you in fact tell him that Bonnie wasn't there? I did, yes sir. What did you tell him? I told him that she wasn't home. Okay. Did you tell him that you knew where she went or didn't know where she went? Uh, he asked me where she was, and I said I didn't have any idea. She left last night, and I was going to call them when it was her time because she doesn't go in until around 9, 8.30 or 9, and it wasn't, it wasn't that time of day yet. Did you tell him that you and she were having a conversation? She was upset? I did. I told him we had a discussion that night, and I guess she was upset, I guess, and she left. Okay. When Bernie hung up with Michael, it wasn't long after that that he got another call confirming his fears that something was very, very wrong. One of Bernie's officer buddies was on the other line. The officer told him that they had recovered Bonnie's purse from a dumpster, and the officer suggested that he and Evane came quickly down to the Red Roof Inn, a motel near the Jacksonville airport. At around 8 a.m., a maintenance worker at the Red Roof Inn went to throw a bag of trash into the dumpster when he noticed a lady's purse sitting on top. He brought the purse to his manager, who called the police. By 9.30 a.m., police, Michael Haim, his parents, were all gathered in a motel room with the contents of Bonnie's purse laid out on the bed. When Bernie and Evane arrived, the only thing Michael said to them was, why'd she have that much money, referring to the $400 in cash that Bonnie had in her wallet. Evane said that stood out to her. Evane also noticed that Michael was wearing a long-sleeved shirt, which stood out because he didn't wear long-sleeved shirts very often. Later that afternoon, Bonnie's car was recovered at the Jacksonville airport. Bonnie had not been witnessed at the airport, nor was she on any flights, though she wouldn't have gotten far without her purse containing all of her ID, bank cards, car keys, etc. A few things about the vehicle stood out to police. First, the driver's seat was extended far back, way further than Bonnie could have driven comfortably. Another thing was that there was a sandy shoe print in the front seat. At the insistence of Ivan, the media was involved. Michael and his parents felt it was unnecessary to go to the press with Bonnie's disappearance, but Ivan thought it was essential to get people looking for Bonnie in hopes of finding her. I'm going to insert a news clip that was shown at trial. Unfortunately, the audio is quite poor. However, it does show Michael and Evane in that clip. 
something that we should keep her out where she couldn't notify me. I have a few problems, but you know, not so many. I have a few problems, but you know, not so many. We should keep her out where she couldn't notify me. You know, she thought it was best if she left and you know, just expect her back to them. She just wasn't happy and she wanted to leave and you know, couldn't you know, stop her from leaving. Nothing that should keep her out where she couldn't notify me. After that day, Aaron was put in the care of Bonnie's sister, Liz. And on January 8th, Aaron sat with social workers to determine if Aaron had seen anything or remembered anything from that evening. During that interview, it was determined that Aaron had likely witnessed a domestic dispute between Bonnie and Michael. Though he was only three, he said that he saw Daddy hurt Mommy. A few years later, he was again brought to a child specialist and gave further testimony that he saw his father hurt his mother. Now an adult, he has no recollection of either interview and no memories of that night. This exclusive video shows Bonnie's son, Aaron, when he was just six years old. His social worker and foster mother here questioning him about drawings that he's made and things that he said about his father hurting his mother. This is a clip of the social worker back then reading what he wrote. My dad killed my mom. Then he threw the pocketbook away in a different place, somewhere near our house in a dumpster. He buried my mom. We digged it, the hole. Now flash forward to 2019, and Aaron says he has no memory of those conversations. This is the only taped recall of what he said when he was young. A loving family later adopted Aaron, and Aaron never lived with his biological father again. Aaron now goes by Aaron Fraser. Please introduce yourself to the jury. My name is Brenda Metters. What do you do for a living, Ms. Metters? I'm a social worker. How long have you been a social worker? Ooh, since 1991. What are your current duties as a social worker? Um, I'm a master's degree social worker currently with Apex Home Health and Doctor's Choice Home Health and St. Vincent's Home Health. So you help people with health problems figure out what they're living in home health arrangements for them? Yes, or I help seniors once they're getting out of the hospital, help them get resources to help them stay in the home. Is also part of your um, employment background that you did work with children? Yes, sir. When was that part of your career? In 1991, um, I worked at the child protection team and then I worked for the state attorney's office working with victims and then I also worked at a program through the military which was a child abuse prevention program so several years working in child abuse industry with children. That sounds like it was early in your career. You yes sir. Okay. Um, I want to turn your attention back to 1993 where you employed the child protection team in 1993. Yes sir. What um, is the child protection team? It's an independent agency that does um, forensic interviews and medical exams of children that are suspected of being abused for the Department of Children and Families, which used to be called HRS, and for the Sheriff's Office. Is it common for the child protection team to conduct interviews of young children? Yes, sir. And is that in cases where they may not actually be a victim, but they may have witnessed a, a violent Yes, sir, occasionally. And, and why does the child protection team get involved in that as opposed to a, a big sheriff's officer question? Because we interviewed children in a childlike, friendly environment that would make them feel more comfortable, um, a lot less like what they have at the sheriff's office. And is that, um, what was your job at the child protection team? I was a case coordinator and I was a um, interviewer. I would inter do forensic interviews of children that had been suspected of abuse or had witnessed some type of incident. So you had work experience in interviewing small children about delicate subjects? Yes, sir. Did you receive training? Yes, sir. Um, back in 1993, was it the policy of the Child Protection Team to video record these interviews? Not at that time. Did it change later? You know. So I learned, not while I was there, but yes, sir, it did change. 
But while you were there, the policy is not to record. That's correct. Um, how would you later document what happened in an interview if you were not video recorded? I would take notes right after the interview, and I would also, um, sometimes the detectives would take notes behind the glass. They would view the interview. Um, we had a one-way mirror type situation where they could view in another room, and sometimes they would take notes. Would you use those notes as well as your own notes in memory to, talk to, to uh, compile them? Yes, sir. And did that happen in this particular case involving Ellen? Yes, sir. And when did you interview Aaron Hayden? I interviewed him on January the, I believe it was the 8th. And we have had the opportunity to review your typewritten report. Yes, sir. Okay. Many, many reports. And if you just, if, if there's ever a time you need a refresher, let me just let us know. Okay. okay. Now you said that uh, he indicated that, oh, that Daddy had her mommy, okay? Now you never determined, did you? as to what he was talking about, time-wise. Do I have an objection, Judge? I haven't heard any objection. You didn't try to establish time-wise when, quote, Daddy hurt mommy, did you? I did ask, was it during the daytime or nighttime, and he said nighttime. During the investigation, officers pieced together a timeline of what had happened between Bonnie's call with Evane and the next morning when her purse was found. According to Michael, after Bonnie's call with Evane, the two sat down, had a conversation about their marriage, and during that conversation, he said that Bonnie had told him she wanted a divorce and she would be taking Aaron and moving out. He said that around 11 p.m., he heard her leave the house and drive away. For several hours, he said he did nothing, but at 3 a.m., he called his mother to come watch Aaron while he went to look for her. Michael's mother arrived at his house shortly after 3 a.m. as she lived nearby. When she arrived, Michael took his truck and left for about 45 minutes. He claimed that he had driven to his parents-in-law's house to see if Bonnie's car was there. Interestingly, 45 minutes is about how long it takes to go from Michael and Bonnie's house to the Jacksonville airport and back. He returned and he said that he and his mother stayed up all night waiting for Bonnie to come home, and at 7 a.m. his mother left, he called into work, and a couple hours later he was contacted by police. Once media was involved, the case was heavily covered by local and national news. For weeks, the media followed various search parties, but at this point, the family was divided. Those who felt Michael was responsible for Bonnie's disappearance, and those who did not. Oddly enough, Bonnie's parents believed Michael's story that she'd run off with another man. They stood by him for decades, even telling media that they felt Bonnie had just run off. There are thousands of, of women that, that leave their husbands and families every year. And it's always a complete surprise to their families. Is interesting, but beyond that, uh, if it's his footprint, I'm not sure it means anything. My footprint is in my wife's car. That uh, doesn't mean I have ever done her any harm. I'm not saying that I'm 100% convinced that Mike is innocent. I haven't seen any evidence that convinces me he's guilty. Uh, his behavior and general attitude convinces me that he's, he's not guilty. As well, in this image, you can see Michael and Bonnie's father. This was a still taken from a new segment filmed while Michael and his family were undertaking a search. In 1993, Michael was tall, physically fit, and could have easily overpowered Bonnie, as she was a petite woman of 115 pounds and stood about 5 foot 1. After Bonnie's disappearance, an employee at Bernie's Tool and Fastener came forward with information. He had disclosed to officers that he had a close friendship with Bonnie, and a couple weeks before her disappearance, the couple had slept together once. In the weeks leading up to Bonnie's disappearance, he had come forward because Bonnie's husband, Michael, had been trying to get him to go hunting or go work out with him. He declined Michael's invitations and thought it was odd that they lived over an hour apart. He was concerned that Michael suspected his affair with Bonnie and was trying to put space between him and Michael, despite all three working together. 
He had felt that Michael would have hurt Bonnie had he been able to confirm that Bonnie had an affair. Though he was initially considered a secondary suspect, he cooperated fully with police, he had a strong alibi for his whereabouts, and he was no longer considered a suspect. He even, at multiple points, wore a recording device for law enforcement. The searches for Bonnie Haim lasted for several weeks, and they eventually stopped searching. Throughout the investigation, there was never enough physical evidence to convict Michael Haim. Without a body, the investigators were stalled. Over the years, several unknown bodies were discovered in northern Jacksonville, and each time they were compared. Each one ruled out. After 26 years, it seemed like the investigation would never find a resolution. In those years, Michael Hayne remarried, he left Jacksonville in 1994, and relocated to Tennessee. He started a new life, living off the life insurance policy he received after his first wife's disappearance. Michael Hay maintained ownership of the home in Jacksonville, though he hadn't lived in the home since 1994. He had several tenants over the years, but his lease agreements had a couple of unique clauses. Under no circumstances were tenants allowed to dig in the yard, plant flowers, garden, or otherwise disturb the landscaping. Another stipulation was that all animals needed to be contained to the master bedroom when the tenants weren't home. He said this was because the carpeting throughout the home was new and white, and he wanted to preserve the carpets. In 2003, Aaron took Michael to court in a wrongful death lawsuit. Aaron won that verdict, and the courts awarded him $26.3 million, which also included the Jacksonville property. <laughs> Please introduce yourself to the jury. I'm Aaron Frazier. And what do you do for a living? Uh, currently, I build docks and bulkheads. And how long have you been doing that type of work? Since August. Of 2018? Correct. Before that, what did you do? I had a lawn business for about four years. What was the name of that one? Coastal Dream Lawn Care. Um, where do you live? Just generally, what part of town? On the north side. And who do you live there with? Uh, my wife. And who else? Just the two of you? Yeah, my parents live very close by. We live, there's 15 acres there. I live on five, and they live up towards the front of me. And what are your parents now? Um, Dorothy Jean Frazier and Ronald Frazier. And did they raise you? They did. From the time, I guess, around four years old. And do you know a person by the name of Michael? I do. And how do you know him? Uh, legally, he's my biological father. Did he raise you from four years old? No. Who is your mother? Uh, biologically, Bunny. Yes, and that's why I meant biologically. Do you have any memory of Bunny? No. Do you have any personal memory of her disappearance? No. Do you have any memory of being raised by either your mother, or biological mother, or your biological father? No. Well, I turn your attention to 2439 Dolphin Avenue. Do you have any memory of living there as a child? <laughs> no. Do you, are you aware of that residence? Yes. And how are you aware of that residence? I obtained the property, I believe around 2003. Um, and it had, I may be wrong with the date, but um, it had tenants in it when I, it was in my possession and they stayed there until I decided to, or they moved out and that's when I decided to renovate it and sell it. So I know you're not sure about the day you received it, but were you um, an adult when you received that property? No. So you were still a teenager? Correct. Okay. But you didn't receive the property when you were four or five years old? No. And do you know who had the property, who was the owner of the property before you? My plan. Before uh, December 14th of 2014, did you ever do any kind of digging or repairs on that? Not in the back of Why did you um, decide to do all these repairs? Because it was in disrepair, in my opinion. And I wasn't sure at the time if I was going to rent it again or sell it. Um, and it needed to be fixed up. The pool hadn't worked in a couple of years. It 
had settled, the concrete around it had settled and was cracked and needed to be either completely redone or demolished and it was just more cost effective to get rid of it. It was cheaper to just take it out and make it grass as opposed to making it Correct. Okay. Um, and you weren't sure what you were going to do with it after that? Not at the time. Can you describe for the jury the condition of the outdoor shower? Um, I mean, everything about the home looked 20 years old plus, wasn't in really good shape. It had a, um, bricks was the floor base on it, and there was a steel pipe that went up the wall with a shower head on it. Was there a water pipe? There was not. Do you know who the tenants were, uh, before you started doing this demolition? Ted and Cynthia Mitchell. And were they a long-term tenant? Yes. Do you know how long they were there? N not exactly, but they were there the entire time um, that I owned the property, except for like maybe six months prior to doing the renovation. Um, and do you know who was there before that? Uh, I'm not aware. Did Ted and Cynthia Mitchell originally rent the property from Michael? Yes. And you just let them continue to rent. Correct. When I obtained it, I was going to kick them out because I obviously made money out of it. And did, you, did they leave of their own volition? Yes. They moved to Fort Worth. Or Fort White, I'm sorry. And so then you had it for about six months and you decided to do these renovations? Correct. Okay. So describe for the jury the type of renovations you were doing to the back. Um, well, then. I mean, we did everything. We replaced the privacy fence that was in the back, we removed a big tree in the front, an orange tree in the back, the shed that was in the back we got rid of. We got rid of, I got rid of the shower, all the landscaping that was there was all redone. And you say we, who was that? Um, well, a lot of people, but I, I mean, at the time, I had the lawn business and my employees with the lawn business were helping me when we weren't doing grass work, like on the weekends and stuff. And then my brother-in-law, Thad, was there during the um, demolition of the pool. And were you using uh, heavy equipment to yes. establish this? Describe my heavy equipment. It was a mini excavator. It was a 7,000-pound machine, just a bucket just that you could use to dig with, just so that you could, you could pull the concrete apart. And did you, uh, the shower, the outdoor shower was actually separate from the pool? Correct. It was its own piece of... Right in concrete? Yeah, there was about 20 foot of grass in between the shower and the pool. And did you have to not only uh, take up all the pool concrete, but end up taking out the brick and the concrete surrounding the shower? Yes, I did. Why did you do that? Uh, because without the pool, there wouldn't be a purpose for the outdoor shower. And so I was, I was just replacing the grass. So you mentioned brick. Um, you were taking were those bricks just kind of loosely placed in this shower area? No. They were, was there mortar effect? They, they were mortared together. So how did you get the bricks out? Uh, about two weeks prior to us demoing the pool, I was there meeting a contractor. I can't remember who it was for. I believe it was for, um, we installed a, a large shower, enclosed shower in the inside, and he was there to take measurements for the glass door. I believe that's who I was meeting. It may have been a roofer, but I'm not positive. Um, and I was there with one of my employees, and I wasn't sure exactly when the contractor was going to get there, so I was trying to find us busy work to do, so I wasn't paying him to stand around, and I don't really like standing around doing nothing, so we, we took the bricks out because I knew that was just something that was going to happen when we did the pool. And so I guess you used a sledgehammer? We used a sledgehammer. Uh, what did you notice when you used the sledgehammer on the bricks? Um, that they begin to chip. Um, some of them stuck together, and then a lot of the pieces of the brick were just loose flying around. And then what did you do? Um, at, that, at that time, when we moved, we put the bricks on the trailer and we took them off. That was all that we did that day. Did you notice that under the bricks there was some concrete? Yeah, there was a concrete slab poured under the bricks um, to level the ground. Was there something unusual about that slab when you began the process of taking it out? Yeah, it seemed odd to me. Um, when we rolled the excavator over it to demo the pool, um, it cracked, and so that was on that machine working on the pool and me and one of my employees um, began to pick up the pieces of concrete that cracked off of it and we're putting it in the dumpster. We had a dumpster there for the pool demo stuff. 
And so we were just doing that by hand just to stay busy. Um, it was thinner. Away from the house, it was the showers up against the house. So the far closer we got to the shower, the thicker the concrete got. And inside the concrete, towards the house, was a bunch of broken brick pieces. Approximately how deep was this thin layer of concrete? Uh, towards the outside of the shower, I would say it's about a half an inch. And up against the wall of the house, it was probably three inches. Okay, so it's not very deep? No. In fact, the excavator uh, cracked it with the turbo. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> did uh, eventually, during the process, did you have to, once you got all the concrete out of there, was there a leak? Yes, and the thinner part of the concrete where the excavator rode over is what cracked. And I grabbed a sledgehammer and began hitting the concrete to bust up the rest of it that didn't crack. And it, I noticed that it was getting thicker and thicker and thicker and harder to bust apart with a sledgehammer. And the steel pipe was coming up through the concrete, so I was concerned that if I hit it, it would bust the pipe. And I was just standing there looking at that, and he noticed that I was thinking about something. And he said, just, just hit it, it'll be fine. And I hit it, and it broke the pipe. And so we stopped what we were doing, um, because we were using a uh, concrete saw to cut the pool, sections of the pool, and you need water to do that so it doesn't create a lot of dust and just blow dust everywhere. And so we had to fix the leak but so we can continue to demo the pool. How did you go about fixing the leak? I just had to find the leak first, so I started using a shovel to, to dig the pipe up to find where it was broken. Uh, could you tell that it was coming from the piping that was basically under the shop? Yeah, I mean, it was just exploding water out of it, so I, I knew it was there somewhere, I just had to find it where. And um, did you eventually shut off the water? Yeah, we, tur we turned off the water so we weren't making a big mud mess. But it, it was uh, exploding for at least a little while. Right. Um, tell the jury what you found. I was digging the hole, I noticed, um, at, at the time I thought it was a French drain off because on the back side of this wall is the laundry room. I assumed it was a piece of corrugated pipe, and it was, I, I've seen like sep septic systems and stuff, they'll put um, styrofoam around them and then wrap them in a filter cloth so that the water can seep out but dirt doesn't get in it, so it allows this water to drain. If you have a well or something, you can, you can take that water and run things and not have to pay for sewage and all that. So I assumed it was some kind of makeshift French drain um, as I was digging the hole, I, it wasn't on purpose, I accidentally um, busted up the bag and I saw what I described as a, something that looked like coconut. Um, it was a fibrous material, just like a, like a brown coconut. The bag, can you describe that a little bit more for the jury? Yes, I mean after I busted it and I had my hands on it, I. I would describe it as visqueen. I know most people doesn't, don't know what that is. It's like a concrete, they'll put underneath concrete so moisture doesn't come up through it, but it's similar to like a contractor bag. That's what it appeared to be. You thought it had something to do with the actual concrete brick that was protecting the shop, or that you were standing off the shop? Well, I thought, I thought it was for the French drain for the laundry. Okay. So you thought it had something to do with the drainage from the laundry? Correct. Um, well, did you quickly realize that wasn't the case? I wasn't quick. I, I, I picked up the coconut object and it ended up being the, the top portion of her skull. Um, I looked at it, I, hand, I had it in my hand. Um, I didn't really see anything, I handed it to that. And he looked back in the hole and we could see teeth. And that, at that point in time you could, you could see the top portion of her eye sockets. So you already driven the shovel into that area? Correct. Okay, so your theory caused at least some damage. Yeah, we both certainly busted the bag and hit this this in the room. So once you start seeing that it's uh, human remains, what do you do? Uh, it's, we set the top portion of the skull back in the, in the hole, and I called my mom, who I refer to as my mom, Jean Fraser. I actually call her Mima. I refer to her as my mom. Um, 
to try to get Robbie Henson's phone number because I knew he was the lead detective on the case. Um, she wasn't home, she was at church. So I called my, my wife, who is obviously just like a half a mile away. She went down to my mom's house and got her Rolodex, looked up Robbie's number. Um, I called him, he didn't answer, he was also in church. So I called Alyssa back, my wife, asked her to look up Laura Carper's number, who was a psychologist that I'd been continuing to see. Um, she had both her office number and her home number. I called her home number. I didn't have these number, but my gene did. Um, I called it, it referred me to her cell phone. I called her cell phone and left her a message that I think I might have found with my mom. And she called back shortly later. Um, in the meantime, that called one of his police friends um, that he goes to church with because we weren't sure exactly what to do. We didn't know whether to call 911 or call somebody that was related to the case. We didn't want a bunch of media there because we've, we've kind of seen how much media attention it had already got. We don't want them to beat the police, police there. Um, he got a friend of one of his friends and they called a sergeant on our side of town and he's the first police officer that showed up. Eventually, did Robbie Henson come? Yes. And you say Robbie Henson, did you actually maintain a relationship with him through the years? <clears throat> yes. We, we went to the same church. I went to the First Baptist downtown through high school, and he was also a member that I seen him. We did, I mean, we may talk here and there in passing, but I, he was there every Sunday, and I was there every Sunday. So, so you knew who he was, and you knew he was one of the investigators on your mother's case? Correct. Um, and so police came, and that's essentially your involvement with regard to finding the body. Correct. Um, did you eventually get control of the house again when police were done? Yeah, it was, I'm not sure exactly how long, but it was, I would say, probably four or five days later. It wasn't just the next day? No. And were you able to complete the renovations and sell the house? Yes. Well, I go through some pictures so you can now describe for the jury where you found the house, okay? okay. It should come up on your screen, it does it, you just want to touch it. So, um, I guess the first picture I want to show you um, is going to be States Exhibit 3. Because this, this uh, photograph is an aerial of Dolphin um, Avenue in States Exhibit 3. You see the shower that is covered by what appears to be wood planks. Is that the way that the shower really was when you completed your renovation? Not with the wood planks, no. But is that the general area of yeah, which you would have done? Exact same area and the same size. And can we see sort of the shower <coughs> with this straight line right here? Correct. Okay. So now, fast forwarding to 2014. States Exhibit 49. Does this fairly accurately depict the front yard of Dolphin Avenue with your demo? Yes. And is that green trailer where you would put portions of the concrete that you would cut? Yes. We'll just go through it. States Exhibit um, 50. Are those the pieces of the pool? Yeah, some of it's the pool and some of it is the shower. Okay, and we have a good picture of States Exhibit 51. Is this going to be a picture of the shower of the concrete there? Yes, yeah, the shower with the broken pieces of bricks in it. And can you kind of show that? So, can you show the jury what the bricks are? So, no, there's just a bunch of little pieces all throughout the concrete. And do we sort of see um, in this photograph that it was thinner as it got further away and then thicker um, closer to the uh, shop? Yes. Uh, can you go back? Yes, sir. I would say you see like this piece right here, how thin that is. That's how it was. Up towards the privacy fence. Really thin. This year is all pretty thick. Okay. So that would be the, what we see in states every 50 years ago. The brick ash was. Uh, that was the stuff that was closer to the house. And because and the thinner parts were easily broken and crumbled into more pieces. Right. As opposed to one giant piece. Right. <clears throat> states exhibit 52, which is uh, evidence in the front yard. Of the demolition? Yes. And we can just run through these. 
Um, States Exhibit um, 54, is this evidence of the demolition? Yes. States Exhibit, uh, we'll skip to 56, is this the excavator? Yes. And that's the green piece of machinery? Correct. We'll go to States Exhibit 58. The States Exhibit 58 fairly and accurately depict the area that contained the bricks in the concrete. Yes. So that entire dirt area that we can see in States Exhibit 58? That square. So it was more than just a couple feet by a couple feet. Yeah, I would say it was five by five. In States Exhibit um, 59, do we see the shovel that you were using? Yes. And is that, um, when you found um, <coughs> Bonnie Haynes' uh, skull, did you stop digging? Yes. So that's as far as you got what we see in States Exhibit um, 59. Yes. States Exhibit 60, is that again a different angle of how deep you got? Yes. And do we actually see pieces um, of what turned out to be bottom piece? Yes. They say you tried to put some of it back, or did you just drop one? Yeah, I'm not sure. My recollection was we put it back in the hole, but I'm not sure. Okay. States Exhibit 61, is that the pipe you were referring to? Yes. States Exhibit 62, is that going to be the part of the uh, black um, tarp that you cut through? And then finally, States Exhibit 65, is that going to be where you say you saw some form of key? Aaron Fraser has no lasting memories of his mother, relying solely on pictures, home videos, and stories from those who remembered her. Aaron made the grisly discovery. I cannot imagine that trauma he is dealing with. He sat in that courtroom, faced the man who murdered his mother with so much strength to bring her justice. After the discovery of the remains, a full forensic investigation begins. Due to the time and the location of the remains, much evidence was lost. No cause of death could be determined, however, there was evidence of what could have been damaged from a projectile on the inside of a hip bone, but there was no way to know for sure. Officers that had searched the home in the days preceding Bonnie's disappearance all admitted to not checking under the shower area. Officers had felt that the area had not been disturbed, and everyone had assumed that the wood pallet wasn't easily moved. There were a bunch of things on top of the wood pallet, and it looked very normal there. Bernie had sold the property to Michael when the couple had first married. When he had owned the property, he said that the shower area had been soil with a layer of bricks covered with pebbles for drainage and topped with what was described as a wood pallet to keep your feet clean while using the shower. When Aaron was demolishing the area, he said that underneath the wood pallet had a layer of concrete covering up broken bricks. Those that had excavated the site described a lot of pebbles mixed in with the soil. Though we may never know what happened that night, investigators feel that a likely series of events were as followed. On January 6, 1993, Bonnie Haim told her husband that she was leaving him. Michael Haim was a jealous, overbearing, violent husband who may have suspected his young wife had an affair while he'd been out of town. He was never going to let her go. He knew that Bonnie would thrive without him. The beautiful, charismatic, fun-loving woman had her whole life ahead of her. He took that option away. He instead decided to end her life that evening. He then hid her underneath an outdoor shower area, breaking through the bricks, digging only two feet down. He placed the body in a shallow grave, covered it, and laid quick-drying concrete on top of it. Covered the concrete with the wood pallet and piled a bunch of items from the storage shed on top. He then tidied the house and called his mother around 3 a.m. 
It wouldn't be beyond the scope of imagination to hypothesize that his mother may have helped him cover it up. Mind you, I'm just going to say allegedly a few times. They were together from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. There were multiple wet towels that faintly smelled like bleach that were gathered by investigators, but they weren't able to get any evidence from them. Michael and his mother may have dumped Bonnie's purse at the Red Roof Inn and drove her car, and she may have helped him drive Bonnie's car to the airport. I imagine that Michael needed a second person to drive a secondary vehicle, but there's no evidence to prove that, and he's still maintaining his innocence as well as her own. According to officers, the keys recovered from Bonnie's purse were the spare set of keys. When officers asked family members for Bonnie's keys, the keys were recovered from the home. It was odd that according to Michael's story, Bonnie would leave that evening and not take her regular key ring, but the spare key from the dealership. Officers hypothesize that at some point after midnight in the early morning hours, someone, likely Michael, drove Bonnie's car to the Jacksonville airport and parked it in the long-term parking area. They knew it was after midnight because employees that worked in the airport would count how many cars, and no one who worked at the airport remembered seeing that car there until the next morning. Afterwards, the purse was dumped in a nearby motel dumpster in an effort to paint a narrative that Bonnie had up and left town. It was likely Michael's hope that the purse would never be found and the car was discovered first. Unfortunately for him, the series of events did not occur that way. Okay, I'm going to show you um, what's been introduced as State's Exhibit 5. Um, is this an aerial photograph of the Red Roof Inn? Touch your screen and it should come on. Uh, is that an aerial photograph of the red roof end? Yes. And do we see the dump dumpster here in the back? Yes. And then we have Stacey's Exhibit 6, and again, you can see the dumpster in the back? Yes. Uh, Stacey's State Exhibit 8 is uh, Google Maps to show that the red roof end is in relatively clo close proximity to the airport. Is that your memory of where the red roof end is in relation to the airport? Yes, sir. State's Exhibit 9, what's the jury looking at here? Um, this is a photograph of the dumpster, the one with all the debris in it, and the second dumpster that we brought in to transfer that debris as we searched the dumpster. So the dumpster to the left of the photograph was actually just brought in to hold the garbage? Correct. What was the purpose of going through that dumpster? Um, we were looking um, for any additional evidence, um, for any remains that might be possible. State's Exhibit uh, Number Ten. Did you have anything to do with the photography that took place with regard to the purse? No, sir. Additionally, there's also the shoe prints in Bonnie's car that match his shoes, and also the positioning of the seat drew questions. Have you seen that picture before? Yes, I have. Okay. Were you actually consulted in this case uh, when the vehicle came into FDLE's warehouse? Yes. And how did that process take place to consult with you? I was notified that there was a footwear track on the left driver's seat pad for the floor mat in there that they would like me to look at because it appeared to have sufficient detail for comparative examination. And who were you working with at FDLE with regard to this particular track? Well, Main ones were Alan Miller and Steve Larry and uh, John Longworth. So was Alan Miller, was he going through the training process to, to be able to do the kind of analysis that you do? Yes, he was in that training, but he was our senior crime scene analyst as well. And let me show you what uh, I'm going to go through to state 143, 142. Uh, is that a close up of the format that you had? that you saw that day? Yes, it's the format. Okay. The, the screen in front of you is, is um, active so that you can um, use your finger to make circles and things like that. Could you, could you draw a circle around the print that you observed that day when you first analyzed the car? And what 
what's there's a whitish substance. What what did that appear to be? It appears to be sand. Okay. And when you observed the print, you at this point you were just looking at it with your naked eye. Yes, I was. Okay. What instructions, if any, did you give with regard to removing this car mat so you could do further analysis? Well, the mat would have to be re removed to be photographed in a, in a photo <coughs> where it is different lighting techniques were used. So it would have to be removed carefully and then transported to a photo section. And why, why, why was the need why did you use the word carefully? Why did you use that word? Well, because it appears to be fragile or some sort of substance. All right, and then um, showing you States Exhibit 144. What are we looking at in States 144? Which would be like the, the mat has been removed and laid out. Okay. And, and how is this particular photograph generated? So, how is this particular photograph generated? In terms of the view that we're looking at the mat, how, where is the camera? Where's, where's the photo taken from? It appears that the camera is straight overhead. But, uh, I'm, I'm not sure about what surface it is on, but directly overhead. All right. And the, uh, there, there's a small white line, is that a ruler? Yes. And why do you use a ruler like that? We always want to scale in any of our comparative examinations dealing with footwear and tire because the scale then gives us a record we can match <coughs> to an object either directly by its true size or by enlarging it to the comparison size. And then showing you states exhibit 145, what are we looking at in states 145? Again, you're looking at the, the footwear track we had on the map. Close up? Yes, it is close up. And then states 146? A little closer. In States 146, are you able to see um, any pattern? Not as well as I've observed. I'm not in this particular photograph. Okay. Um, let me ask you, with regard to after after photographing this particular track, um, what other steps were taken to preserve this track? Well, there was a cast made of dense, a cast made out of dense stone. And do you, um, after you make that cast, can you explain to the jury why you make a cast and what the function is? The cast is another way of preserving it uh, because you then remove it from the surface that it's on, the substrate, the mat, and you have it separate from that. Also, a cast may show features that you do not see of the track in the carpet. And then once you've photographed the track and once you've made a cast of it, do you make a determination as to which is going to be your better source to use? You may use both of them. Okay. Um, do, do, you, uh, do you have a recollection that shortly after observing this track and documenting and casting it, you were provided a pair of shoes to conduct an analysis upon? Yes, I was. And show you uh, States Exhibit 147, a pair of Nike Air Advantage shoes. Is that the shoes that you analyzed? It would be. On the bottom of the photograph, there is a scale. Uh, again, because we like scales. Also, there's an evidence identification by number and with Mr. Miller's initials. Okay. And to explain to the, the jurors what you did once you have these shoes, you, you've got this track that you've now photographed and made a cast of. What process do you use at that point? In this case, because the track and the format appeared to be from a helium, made a, a uh, 
transparent overlay of the heel area to be placed on a true size photograph to make a comparison with the overlay to the question track. And you use the phrase transparent overlay, but take it back to 1993 and you explain that process. What, what do you do to make a transparent overlay? The technique I use is what you call roller transport cleanup film. It is a special film designed to work on automatic film processors. It has a gel type surface that once you wet the surface, it becomes soft. You can apply different powders or substances to the footwear. Uh, in my case, I would use probably red powder. You could use white powder, black powder. And then once the gel on the transport film, which is a clear film, once it's softened, you step on it, and that powder then is adhered to the file, to the film. And it will draw and will dry, and the powder will be retained in the gel surface. And showing you um, states exhibit 148, is that the bottom of the shoes you conduct an analysis upon? Yes, it is. That is the outsole area. Okay. When you, uh, when you conducted your analysis, was the white sandy substance present on the shoes? There was some of them. Recall specific where it was there because the sand is another form of evidence uh, that would have been collected. And that would have been collected before you conducted your analysis? Yes, it would. Okay. So when you were describing making the transparency, you would be using the bottom of these shoes to, to, to make that transparency? Yes, I would. All right. And what analysis did you conduct after you did, after you made the transparency? I compared by an overlay technique uh, what features I had in the transparency to the true size photograph of the track. And on the track itself that you were analyzing, did you observe anything other than class characteristics? Well, the different class characteristics that were observed, first there was what we call the gross design, with the herringbone, which is a series of zigzag lines uh, in the bottom of the shoe. That is with the main design feature. And there's also a groove around the heel area. And then there's an outside uh, sole area that is clear. So our class characteristics would be first the herringbone design. Could you could you circle that on the proper in front of you, the herringbone design that you were supposed to do? That's the first class characteristic? Yes. And then what's the next one? The next one would be the groove around the heel. It's a thin line. And what is the next one? And then, of course, the, the overall outsole as well. Okay. All right, sir. Um, I'm going to place um, State's Exhibit 146 on the overhead for you so that I can enlarge it.
So showing you 145, is that, is that better? That is a, a little bit better, yes. Okay. So can, can you just use the teleprompter in front of you to show where you observe the track on the map? Yes, they are. Okay. Um, did you, uh, after you conducted this this transparency overlay evaluation, did you do any more evaluation on the cast that you've been uh, created? No, I did not. The, the, the cast was made to recover it, but we had the sufficient information in the photographs we had. Okay. And, and after conducting the overlay, and, and, and when you did that, you actually placed your transparency on the photograph itself? Yes, I did. Okay. And after doing that, what was your opinion with regard to whether the shoes that you had analyzed, whether that shoe could have made the uh, particular track in question? I had agreement on the gross characteristic of the herringbone design, and then I limited class characteristic in how the edges of the herringbone design met the groove next to the outsole. Board. So there are actually two different class characteristics involved there. One of the design, one of how the design interacts with other features of the footwear. And I, so I made that comparison, found that to be in agreement, such that I could form the opinion that the footwear, the shoe I had, the Nike Advantage size 10, definitely made could have made, not made, not made, could have made the footwear track on the panel of on the floor mat of the car. And and you you're you also did a little bit of analysis or, or Mr. Miller in your direction did some analysis on some footprints that were found in the back seat of the vehicle. Did you do any analysis on the back seat footprints? Just confirm that his his opinion on that that could have. There was nothing of value for comparative examination um, that I could recall. Okay. And the going back to the, the print that we have on the photograph, you cannot say that those shoes definitely made that particular track, but you your opinion is that those shoes definitely could have okay. made. Okay. How would you use the word definite in terms of your opinion? The secondary or the class characteristics that I call the limited one or the second limited characteristics, those are for that's where the herringbone design meets the border of the design of the outsole. Those features, how it intersects there, is determined a lot of times by the sole of the size of the outsole. These outsoles are designed in such a way that they'll use different templates for different sizes. And one template, the edges or the angles of the herringbone <coughs> are different from size to size. In this case, there was an agreement in the herringbone design as it met the edge of the design features, such that my opinion that it was of the same size. This then reduces it, the number of, of uh, observations or the number of uh, associations we can make. And this is why the term definitely was, because I believe it to be in the same size category. Michael's story also changed throughout the years. He had first said that after 8.30, Bonnie had gone on her stepper before leaving the house. During his trial, he said that Bonnie was painting her nails and sewing something. Bonnie wore acrylic nails. They were actually recovered intact after so many years unscathed. Bonnie always had her nails done routinely at the salon, and you can't really paint over acrylic nails with bottled nail polish. It messes with the manicure. It would be highly unusual for someone to paint over their salon manicure with a bottled nail polish. 
1993, Michael had also said that Bonnie left the house wearing jeans and a sweater. In the gravesite, Bonnie was wearing pink sweatpants when her remains were recovered, and in the burial site, there were also synthetic threads from an extra-large Fruit of the Loom cotton t-shirt. The cotton had worn away with time, but it left the synthetic threads that once held the garment together. Just the screen where she come on. Do you see it now? <laughs> yes. Who, who's the lady in the white jacket? The lady with the white hair and the white jacket is me. Okay. <laughs> and so you actually went to the scene and, and examined some of the um, pieces of evidence, the bones, uh, while the excavation was being done. That's correct. I'm going to show you um, what's been entered into evidence. Um, it states Exhibit 117. Is this how the medical examiner's office received the remains of Bonnie Hayne? Yes. So I'm going to go through a few pictures. Did the, the remains, was it something that was easy to do to separate all the dirt and rocks and things and determine what was a part of the skeleton and what was just dirt and rocks? It was very difficult, especially considering I am not an anthropologist, so dis being able to decide what's a pebble and what's part of a bone can be very difficult. Even to your trained eye. Sorry, right. trained eye. Right, because things. bones are not our, uh, our purview. Um, plus, the, um, the bones were embedded in uh, dirt, and there were various fabrics on and around the area. So, yes, it took several days. So this was not an easy one? No. Um, is photography important for your job? Yes, we have a forensic photographer that takes pictures of all of our cases. And why is that important? It's just another way to, uh, to objectify and to make sure that things get recorded. So I'll go through some of those photographs with you so you can explain to the jury what they see uh, in, in those photographs. And I'll begin with uh, State's Exhibit 118, which is, I guess, the area of the top of the body um, that was uh, after the plastic wrapping has been taken off. Is that what the jury's looking at here? Yes, that would be um, the uh, dirt with some uh, roots growing out of it, and uh, you may be able to see uh, Parts of several bones. There are some shredded pieces of plastic and what looks like string. And so I can, uh, you can too as well. We see a number, the uh, 2030 number here, identifying this as your autopsy or I guess medical exam review or, or, or that's range review. So the jury knows this is related to this. Yes, that's the uh, identifying number. And then we also see here, I mean, you mentioned bones. I think we see some of them pretty obvious in the um, State's Exhibit 118, where I've drawn the green line. Okay. Um, do we also see, we refer to the plastic, is that going to be these items here? Yes. And There's also some plastic, uh, little pieces of plastic that are pink. Are you referring to the pink items here? Yeah. Yes. And then I think you mentioned string, is that going to be this item here? Yes. And then you mentioned all the roots, which is going to be in here? That's correct. So just give a jury an idea of what they're looking at. And then going now to Stacey's the 119, is this going to be the lower portion of the remains of Bonnie Hay? It looks like it. Did you end up removing a pair of pants from these remains? Yes. Okay, well there was like pink sweatpants? They were either sweatpants or pajama bottoms or something to that effect. And do we see that, that, that garment apparently on the legs like this? Yes, I believe that would be them. <coughs> and this is the way the body came to you when you began the process of unwrapping and using your forensic photography to take pictures? Yes. States Exhibit 120, what are they looking at here? like it's a portion of the cranial vault. Exhibit 120, what are they looking at here? 
various pieces of bone and teeth. This is about 122. What are they looking at here? This is a long bone. Stacy's at a 123. Teeth. Stacy's at a 124. Um, mostly pebbles, but there may actually be some portion of bone in there. And again, is that going to be more along the lines of a forensic anthropologist being able to identify those kinds of things? Yes. Stacy's at a 125. Is that going to be that string that we referred to earlier? Yes. It actually has a tag. You see that? Yes, it does. I think you took a close up of that tag as well. Yes. Stacy's at 127. And those would be those uh, pink uh, sweatpants and or pajama bottoms in the photograph? That's correct. So you photograph these as uh, without cleaning them or doing any kind of direct disruption to them other than taking them, uh, or taking the remains out of them, I guess is the best way to say. Right, and laying them on the paper so that photograph them. Do we actually see some of the remains slightly above those pants? There are portions of uh, long bones up there and mm, maybe a shoulder, I'm not sure, some other bones. And then did you take a photograph of the tag of those uh, pink, under those pink bones? Yes. This would be it. Stacey said 129, is this a what you refer to as um, body hangs undergarment? Yes. Underwear? Yes. Stacy's at 130. What is this? That, uh, as it turned out, uh, is a black plastic poncho. At the time, we weren't sure whether it was a trash bag or something else, but as we started to look at it more closely, it became more obvious that it was a poncho. I know the jury can see it, but the, uh, so it's all on the transcript. The, uh, the poncho is a Mickey Mouse poncho. The character Mickey Mouse is on the front. Yeah, somewhere. Okay, I think it's right here. If you can't see it. Probably a portion of it, I'm just having a hard time yes. figuring it out. The, uh, the poncho itself, was it in like a fragile condition or was it like, it wasn't the way a poncho normally felt? It was a uh, very lightweight plastic material that was very wrinkled. And did you, uh, in State's Exhibit um, 131, did we see one of the, uh, the fasteners that you could do to make the poncho fit? Yes. Stacy's at 132. What are we looking at here? Uh, more pebbles and possible bones. And we can see a little bit of that poncho here to the right? That's correct. Okay. So, the Doctor, I didn't ask you this about the poncho. Is this poncho, this black um, plastic, is that what we saw in the original pictures at the top of the body? Yeah. Okay. Yes. The poncho did not cover the entire body. Uh, I don't think it covered the entire body. It was more towards the top. In some place, yes. Not every place. The state's at 133, what are we looking at here? Uh, even smaller pebbles and possible bone fragments. State's at 134. More of the same, including most of the bones as well as some of the clothing, um, some of that pink plastic uh, material. Thank you, Doctor. So I think the sec, I'm going to show you, I want to fast forward now. Um, Stacey's at 135. Is that a photograph that your office took or one that uh, Heather machined? I believe that was. Probably taken by uh, Dr. Haney. Um, and she renders some opinions uh, with regard to that. Do you have any opinions about what that is? It's a circular defect. And nothing more than that, you would defer to Dr. Haney? Yes. Um, during the course of 
going through the actual body that was on the table, did you find some possible um, shell casings uh, and projectiles that you collected and uh, eventually gave to the sheriff's office? Yes, I'm not sure whether Dr. Walchaney found them or whether um, we had found them. My, I just don't know. I don't remember the sequence of things at this point. But yeah, this uh, this is what um, we supposed was a, um, a a metal jacket that would cover a projectile. But whether it was you or Dr. Haney, those items were covered from the body itself that was shipped to your office. They, they were. were they were right. They were in and amongst all of the materials that came in on that. So I just want to go back. The, the items contained in one um, items contained in 136 would have been located within the items contained in Stacey Exhibit 117, which was what you received in the Correct. Okay. And finally, States Exhibit 137 is going to be a full layout of the skeletal remains, uh, essentially in their anatomically correct position. Essentially anatomically correct. Were you aware of the fact that um, Heather Walsh Haney also briefly came to that scene? What we know is that truth never changes. From decade after decade, the truth never fades. Michael Haim was never able to keep his story straight. His defense team could not come up with an alternate explanation on how Bounty Haim ended up underneath the outdoor shower. His trial in 2019 lasted three days. Almost its entirety is available on YouTube, and I'll link it in the description box. I watched the whole thing, and it is not great for Michael. Evidently, the jury agreed as it only took them 90 minutes to deliberate. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. You can take your seats. I understand the jury has reached a verdict. Is that true? And you provided the verdict for to Ms. James, who's provided it to me. Finding no errors or emissions in the verdict form, Mr. McAllister, would you please publish the verdict? In the circuit court of the Fourth Judicial Circuit and in Fort Duval County, Florida, case number 2015 CF 7825 for Division CRE, State of Florida versus Michael Ray Hain. Verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder in the second degree as charging information. So say we all have the Duval County, Florida. Signed by the four person on April 12, 2019. On May 21, 2019, Michael Haim was charged with second degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison. After two decades of freedom, he finally faced the consequences of his selfish actions. Those who had advocated for Bonnie were allowed to watch as the man that they knew had hurt their loved one would serve justice. Though it won't bring Bonnie back, hopefully, they can now heal with answers and justice. Good afternoon and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you're new to the channel, hello and welcome, and if you're returning, welcome back. Today, we're discussing the solved cold case of a serial predator that has recently been identified, arrested, and convicted. Let's get into it. From 1982 to 1985, a small town in Shelby County, Indiana, lived under a reign of terror when a vicious masked man broke into homes at night, armed with a gun or knife, and sexually assaulted women. Shelbyville was the center of all but one of the atrocious attacks. The town is about 30 miles southeast of Indianapolis and at the time had around 20,000 citizens. The series of crimes disturbed the town and fear gripped the hearts of women for many years as that mysterious assailant remained at large. 
gun sales skyrocketed, and even a local hospital offered shooting lessons to the residents. Police urged women to take extra precautions, and they were told to avoid being alone, make sure to close their curtains, lock their doors and windows at night, and alter their routines as the authorities believed that the perpetrator stalked his victims before making his move. The nightmarish spree began on the night of August 14, 1982, when a woman woke up in the middle of the night after a man entered her home through an unlocked door. He held a knife to her throat, demanding money. He took some cash from her purse, then he threatened to hurt her young daughters, who were sleeping in the next room, if she didn't comply with his orders. He forced her to put on a nightgown and then proceeded to assault her. He knew that she was a recent divorcee and told her that her ex-husband paid him to intimidate her and teach her a lesson. He also threatened that he would come back to hurt and kidnap her daughters on their way home from school if she ever thought about reporting the incident to the police. A few months later, a similar incident took place. On the night of November 1, 1982, the assailant forced his way into a home where a mother lived with her son. They were both awakened at knife point, and the man threatened to hurt the little boy if the mother didn't comply with him. He made her put on lingerie and perform sexual acts while her son watched before sexually assaulting her. Similar to the previous incident, he told the woman that he was paid to hurt her and that he would come back if she contacted the police. On December 16, 1982, a mother and her 16-year-old daughter were assaulted. The daughter was awake when a man entered her room holding a knife. He forced her to perform sexual acts before taking her to her mother's room. He also compelled the mother to perform sexual acts and assaulted her. He boasted about committing other attacks and claimed that he was a police officer. He also tried to take pictures of the two women using their personal camera, but discovered that there wasn't any film. A couple of months later, on February 2, 1983, the suspect armed with a gun attacked a man standing outside his home and forced him inside, where his wife was waiting. He forced a couple to perform sexual acts on each other and photographed them. He told them that he was being paid to do that and stole some cash before leaving the scene. After that incident, the police feared that the suspect's behavior was escalating. They first believed that he was primarily targeting recent divorcees and women living on their own, but the last incident showed that he didn't have a problem attacking couples or breaking into homes where men were present. Over a full year after his last attack, the perpetrator struck again. On February 18, 1984, a woman was in the shower when a man forced his way into her home. The woman was completely vulnerable, and when the man took her by surprise and held her at gunpoint, he asked her if she knew anything about his other attacks and bragged that the police had arrested the wrong guy. He told her that he would leave her alone if she cooperated with him and threatened to kill her if she screamed or struggled against him. He then proceeded to assault her and took multiple photographs of her. He had told her that they had met before, and that she had served him at her job a few nights before. By saying that, he proved that he was used to stalking and keeping track of his victim's movements. He then left after stealing a small amount of cash. Then, on November 25, 1984, the assailant broke into another home. He first woke the victim's little daughter and took her to the mother's room. He held the daughter at gunpoint and used her to threaten the mother into performing sexual acts. He then assaulted the mother while her daughter watched and left after stealing some cash. He put his crime spree on hiatus until August 17, 1985, when he forced his way into a couple's home. He forced them at gunpoint to perform sexual acts on each other and demanded they give him money. The wife told him that she had a heart condition and then faked a heart attack. She aimed to get some sympathy, but unfortunately, their attacker had none. He first focused his attention on the male victim. He handcuffed him, tied him to a chair, and started to beat him mercilessly. He repeatedly hit him over and over again with the back of the gun, causing permanent brain damage and a coma that lasted for months. The victim had to get speech therapy to learn how to talk again. He currently suffers from many disabilities and is confined to a wheelchair. After leaving the husband for dead, he took the woman to the garage and sexually assaulted her. He threatened to come back and kill them if they went to the police. 
Little did he know that he made a fatal mistake that night, which would later lead to his arrest. Around this time, the authorities noted many similarities and links between the attacks, making them confident that they were all committed by one suspect. They knew from descriptions given by the victims that he always wore military-style boots, a chained wallet, and a ski mask. His M.O. involved sexually assaulting women, sometimes with an enema bottle, and he also used Vaseline in every attack. He would often tie his victims to immobilize them, and he would take or attempt to take photographs of them. And sometimes he would even have the audacity to ask his victims for a drink and would always threaten to come back if they contacted the police. He also had a pattern of stalking and observing his victims for several weeks before breaking into their homes, and he usually attacked after 9.30 p.m. and left the crime scene before 5.30 a.m. In 1985, the Indianapolis newspaper shared a facial composite of the suspect based on the victim's descriptions, and in the same article, task force detectives said the suspect was believed to be a white male, 5 foot 9 to 6 foot 1, 170 to 200 pounds with blue eyes, short to medium light brown or blonde hair, and that he was in his early to mid 30s. The victims also described him as muscular, so they believed he had an athletic body type. But despite all efforts, the suspect still managed to elude capture, and the authorities were unable to discover his identity. The culprit was generally very cautious and made sure never to leave behind anything that would lead to him. He always wore gloves, wiped down surfaces, and took all the items he touched or may have left DNA on with him such as the victim's nightgowns, towels, and bedsheets. But one time, he finally got sloppy and unknowingly left DNA behind, and that was in his final attack that took place on August 17, 1985. However, the case remained unsolved for decades, and it wasn't until 2020 that it finally had a breakthrough. A detective suggested sending the DNA sample extracted from the last crime scene to a company specializing in the same sort of DNA testing used to capture the Golden State Killer in 2018. A company called Parabon Nano Labs, a company based in Virginia that specializes in genealogical DNA identification and uses it to solve cold cases. The test results led to two men of the same family. One of them was Stephen Ray Hessler an ex-convict who spent most of the 90s in prison for sexual assault convictions in a county close to Shelby County. He served about 10 years in prison and was released two months before inmates were required to submit DNA samples. Investigators started watching and digging into the lives of the two men, and it didn't take long for them to eliminate the first suspect, leaving only Stephen Ray Hessler. Hessler lived in Greensburg, Indiana, and used to pay his utility bills by mail. Police used that against him as they obtained an envelope he used to send a bill payment for his water bill. They extracted DNA from the licked envelope and compared his saliva to the DNA collected back in 1985. It was a perfect match. They brought him in for questioning, and they were able to obtain a better DNA sample from the inside of Hessler's cheek, further confirming the link. In the early morning hours on August 17th, 2020, exactly 35 years after the last attack in Shelby County, police entered Hessler Greenberg's home with a search warrant. They described what they found inside as a treasure trove and a gold mine full of trophies and evidence from the crime scenes. They found several photographs that he had stolen from the victims, clothing and garments the victims described him wearing during the attacks, a chained wallet, ski mask, knives, handcuffs, and zip ties. They also found 30 pairs of women's underwear, an enema water bottle, petroleum jelly, Polaroid photos of the four sex acts, and newspaper clippings of the articles written about the attacks. Police also searched his computers and found that he'd been researching the surviving victims' names and whereabouts. He'd also downloaded a Google Earth Street View photo of one of the victims' homes in Georgia. He'd also been similarly cyber-stalking the victim of his sexual assault conviction. Stephen Ray Hessler was convicted on March 3, 2022, after an eight-day trial of two counts of sexual assault, six counts of unlawful deviant conduct, and seven counts of burglary resulting in bodily injury, three counts of criminal deviant conduct, and one count of robbery, 
each a Class A felony. During the trial, the prosecution called 27 witnesses. Most of them were victims who bravely testified despite having received death threats. Some witnesses were flown in from as far as Florida, Georgia, and Ohio, as well as Secret Service computer technicians from the East Coast. Brad Lynn Warlin, the Shelby County prosecutor, said, Stephen Ray Hester is one of the most evil, cruel, sadistic predators that I've had the pleasure of prosecuting in over 30 years. Um, he is where he needs to be. He needs to stay in jail until it's time to put him in the ground. During the trial, the prosecutor also described Hessler as a coward sadist. He clarified that Hessler is a sadist because he loves getting pleasure from hurting other people, and a coward because he could only do it when he was armed. On April 1, 2022, Stephen Ray Hessler was sentenced to 650 years in prison, 50 years for each crime. And finally, after nearly four decades, Hessler's victims are at peace, knowing their assailant would spend the rest of his life behind prison, where he belongs. It is a huge relief, I don't have to be afraid anymore, said the victim of the November 1, 1982 attack. She also encouraged all victims of sexual assault to always come forward. Good afternoon, and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you're new to the channel, hello and welcome. And if you're returning, welcome back. In this video, we are discussing three more cold cases solved with DNA. But first, I want to take a second to remind you to click the like button and turn on notifications. This helps the channel out immensely. Let's get into it. Number 1. Sandra Better on August 24, 1998, Sandra Better was working a closing shift alone in a Delray Beach, Florida consignment store. Only weeks away from retirement, the 68-year-old woman enjoyed her work at Luche's consignment. The wife and mother of three grown daughters didn't need to work, but instead she loved being around people and preferred being at the store than being at home. The store was filled with vintage furniture, decor, collectibles, and it was located in a strip mall that was known for amazing thrift stores. Her husband, Zeke Better, recalled her love of the store and loved getting dolled up for work. The two had just celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. The couple had met in Brooklyn, New York in 1948 and had been happily married ever since. The two had plans to go back to New York to renew their vows, and the trip was to take place after her last shift at the store. On that August day, two teenagers had walked by the consignment store and noticed it was still open 30 minutes after it normally closed. They popped in to check to see if the store was still open, and to their shock, found Sandra, beaten and covered in blood, lying on the store's floor. 911 was called and EMTs determined that Sandra had died of her wounds. She had been stabbed several times and her throat had a large gash. There was a massive amount of blood all throughout the store. Sandra had several defensive injuries on her hands and arms, indicating she had fought her attacker hard. The cash register had been emptied, leading the police to believe that that may have been the motive. However, the killer didn't take Sandra's Rolex watch or the large diamond engagement ring she wore. Police had a witness statement made by a customer who'd been in the store about half hour before the teens had made the horrific discovery. She described being in the store with Sandra and a Caucasian man who was tall, skinny, and haggling the price of a couch with Sandra. Another witness said she briefly popped into the store right before closing time and saw a man at the cash register talking to the store clerk. The descriptions matched the other witness's account. She didn't stay in the store long, nor did she remember seeing anyone else in the store. Police set up a sketch and released it to the media. The best evidence found in the shop was that it appeared the killer had cut himself in the process of murdering Sandra. Although it was mostly Sandra's blood tracked throughout the store, there was another person's blood on the cash register, door, and a set of decorative balls near Sandra. There were also fingerprints which, along with the blood, were put in the national databases. There were no media hits, and without any further leads, the case went cold. Police had interviewed 37 suspects, 
one man who had gone to the hospital that day with a laceration on his hand, another who had been reported to police for abruptly leaving town and relocating to the Midwest, and a man who was far too interested in the investigation. None matched the killer's DNA or prints. Zeke Better, devastated by the loss of his wife, set up a scholarship fund for criminal justice students in his wife's name. He also spent every remaining year of his life volunteering for the Delray Beach Police Department until his death in 2015. In 2018, the Delray Beach Police Department got an unexpected call. After 20 years, they had received a fingerprint match on the Sandra Better murder case. The prints belonged to Todd Barquette, a 51-year-old man living in Brandon, Florida, who had applied for a job as a nursing assistant, which had required him to submit fingerprints for a criminal record check. Back in 1998, Barquette had been living in a mobile home near Lantana, 10 miles from Delray Beach. He also matched the suspect's description. He was six foot two with light hair, and even 20 years later, he was still very slim. Barquette was never a suspect before his prints came up. All right, so what would you like to know? What this is pertaining to. Okay, so. Never been in trouble for anything other than some speeding tickets and stuff. So. Speeding tickets? Yeah. Okay. Um, just raise your right hand. Sure. Um, can you just state your name? Todd Barquette. Todd okay. Eric Barquette. Okay, and your birthday? January 8th, 1968. Okay, and you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth? I do. Okay. All right, so, um, like I said, we're from Delray. Okay. Um, have you ever been to Delray? Yeah, my wife and I lived on the East Coast. I think we moved down there in 95, 96, I think. And you moved down the East Coast? Where did you live? East Coast, uh, originally Lantana. Okay. Uh, then we lived in... Montana. We had an apartment in Boynton. We had a house in unincorporated Palm Beach, which could now be part of Lake Worth, I guess. Okay. And then Lake Worth also. Okay. And when did you? Oh, is this a wife? Yeah. Oh, okay. When did you? Um, when did you leave Palm Beach County? Uh, when the first recession hit. That was 2007, I guess. Late 2006, early 2007. Okay. We moved to South Carolina for about 18 months. Oh, okay. And then you moved here to Tampa? Came back down. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. And when you were in um, Palm Beach County, what did you do for work? Referred to various mortgage companies. I started with a small mortgage banker in Boca. Phoenix Mortgage, I think, was my first job down there. But then I worked for Countrywide. I worked for Bank of America. Okay. And what did your wife lenders. do for work? She was... Part, uh, she started down there as a uh, nurse recruiter. Okay. Staffing recruiter. Oh, she's a nurse here? Yeah. So oh, she's I see. done okay. some CNA work, and then she was a, a per diem recruiter and staffer for cross country staffing. Okay, so various like nursing, yeah. medical. Medical field, basically. Okay. All right, so um, we're, we're basically here because we're um, investigating a murder that happened a couple years ago. Okay. Uh, it was a number of years ago, and um, your name obviously came up, so that's why we're here. Um, do you have you ever been in Delray? Yeah, a lot of times. Okay. Why, what was your purpose of going to Delray? Normally, we'd go downtown, uh, usually for like a Friday night or Saturday night, down to what is it, Atlantic Boulevard, I think. Yeah, East where Atlantic, all the stores where all are. the yeah. bars all the, and all the restaurants bars are. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Have you ever gone to a consignment shop called Le Chaise? possible. We used to do some stuff where we'd buy antiques or stuff or just look around and do little stuff. Okay. Any, any um, way that you would be in a, a, a south federal highway? A lot, but not, not for any particular reason. Okay. Just because it was one of the main north-south roads. Okay. Where did you usually go to consignment shops at? Um, Boca. In Lantana? Boca? Yeah. Okay. There were a couple nice ones down there. Have you ever gone to any ones in Delray? They were on Atlantic, maybe. Okay. But okay. Do you remember anything they uh, picked up or dropped off at one of the shops? No, I don't think we ever sold anything. It was usually just buying knickknacks. Buying them? Yeah. Got anything still that you bought? God, no. No? Probably not. We, we, when we relocated from, we were living in Deerfield Beach when the financial crisis hit. We moved up to South Carolina and we sold a lot of stuff to facilitate the move because we just had no money. Uh, when we were in South Carolina, we bought a lot of stuff. Then moved back down, thinking we were going to downsize. We got rid of about a third of our stuff, also to help pay for the move. 
moving from a couple different spots in Tampa, we just kids are grown, so we've just downsized so often. I probably don't, other than photos, I don't think I have anything that's more than seven or eight years old. Okay. Do you have? How old are your kids? Thirty and twenty-eight. Oh, okay. All right. Um. All right. So mostly you were in Boca. If you had to do some consignment Boca, and if it was Delray, it was Atlantic Avenue. You never yeah, really went anywhere other than that. Okay. Right. And so it's possible we would, have, we would have sold something. Honestly, I don't know. I mean, my wife likes to buy, we, we buy a lot of vintage clothing. Uh -huh. I guess you call it vintage, used clothing. Just clothes, okay. Because it saves money, but. Would she remember? It's possible, I don't know. I mean, the times, you know, she, yeah. she walked up here and talked yeah. to her, she remembered. I'll ask, I mean, that's 20 years ago, I don't know. He had a minimal criminal history, mostly traffic citations. He had married and he'd been working at a retirement home for many years. When his picture was shown to one of the witnesses, she immediately picked him out of a group, identifying him as a man she saw in the store right before Sandra's murder. He was arrested in March 2018 and police were able to get a DNA sample and match it to the blood found on the cash register and the door. Police also noted a significant scar running from the right side of his mouth down under the right side of his chin. Barquette said he had been attacked by a dog, but police compared the scar to his driver's license, noting he had the scar after his 2002 license renewal photo. When the case went to trial, Barquette pleaded not guilty. His lawyers argued that he had gone to the store that day with a cut on his hand and touched a few of the items. He said no one was at the cash register and decided to steal the money on impulse. He denied ever murdering Sandra, but jurors didn't buy the story. After only a 90-minute deliberation, they came back with a guilty verdict. Todd Barquette was found guilty on August 23, 2019 for the murder of Sandra Better and sentenced to life in prison. Number two, Jane Morton Antonez and Patricia Dwyer. On November 17, 1997, Jane Morton Antonez left her parents' home at 7.30 p.m. Recently divorced, the 30-year-old woman had moved back in with her parents in Atascadero, California, while she sorted out the next chapter of her life. That evening, she was supposed to go to her best friend's house, but never arrived. The following morning, Jane's family discovered that Jane was neither at home nor with her friend. After calling around and not locating her, her older brother offered to drive around and see if he could find her car. The car was parked on a side road off of Highway 101 and was only a mile from the house. As he got closer to the vehicle, he immediately knew something wasn't right, and he made the grisly discovery of his sister's lifeless body. Jane was in the back seat of the vehicle, her throat slit, and she'd been sexually assaulted. There was little evidence as to what had happened. Jane didn't pick up hitchhikers, and there weren't any obvious mechanical issues with the vehicle, no clues as to how someone had gotten to her. Her case quickly went cold, but it wasn't the only tragedy to hit Atascadero. Two months following Jane's murder, Patricia Dwyer, a 28-year-old woman, was found murdered in her home. She had been stabbed in the chest and had also been sexually assaulted. In both cases, the women had had their hands similarly tied behind their backs. As we know from the Golden State Killer attacks, knot tying can be very distinctive. Although close in age and having few mutual acquaintances, the women didn't know each other, nor did they have any overlapping interests. The night that Patricia was murdered, she had told a friend that afternoon that she had plans to go to the grocery store and needed to get some cleaning done. The same friend had popped over for a visit the following day and discovered Patricia's body. The investigation immediately connected the two women slain, but much like the first murder, there was little to go on. There were no signs of forced entry into Patricia's home, but police also acknowledged that Patricia kept a key under the doormat to her front door. Police had been very public with their opinion that they were looking for one perpetrator. They handed out hundreds of flyers with the cases on them, hopeful that someone remembered something of value to the case, but they also used the campaign to remind women to lock their cars, lock their homes, and to not let strangers into their homes or vehicles. By the fall of 1978, both cases were cold. None of the suspects panned out, and years later, one by one, they were cleared by DNA. 
In 2005, the San Luis Obispo County Sheriff's Office reopened the case and uploaded samples of the DNA collected from the crime scenes to the national databases. There were no immediate hits, but the DNA would continually be sampled randomly in the automatic system. On June 21, 2017, the case was given new light when the sheriff's detective, Clint Cole, reopened the case again. Well, I try not to get too hopeful, but when you, when you know there's good evidence, like in this case, you, um, it, it, it's nice to know that. It's reassuring to know that there's a very strong chance that it, you're going to solve the case. Um, when you have DNA evidence, it's, it's really the golden ticket in most cases. What I do is I, I go through some of the reports that are online um, looking for DNA evidence, fingerprint evidence. You don't want to just close it to close it and think that you're on the right track. You want to know. Um, you want to know that it's, it's the person. Um, and in this case, we do know that. And as a matter of fact, the first person that I called when I knew we had a confirmation on the hit was um, former Chief Deputy John Hasty, who was the sergeant in charge of these cases, and congratulated him because they solved the case as much as I did. I didn't do anything special. Um, they're the ones that did by collecting the evidence. His investigation led to opening up the search to include familial matches in the national databases, and after 40 years, they had a clear lead. The close familial match happened to be an incarcerated inmate, and it only took investigators a brief conversation to get a lead suspect. Arthur Rudy Martinez had lived in Atascadero in 1977 and had moved in the winter of 1978. He had been a suspect in the initial investigation, but there was no evidence to tie him to the crimes at the time. In 1977, Martinez had been on parole for attempted murder and rape charges. He had also been working as a welder in the area, but after the murder of Patricia Dwyer, he relocated to Spokane, Washington. While in Washington, he committed multiple robberies and sexual assaults, and he was charged and sentenced to life in prison. In 1994, he escaped prison and lived in Fresno, California area for 20 years. In 2014, he turned himself in to authorities because he had cancer and needed to receive medical treatments. His decision to turn himself in came too late, and two months after returning to prison, he died from cancer. Detectives were able to track down Martinez's girlfriend, and she had a box of his personal effects. The box contained his razor, and from that, investigators were able to pull enough DNA to test it against the semen DNA collected from 1977. The samples matched, officially linking Martinez to the assaults of Jane Morton Antonez and Patricia Dwyer. Unfortunately, there will be no additional charges laid or a criminal trial. However, another cold case can be closed. Number 3. Carla Walker February 16, 1974, in Fort Worth, Texas, was a day full of excitement. That Saturday, Carla Walker spent the afternoon getting ready for a Valentine's Day dance at her high school. Carla was 17, a cheerleader, and a very popular spitfire who had her whole life ahead of her. Carla was to attend the dance with her boyfriend, Rodney. He was a year older than her and a quarterback of the football team. Friends described the couple as the perfect high school sweetheart. Friends said that Carla's family adored Rodney. Though they were young, the couple had already started making plans for their future, and Carla's family already considered Rodney a part of their family, welcoming him with open arms. The dance was full of fun, full of laughter, and although the event was chaperoned, teens have a way of eluding authority. Rodney said that the couple partook in sipping from a flask and smoked a small amount of pot. Carla and Rodney left the dance a little early with a group of friends. The group went to a local eatery and grabbed some snacks and hung out for a bit. Carla and Rodney bid their friends goodnight and drove off. The teens didn't head straight home. Instead, the couple went to a popular hangout, the local bowling alley. They went in briefly to use the washrooms, then returned to the car. 
The parking lot was close to empty, and they had parked in an even more secluded area. They were sitting in the back seat of the car, chatting, laughing, and the two began kissing. Carla was leaned against the passenger door. They were absorbed in their activities and didn't notice a man approach the vehicle. The stranger opened the passenger door, and because Carla had been leaning her full body weight on the door, she quickly tumbled out of the car. Rodney had attempted to grab her when the man repeatedly started hitting Rodney in the head with something hard. The stranger put the object against his head, and only then did Rodney realize the item was a pistol. Rodney heard Carla say, I'll go with you, just don't shoot him. Rodney heard the gun go off once, and he thought he'd been shot. The man then pointed the gun in his face and pulled the trigger a couple of times, but the gun made an empty click. The gun wasn't loaded. The assailant then hit Rodney again with the weapon, and this time Rodney was knocked unconscious. Rodney didn't see the man lead his girlfriend away. The last thing he remembered was Carla screaming, go get my dad. Rodney didn't know how much time had passed before he'd regained consciousness. He jumped back into the car and drove on autopilot to Carla's house. He tumbled through their front door covered in blood. Carla's father then drove to the bowling alley, which now was closed, and was joined by police. Police and volunteers undertook an extensive search. They searched by foot, by horseback, and by helicopter. Rodney's description of the man was clean-cut, Caucasian, slender. He had short, wavy hair, a thick Texas drawl, average height, and was wearing a shiny green sleeveless vest and a white cowboy hat. At the abduction site, police found a magazine for a 22 caliber Ruger pistol. While Rodney was the initial suspect, police didn't have much to go on. After three days of searching, police discovered Carla's body. She was partially clad in a ditch near Lake Benbrook. Police determined there had been evidence to suggest Carla had been held captive, tortured, sexually assaulted, and injected with morphine. The autopsy estimated her time of death of Monday, meaning she had been held captive for roughly 24 to 36 hours. Her cause of death was strangulation. Police received 200 tips from the public, and several suspects were investigated. One such man was a previously convicted car thief who lived less than a mile from the bowling alley. Glenn Samuel McCurley was a truck driver who was off work the night of the abduction and had no alibi because his wife was away that weekend. He was initially picked up because he had recently purchased new bullets for his 22 caliber Ruger pistol, a gun that had matched the magazine that was found at the abduction site. He had said his gun had been stolen while he had been fishing. The date he gave for the theft of the weapon was around the same time as Carla's abduction, and he told police he hadn't reported it stolen because he had a criminal record. He was eventually released because there was no evidence to directly link him to the crime, and police focused on other suspects. Over the years, several people came forward attaching themselves to the case. However, all were able to be eliminated. Police did have key evidence, but needed to wait until technology could catch up. DNA was found on Carla's clothing and preserved. In the 1990s, the DNA was input into the national databases, but nothing came up. In April 2019, police received a letter from a person claiming to be the man who had abducted and murdered Carla. Police put that letter out on social media and asked for the man to come forward. In September 2019, police joined forces with Ortham Incorporated, a private lab in Texas. Ortham was able to pull a full genetic profile of the suspect. Using familial genealogy, the lab was able to reverse engineer a family tree. They were able to narrow it down to three brothers, all with the last name McCurley. Cold case investigators recognized the last name as it matched one of the initial suspects. In July of 2019, police collected a sample of McCurley's DNA from discarded trash. Following a positive match, they were able to obtain an arrest warrant. After his arrest, he submitted two additional DNA samples, which both tested positive. This solidified investigators' belief they had found the right man. 46 years after Carla's murder, her killer would face a grand jury. Now 77, Glenn Samuel McCurley faces a capital murder charge and is being held on a $100,000 bond. After the arrest, Carla's family said it brought them relief to have answers and justice for Carla, finally. 
Hopefully, it also brought a relief to Rodney, now in his 60s, who has lived his entire adult lifehood under a cloud of suspicion. Although he was never a named suspect, there was always a cloud of doubt in the court of public opinion that followed him. At this time, there are no further court dates, McCurley has not obtained legal counsel, though there will likely be updated court dates in the new year. Good afternoon, and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you're new to the channel, hello and welcome, and if you're returning, welcome back. Today, we'll be discussing the recent discovery that baby Holly, missing for 42 years, has been found alive and well, and also the mystery surrounding the cold case murder of her parents. Let's get into it. In 1975, in New Smyrna, Florida, a young couple, 17-year-old Tina Gale Lynn and 21-year-old Dean Klaus, get married. High school sweethearts, the couple soon welcomed their daughter they named Holly. After Holly was born, the couple decided to relocate to Texas, where Dean had lined up a construction job and left behind their families. They packed up their car and set out to start their new lives in Texas. Initially, the couple kept in frequent contact with their families, but the calls and letters suddenly stopped. The last contact was in April of 1980. It wasn't initially thought of as a cause for concern, but Dean's family received a strange call. A woman, who called herself Sister Susan, said she was calling from Los Angeles, California. She told Donna that she had information about Tina and Dean, and that she was in possession of Dean's car, and offered to bring the vehicle to Florida in exchange for $1,000. The car had been purchased by Donna and gifted to Dean for the move. Donna agreed to meet the woman, but also alerted authorities. They agreed to meet at the Daytona racetrack. The Klaus family was confused when three women in white robes, possibly one male, stepped out of the vehicle. Sister Susan told Donna that Dean and Tina had joined a religious group and did not want to be contacted by family members. She further stated that the couple had given up all of their possessions. The women were purportedly taken into custody, but no police report of the incident was ever found, and because the couple were adults, no investigation was taken at that time. Donna stated that she hadn't been surprised that Dean had joined a cult. He had expressed interest and had been involved in a different cult in Florida, but she thought that he'd put it past him when he married Tina. After this encounter, no one heard from Tina or Dean ever again. It was in 1981 in Houston, Texas, when two bodies were discovered in a wooded area. It was a man and woman found in a shallow grave buried together. The cause of death was deemed to be homicide. The man appeared to have been beaten to death, while the woman had injuries consistent with strangulation, and in the grave was a bloody towel and green gym shorts. They estimated that they had been killed two months before the discovery. The bodies had no identification, and there weren't any missing person report that matched. Composite sketches were done and released to the media, but no one came forward. The bodies remained unidentified for decades. They were buried in the Harris County and were given the names Harris County Jane and John Doe. In 2021, Texas established a dedicated statewide cold case unit for the first time to start going through the 20,000 unsolved murders in the state. The cold case team started accepting cases in the fall of 2021, and one of the first cases they decided to open was that of the Harris County Jane and John Doe. They first decided to have the bodies exhumed in order to get DNA samples from the two of them. Genetic genealogy was done, and soon the bodies were identified as Tina and Dean Klaus, who had been missing since 1981. Law enforcement started their investigation, which led them to speak to the families of the deceased. Very quickly, they learned that the couple had a young daughter, and a search began to find baby Holly. Dean's mother said that she was devastated to learn that Dean and Tina had been murdered so soon after they stopped communication. Though she had missed her son over the years, she had hoped the family had been living out their lives, but had always feared the worst. 
both Tina's family and Dean's family had never given up hope that they might one day have answers. Law enforcement from multiple agencies set to work trying to find Holly, and in June 2022, they made the discovery that no one had thought possible. Holly Klaus, now 42, was found in Oklahoma. Investigators finding Holly this week in Oklahoma, telling her the truth about her biological parents. She's seen here holding a picture of them. She has her mother's, um, yeah, her mother's smile, and she has a mother's uh, voice. The Klaus and Lynn families meeting her for the first time this week on a video call. When I looked at her, I remembered the times that I used to hold her in my arms, you know, and I just wanted to hug her. I just wanted to get up and hug her so bad. But it was Zoom, and you can't. Still, it is a bittersweet reunion. Authorities now want the public's help in finding whoever murdered Dean and Tina. Some details have not been released to protect the ongoing investigation, but it was revealed that shortly after the murder of Tina and Dean, Holly had been left at a church in Arizona and adopted by the pastor and his wife of the church. They had renamed the infant. She never knew her birth name, birth family, or parents. Holly's adoptive parents were not suspects. They revealed details about the circumstances that brought Holly to their front door. Two women dressed in white robes and barefoot. They identified themselves as members of a nomadic religious group. The women spoke about their beliefs, saying that their religion included separating male and female members and practicing vegetarian habits. They also stated that their religion prevented them from wearing leather goods. These group members also indicated that they had previously given up another baby at a laundromat. Experts have identified the group as likely being the nomadic cult called Christ's Family, which had been led by Charles McHugh. The group had been known to wander the southern United States for years and had been active in Texas in 1981. The Texas General Attorney's Office went on to state that the members of the group are believed to have traveled to Arizona, California, and possibly Texas. The members of the nomadic group had been spotted in Yuma, Arizona during the 1980s, with the female members asking the public for food. McHugh, who called himself Lightning Amen, believed himself to be Jesus reincarnated and at the group's highest had 2,000 members. McHugh encouraged excessive drug use and demanded that members give up their former lives and earthly possessions. Children within the cult were viewed as excessive baggage, and it was required that all children be given up. If Tina and Dean had been involved with this or recruited into this cult, they would have been required to give up Holly, and it is still unknown what led to their deaths. The FBI had noted that this particular group as non-violent, However, the leader was seen as dangerous and unpredictable. McHugh had been arrested in 1985 for possession and transporting methamphetamines for the purpose of sale, as well as weapons charges. At his arrest, he was also found to be in possession of several weapons, various other drugs, and $4,200 in cash. He was convicted along with four other followers and went to prison for a bit. Another incident in 1985 was when 10 cult members were arrested for growing over $900,000 worth of cannabis at a compound in California. The cult broke up when McHugh was in prison. When he was released, he had a small following until his death in 2010, though there are still active members of Christ's family. Holly, whose adopted name has been withheld to protect her family's privacy, has five children of her own and even is a grandmother. She has been reunited with her birth family, who has welcomed her return. Their reunification is being facilitated by experts. Family members are relieved that Holly had a good life and was well cared for all of these years. We had nightmares, you know, almost every night, you know, wondering, you know, what happened to Holly. It is a question Debbie Brooks, Holly's aunt, and Donna Casasanta, Holly's grandmother, have been asking themselves for decades. All kinds of things go through your mind, but you never are ever, ever at rest. This morning, after 40 years of searching, they can finally rest a bit easier with the answer. And they called us and found Holly. That night I was able to go to bed. The investigation into the murders of Dean and Tina Klaus is still ongoing. Little is known about what may have happened to the couple. Had they refused to give up Holly and was killed by McHugh or other members? 
The timeline puts a time of murder around the same time the car was returned to Florida. If anyone has information about their deaths, they are asked to please contact the Texas Attorney General's Cold Case and Missing Persons Unit. In 1981, two deceased individuals were discovered in the wooded area in Houston, Texas. Their identities could not be determined at that time. What law enforcement did know is that they were likely murdered. Decades later, in 2021, the organization Identifiners International was able to positively identify the bodies that were found in 1981 through the use of genetic testing. The couple was from Florida, and their names were Tina Gail Lynn Klaus and Harold Dean Klaus. They were a young couple. We learned this couple had an infant daughter named Holly, who was not found with the remains of the Klauses. And so the search for baby Holly began. The Lynn and Klaus families have been searching for answers concerning the Klauses and their baby daughter, Holly, since they were last heard from in 1980. Last year, when the families learned that the two bodies from, found in Houston in 1981 were in fact Tina and Dean Klaus, the families began looking for answers as, a what, as to what happened to baby Holly and the circumstances surrounding the deaths of the Klauses. Through collaborative efforts of the Texas Attorney General's Office Cold Case and Missing Persons Unit, the Louisville Police Department, the Volusia County Sheriff's Office in Florida, the Arizona Attorney General's Office, the Harris County Sheriff's Office, and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, I'm excited to announce that baby Holly has been located alive and well 42 years later. I also am happy to announce that the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children have offered and will be paying for uh, Holly to be reunited in person with the Lynn and Klaus families. Holly has been notified of the identities of her biological parents and got to meet her extended biological for the family for the first time this Tuesday. They hope to meet per in person soon and, and NICMIC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, is going to facilitate that meeting. This investigation highlights the hard work and collaboration of multiple law enforcement agencies working together across the country and demonstrates the importance of continuing to investigate cold cases both in Texas and in the United States. Now, this next part I'm sharing with you today because we're asking from, for help from the public because we have yet to solve this particular crime. While we rejoice today that Holly has been found and families that were looking her for decades rejoice, we still are looking for suspects in this case. And I want to share that information with you, and I, I want to say this again. If you have information in this case, and I'm about to share some facts with you, but if you have infor information about this case, please contact the Texas Attorney General's Office Cold Case Unit at coldcaseunit at oag.texas.gov. That's coldcaseunit at oag.texas.gov. And our phone number as well for this investigation is 512-936-0742. The following information is released today regarding our investigation in hopes that people will hear this story and come forward with more information. Baby Holly was left at a church in Arizona and was taken into their care. Out of respect for Holly and her family, we won't have any further comments or details regarding that at this time. The family that raised Holly are not suspects in this case. Two women who identified themselves as members of a nomadic religious group brought Holly to the church. They were wearing white robes and they were barefoot. They indicated the beliefs of their religion included the separation of male and female members, practicing vegetarian habits, and not using or wearing leather goods. The women indicated they had given up a baby before at a laundromat. It is believed that this particular group traveled around southwestern United States, including Arizona, California, and possibly Texas. There were sightings of this religious group around the Yuma, Arizona area in the early 80s. The women members would be seen around town at various points asking for food. In late December 1980, or early January 1981, the families of Tina Lynn Klaus and Harold Dean Klaus received a phone call from someone identifying herself as Sister Susan. 
who explained she was calling from Los Angeles, California, and wanted to return Tina and Dean's car to their family. She further stated that Tina and Dean had joined their religious group and no longer wanted to have contact with their families. They were also giving up all of their possessions. Sister Susan asked for money in exchange for returning the car to Florida where the family lived. The family agreed but contacted the local authorities about the situation. The family agreed to meet Sister Susan at the Daytona racetrack in Florida. The family described meeting two to three women and possibly one male and once again, these women were wearing robes and to be, appeared to be members of this religious group. The police purportedly took the women into custody, but there is no record of a police report on file that has been found as of yet. Given the age of this case, that is common. We're still on the hunt for that police report. The return car belonged to Dean's mother and was, in fact, the car that they had in their possession. And this is the description of the vehicle. It's a 1978 two-door red burgundy AMC Concord. Tina Lynn Klaus and Harold Dean Klaus were likely murdered between December 1980 or early January 1981. Their bodies were found off of Wallaceville Road in Harris County, Texas. I'm going to repeat that. Their bodies were found off of Wallaceville Road in Harris County, Texas. And this was between January 6th and January 11th of 1981. They were last heard from by their families in late October 1980, and they had been living in Louisville, Texas in October of 1980, around that time. If you have any information regarding these murders, we ask that you come forward, even if it's a piece of information that may not be concrete evidence. We need to find pieces of the puzzle to solve this crime. The Texas AG's Office Cold Case Unit and the law enforcement agencies that work with us are committed to bringing justice in this case. We wish Holly the best. We're grateful that we found her, uh, but we must continue with our purpose of finding who murdered this couple. Good afternoon, and welcome to True Crime Mysteries, where we take a dive into some of the world's most prolific crimes. If this is your first time to the channel, hello and welcome, and thank you for being here. Today, we are discussing a cold case that had been without leads for 17 years. Let's get into it. February 24th, 1986. Sherry Rasmussen was living a seemingly perfect life. She was young, newly married to the man of her dreams, and had done very well in her career in nursing. She had a strong network of close friends and family, and friends who would describe Sherry as a bright light for those around her, always laughing, and she would light up any room she walked into. That morning, she decided to take a sick day and told her husband she wasn't going to be going into work that day. She had a presentation to deliver at work, and she wasn't keen on the subject matter, so she was going to use a back injury caused by aerobics the previous day. Her husband John kissed her goodbye and promised not to be home too late and left for work. That day, in the early evening hours, John came home. He had tried to call Sherry all day to check in on her, both at home and at work, but he couldn't get in touch. None of her co-workers or close friends had seen her that day. This didn't initially cause him alarm. He had just assumed that she had perhaps gone out and not told him, or maybe gone into the office at work and no one had seen her yet. What was unusual was the answering machine at home hadn't been turned on. Sherry had always been on his case, asking him to turn on the answering machine when he left the house, so he was surprised she hadn't turned it on. He arrived home and saw that there was glass in the driveway from a broken patio door and Sherry's car was missing. He assumed Sherry had backed into something with the car and it fell and broke the window and he was initially annoyed. Then he started to notice more out of place things. The door that entered the home from the garage was slightly open and the living room was a disaster with furniture thrown all over the place and broken glass and a bloody handprint next to the panic button to their home alarm system. 
It's at this moment when John finds his new bride, lying motionless on the floor, still in her nightgown that she had been wearing when he left. Her face had been beaten so badly, she was almost unrecognizable, and when he touched her, her body was stone cold. Sherry Rasmussen had been gone for hours. A completely distraught John calls 911, and when the operator was trying to ascertain the situation, John was unable to speak. Police arrived on the scene and noted that it looked like Sherry had fought until her last breath and that her husband was in complete shock. John tells police he last saw his wife when he left for work that morning, and the police begin the investigation. Sherry was a very intelligent woman. From 16, she went straight into college and discovered her love for nursing. By her late 20s, she had worked through the ranks to be a nursing instructor, teaching nursing students. It was at a college party that she met John, a mechanical engineering student. He quickly moved into her condo and the two became husband and wife in November of 1985. But they hadn't been together very long when odd things began happening in their relationship. After their engagement party, a woman showed up at their home. She had been wearing revealing workout attire and was holding skis and had asked to speak to John. John explained to Sherry that the woman had been an ex-girlfriend, Stephanie Lazarus, that the two were still friends and that he had promised Stephanie he would wax her skis. Sherry was furious and told John that she didn't want him to have any contact with Stephanie, but John told her she was being ridiculous and to stop being jealous. When Lazarus came back a few days later to pick up the freshly waxed skis, she showed up in a full police uniform, complete with a gun. Sherry was unnerved to find out Lazarus was a police officer. Lazarus had also stopped by her work and informed Sherry that John had come to her after their engagement party and had spent the night. Sherry confronted John about it and he had admitted it was true. He had slept with Stephanie, but it was the last time and he said it was for closure for Stephanie. It was at this point when Sherry told John that if they were to get married, he was not to be friends with Lazarus, and she was going to have to stop showing up at their home. John complied with Sherry, and their wedding proceeded. Stephanie and John had met in college. They lived on the same floor of their dorms. They had been friends for a long time. They often worked out and studied together. Stephanie was attractive, athletic, competitive, and intelligent. Stephanie and John kept a large group of friends, and they all had similar interests in sports and partying. Eventually, John and Stephanie became friends with benefits. They had an ongoing, open relationship for several years. They both dated other people, but would gravitate back to one another even after college. John had always considered their relationship to be very casual. Just kids fooling around was how he later described it to the courts. After college, Stephanie applied for the police academy, which had surprised her family. However, the training academy was close to where John was working as an engineer, and it allowed her to remain close to John. She had even thrown John a surprise 25th birthday party, and it was here that John told her he was seeing someone it was serious. Stephanie was devastated. She wrote to John's mother, I wish it didn't end the way it did, and I don't think I'll ever understand his decision. According to her journal, she wrote at the time, she was in a deep depression. She had truly believed that one day John would come to his senses and they would be together. It was after Sherry and John's engagement party that Stephanie begged John not to marry Sherry and confessed her love for him. John said he had told Stephanie he had wanted to be with Sherry, but the two did end up sleeping together that night. Stephanie had been determined that she could break up the happy couple. Even after John's wedding, she obsessed over John. She would write about him daily in her journal convincing only herself that Sherry was the only thing in the way of her happiness. During the initial investigation, it was presumed that there had been a massive struggle. 
The police agreed that the struggle had lasted for over an hour and had moved from the upstairs staircase into the living room. Sherry had several bruises on her face and body suggesting that she had fought her attacker. She was very fit and was a tall woman. It would have been challenging for an assailant to subdue Sherry. The police speculated that Sherry had been hit over the head with a flower vase, giving the attacker enough time to get the gun out, wrap it in a blanket to muffle the sound, and deliver the fatal blows. Sherry had been shot three times. All shots were fatal. Note that this was consistent with how police trainees learn to take down enemies. Police theorized that two burglars had broken into the condo shortly after John left for work, and they were unhooking electronics in the living room when Sherry surprised them by coming out of the bedroom. They had a witness who described seeing two Latino men in the area, so the story formed that two illegal immigrants had killed Sherry. The only things that had been taken were Sherry's car that had been recovered two weeks later with no evidence, and Sherry and John's marriage license. Police were still confident in this theory because there had been several break-ins before the murder and one carried out in a similar manner two weeks after. A detective did note that a bite mark on Sherry's arm was more consistent with a female attacker, but no one supported his feelings, so he kind of chalked it up to that males had been known to bite people as well. The lead detectives on the case were also older, highly overworked, and were covering multiple homicides and break-ins at this point, and without any good leads or suspects right off the bat, the case was stuffed into an evidence locker, and the detectives moved on to other cases. After Sherry's murder, friends and family were shocked that John wasn't more involved in the investigation to find Sherry's killer. John had quit his job and moved out of L.A. a few months after his wife had died. Sherry's father and police were convinced that he was holding back information, but John claims that he never held anything back, and he had told detectives to investigate his ex-girlfriend, but records show that he didn't point detectives in that direction until years later. Sherry's father had become her champion continually pushing officers into her murder. In the weeks leading up to her death, Sherry had told her friends an unsettling story about an ex-girlfriend of John's, coming to her office and telling Sherry that, if I can't have John, no one can, and when this marriage doesn't work out, I'll be there to pick up the pieces. A co-worker told police that Sherry couldn't go anywhere without this ex-girlfriend casually popping up, often in uniform and armed. Sherry had been suspicious that Stephanie and her husband still had an ongoing intimate relationship, but John always denied it, accusing Sherry of being too jealous. John didn't support Sherry's feelings about being fearful of Stephanie, and Sherry had told friends she was thinking about breaking up with John because of it. Sherry had also told her father a few days before her murder that she was being followed by a person that she thought was a woman dressed as a man. The person had piercing eyes that she described as staring through you. When Sherry's father had been detailing this information to the lead detective, the detective told him he was watching too much TV. The lead detective has since retired, but when new detectives were going through the information on this case, they had noted that none of these statements had gone in the case file. The only leads noted in the case were ones that had gone in the burglary direction. Sherry's father, John, and Sherry's co-workers and friends had all given statements, but law enforcement officers never followed up on them. It wasn't until two decades later. Current detectives give credit to Sherry's father, who never gave up on Sherry. He badgered law enforcement to open the case and to do DNA testing, even offering to pay for it himself. He was unsuccessful for many years, until, after many appeals, he was able to get the DNA evidence collected at the murder tested. It was at this point that there was no longer any denying justice. The evidence was too much to put off. The DNA had been taken from a small bite mark on Sherry's arm. Sherry's investigation was described as sloppy, negligent police work that was so poorly handled it looked to be a cover-up. 
That was the only explanation as to why Sherry's murder went unnoticed for two decades, despite having all of the evidence in the possession of the police. In the late 1990s, once DNA evidence began being critical for convictions, the LA Police Department formed a new unit which looked through forensic evidence collected from cold case files, ran them through the various databases to see if anything came of it. In 2004, Jennifer Butterworth was assigned to the Rasmussen file. Butterworth noticed that not all of the evidence was in the box. The DNA evidence had been checked out by an officer in 2003 and never put back. She spent days hunting for it, and after a week, she found it in the back of a coroner's freezer. She ran the samples through and reaffirmed that most of the DNA evidence was Sherry's. However, the sample from the bite mark was determined to be female, and it didn't hit any matches in CODIS. This completely changed the theory that Sherry had been murdered by two men. She had begun to go through the rest of the evidence and came across a note from a statement that Sherry had been harassed by a woman. When she asked her supervisor if this woman was worth looking into, her supervisor insisted that it was a burglary and to leave the case alone. The case was put back into storage. In 2009, detectives Jim Nuttall and Pete Barba came across the Rasmussen file and thought it was interesting enough to look at it again. The thing they thought was most interesting was the DNA evidence pointing to a female assailant. They decided that this invalidated the theory of a botched burglary and began again from scratch. They noted that nothing of value was removed from the home, the condo was in the middle of a gated complex surrounded by other units, it was highly visible in the daylight, and the fact that the home alarm system had not been engaged and the front door had not been tampered with. This quickly became a murder investigation that had been staged as a burglary to throw off a police investigation. Another note was that the evidence pointed to a struggle beginning upstairs and continuing down the stairwell, but the equipment that the burglars were supposedly there to steal were neatly stacked at the top of the stairs. Had the burglary theory been scrutinized, it would have made more sense that the equipment was collected up and stacked after the fact. There was also a bloody thumbprint shaped mark on a record player that was noted. It was a similar print left by someone wearing gloves, further validating that the killer was familiar with police investigations. They had five female suspects and Detective Nuttall called John to get more information. Nuttall was shocked to discover that the ex-girlfriend of John was in law enforcement and he was familiar with Stephanie Lazarus. She currently outranked him and was part of the Elite Robbery Homicide Division. Stephanie Lazarus quickly made it to the top of the suspect list. When Nuttall and Barba theorized how they would commit a murder, they thought it would be best to do it on a day off. Lazarus was off the day of the murder. They thought they wouldn't be able to use their duty gun because losing it would open up an investigation, but using a backup or a personal weapon wouldn't. Lazarus reported a 38 caliber weapon stolen 13 days after the murder. And lastly, a working patrol officer would know just enough to make a crime scene look like a burglary. Stephanie Lazarus begun her career in the LA Police Department as a beat cop. Stephanie had always been described as a cop's cop. She had worked very hard and eventually got to working the art theft detail. Working the art theft detail was very high profile, it was always in the news, always a department that got a lot of buzz. Not the type of attention one would assume an active murderer would draw to themselves. She rose to the ranks to be a highly respected detective. Lazarus had always kept tabs on the Rasmussen cold case, occasionally checking out evidence or asking investigators if there were any leads. In 1996, Lazarus married a fellow cop and adopted a daughter with him. Lazarus was living a seemingly normal life, having a successful career, attended school events, and prepared items for bake sales. She was very involved in her community. The detectives began taking statements from friends and family of Sherry and were shocked that none of the instances where Lazarus had stalked and confronted Sherry had never been put in the case file. 
the detectives began to plan for the arrest. The case was presented to senior officers and prosecutors, and it was transferred to the Robbery Homicide Division, the very same division that Lazarus worked in. Everything needed to be handled very carefully. On the day of the arrest, a dozen officers were brought into the department before dawn, each given search warrants and told to wait. Meanwhile, Lazarus began her commute into the city. Specific detectives were assigned to handle the arrest, all of them selected because they didn't have a personal connection to Lazarus. They decided to call Lazarus down to, to the Parker Center. This location was selected because Lazarus would need to surrender her weapon in order to enter. This minimized the possibility of her harming herself or other officers when she was to be arrested. Lazarus thought she would be interviewing a suspect in one of her cases. Instead, she was sat in a room with, with Detective Stearns and Jeremio. Uh, I don't want to bring this up in your squadron. Oh, no, it's fine. I think we're good. We're bring, you're going to bring somebody in, right? Yeah, well, I'll oh, explain okay. the whole thing. I don't want to talk about this in the squadron well, because I, okay. I don't know who people are listening. That's true. That's and if we go to my side, everybody's yeah. always wondering what everybody oh, else yeah, is sure, doing. No okay. But uh, like we're talking about being busy and stuff. We've been assigned a case that we've been looking at. Okay. okay. It's a new case. And as we're doing the case, there's some notes uh, to see uh, as far as your name being mentioned. Do oh, you, okay. Do you know John Rutten? John Rutten? John Rutten? Rutten. Right. Oh, yeah, I went to school with him. You did? Yeah. How long did you know him? Gosh, I went to school in, um, let's see, went to UCLA in 1978, I started, and, um, you know, met him at school at the dorms. Mm -hmm. um, were you guys friends, close friends? Yeah, we were very close friends. I yeah. Mean, I mean, what's this all about? Well, it's regarding, it's a case we're working on, and it involves John, and in there, some of the statements we, we reviewed... Uh, you know, there's notes and stuff that he, that he knew you and stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, we were good friends. Um, lived in the dorms for, I lived in the dorms for two years. Um, you guys lived in the same dorm? Yeah. Or? Okay. Yeah, Dijkstra. Okay. Were you guys just friends or anything else? or? Yeah, we were, we were good friends. Yeah. Was there ever any relationship or anything that developed between you guys? Yeah, I mean, we dated. Uh-huh. Uh you know, um, I mean... Is it, what's this all about? Well, it's relating to uh, his wife. Okay. Okay. Did you know her? Not really. I mm. mean, I knew that he got married years ago. Uh huh. Did you ever meet her? God, I don't know. Um, Do you know who she was or anything? Well, I. Let me think. God, it's been a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I may have met her. Um, geez. You know. Yeah. Uh, well, let me see. Let me ask you. You said you you dated John. How long did you guys date? I mean, well, are you guys? Is this something? I mean, you said that I was going to interview somebody about art and how well, you guys are. Here's. here's <laughs> I mean. Stephanie, here's the situation. It's basically, we, you know, we knew that this uh, when we saw this in the in in this chrono that maybe you know there was some relationship there. That's what the chrono seemed to indicate, and we didn't want to come up to you at your desk and ask those kinds of questions or do anything. You know how up there people can see what's going on if you go into an interview room or people are in there getting oh, supplies. Okay. I mean, so we, we wanted to afford you some privacy, some confidentiality okay. to talk about this because we thought it might be, you know, something, you know, you're married to someone else, obviously, and so forth, and that you may not want to, you know, talk about these things in that setting where someone, you know, we don't want the rumor mill or gossip or any of that kind of stuff yeah, to I mean, start. that's fine. I mean... So we're, we're, we did this just as, as a means to try and speak to you in okay, just a confidential I mean, just place where you, you know, where where your business isn't out there for other people in, in well, you know, I mean, your division yeah, to know I about. Mean, you know, God, that's been a million years ago. I mean, you know... Um, what year is it now? 2009? I mean, I graduated in 82. 82, mm. yeah. Um, you know, we dated. Um, I dated other guys. I'm sure he dated other girls. Um, mm. Well, let me ask you, <laughs> roughly, how long would you, <coughs> would you say you guys dated? Oh, jeez. Um, I couldn't even say. I mean, I started school there in 78. Mm -hmm. I started UCLA in 1978. Mm -hmm. I graduated in 82. 
um, I don't even remember what year he graduated, if it was a year or two before me. Okay. Um, I think he was a little bit older than I was. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I can't remember if he was born, let's say I was born in 60, 1960. I don't know if he was born in 58 or 59. I mean, I, you know, um, I mean, I knew his parents, I knew his sister, his brother went to Northridge. Mm-hmm. Um, um, you know, his sister spent the night at my house before. Obviously, I spent the night at his house before. He probably spent the night at my house before. Um, you know, I, I yeah. yeah, I don't. I, well, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because from what you're telling me, is you, you guys dated while you were in college together, right? Yeah, and probably after college. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I can't. Jeez, um, I'm trying to think when I met my husband. I met my husband in, when did I meet Scott? Um, let's see, I was teaching D.A.R.E. Because I met Scott when I was teaching D.A.R.E. up in Oregon. But we had long stopped you know, dating before that. So you um, haven't talked to him for a long time? Oh, I, I think I haven't talked to him in a long time. Um, I couldn't even tell you when the last time I talked to him. Um, I met Scott, I'm thinking in... 92 maybe um, April of 92 it was Scott being your husband yeah I'm trying to think I was teaching dare let's see what year is this This is, we'll be married I got married in 1996 I think I met Scott in 92 prior to that I couldn't tell you how long I had talked you know talked to John b- prior to that but mm-hmm. since um, you since you met your husband Scott you hadn't talked to him I mean he may have called me uh once or twice uh-huh. before we got married right um you know geez i i lived i moved to see me in 1994 because i lost my house in the earthquake oh really? um uh quite honestly i probably keep in contact with a few people from the dorms we we all we all lived on the 10th floor um and um there's about three or four people I keep in contact with. There's probably like six or eight of us that were all really close. Mm-hmm. And who are those um, people? Oh, geez. Um, Diana Basta. Um, the people I still keep... I, I haven't t- been in contact with her in a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, wh- wh- you know, what's, uh, what's, I mean, what's this all about? I mean... Well, let me ask you. What ended the relationship between you and John? You know, I don't... It was kind of a weird relationship. I mean, we 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 dated. Um, I can't say that he was my boyfriend. I don't know that he would have considered me his girlfriend. Um, we just we dated. We did things. I played sports in college. He played basketball. His brother played basketball. Um, it, it, we just, you know, it just didn't work out. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. It was like I went out with other guys, um, saw other guys. I went on lots of vacations. Um, you know, and, and once you guys split, were you guys still friends or kind of, uh, you know, I problems? Mean, Is it friendly, not friendly? No, I don't think it was not friendly. I mean, we were friendly. Um, uh, I know that we went to Hawaii um, at one point. Um, another friend of mine who's actually dying right now uh, was uh, went to Hawaii with us um, at some point. Um, Remember roughly when that was? Oh, geez. Um, let me think. Hmm. I'd have to check my pictures. Um, or I'd, I'd say I'd ask Greg, but my friend Greg is like dying of liver cancer right mm. now. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know. And you were it, saying that. Um, the, it's d- 2009 now. Had you ever met his wife? I may have. Do you know, do you remember her name or anything? Or. Um. Um, or what she did for a living, or where she worked, or anything uh, about her. Well, I think she. I th- I'm going to say that I think she was a nurse. Um, I mean, I can't even remember how he, he said he met her. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, it's been so long ago. Well, let me ask you: Did you go to their wedding? You know. No, I didn't go to their wedding. Um, no, I don't. Did not go to their wedding. Um, couldn't even tell you what year he got married. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's it's been a million years ago. You ever remember if you ever talked to her? Because it seems like a lot of you who were <laughs> at at the school at UCLA, you guys kind of were friends during and after school. So I don't know if you guys still associated afterwards when, once he was married or anything. With him? Yeah. No, I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, 
I would say, you know, the the people that were on the dorm floor, we'd have we'd have get togethers. Um, there's probably like four or five. I don't think he ever came. Um, yeah, uh-huh. I don't think no. It was there was like it was mostly girls, you know, um, a girl named Smita, Diane. Um, there's another. There's two Dianes, but the one Diane I don't think she ever came. I kind of lost contact with her. We were good friends on the floor. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, again, I, I mean, what, you know, I don't understand why you're talking about some guy I dated a million years ago. Well, do you know what happened to his wife? Yeah, I know she got killed. What did um, you What did you hear about that? I, I saw a poster at work. Um, I'm sure I spoke to him about it. Um, I think I spoke to another friend of his about it. Um, and how did how did you first learn about that? Jeez. <laughs> Someone could have called me. I could have heard it at work. Um, I think at one point there may have been a flyer or something. I know a good friend of his... Um, Were you on the job back then when that happened? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm sure I was on the job. That's why I would have heard about it with the flyer. Um, he had a good friend, Mike... Mike... Boldrick? Mike... Hmm. Um, anyways, a... a, a, a he may have lived in the dorms. I don't remember if that's how I met him. Um, I I may have talked to him. I mean, you know, I don't remember how I heard. I mean, I don't even remember what year it was. And you think you you thought you said you thought his wife was a nurse. Do you have any idea where she was working at the time, or did um, he ever mention that to you? Was it a hospital or a doctor's office? I'm or? sure he must have mentioned it. Now, now that you're bringing that up, I think she worked at a hospital somewhere. And yeah, I may have met her at a hospital. Um, I may have talked to her once or twice um, at, a, at a hospital or more, um, but you be, know. But being that you were kind of used to see uh, John, you know, was it everything okay between you guys? I mean, there was never anything uncomfortable or anything between you and her? Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's God, it's been so many years. I mean, uncomfortable, I mean... I, I can't even I can't even remember if we had a conversation. I mean, we may have. I may have I may have seen her at his apartment. You know, it, uh, geez, how many years ago is that? I don't even know what year she you know got killed. Where was his apartment? On Roscoe. Okay. Yeah, Roscoe and um, um, east or west of DeSoto, uh, either east or west of DeSoto. Do you know where he moved after? Did, uh, did he move after he got married, or do you know or? Oh, I'm sure he did. Did you know um, where he was living, or somewhere in the valley? Did you ever visit him and his wife? No. No, never no. went out. To, you know, get together, dinners. I no, no. Like I said, his sister used to come over. His sister had had, had come to my place. I knew his I knew his brother because his brother played basketball at Northridge. Um, in fact, I was just coming across some pictures that I had just scanned. Uh, scanned from um, I take a lot of photos uh-huh. um, like 10,000 and I just did a service where I scanned everything um, and I'd seen some pictures of his brother playing well, basketball. you just put them all on your computer so you could have them yeah. accessible and do oh, things yeah. with them? Well my partner is a big photo thing and he had a deal to scan uh-huh. so I spent a ton of time just scanning photos <laughs> you know what? And this is at her house during the period of time that they're married. <laughs> That's just not sounding familiar at all. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, you know what, I. That's just not sound. I, 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 again, if someone says that I was at her house and I had an incident with her, I, I, you know, I that just doesn't sound. I, 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 you know, was John there? Did John say this happened because, and other people were there? I, I, I just I don't recall. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just doesn't sound you know, familiar. And this is an incident where you showed up, you weren't supposed to show up, and things got heated. At his house? Yeah. <laughs> it, uh, I, you know, I, that just doesn't sound familiar. I mean, no, I no. I, you know, it's not sounding familiar. So not at all. Now you're saying not familiar because it's just something well, you remember or well, it's just... Well, you know what, I would ha- then I'd have to say I don't remember. Because I don't remember. I it, that doesn't sound familiar. I, 
I mean, would you, you remember know, something like that in your life? If well, I would think, some but... Some sort of drama involving, you know, the other woman type of thing. Well, sure. Did you ever uh, fight with her? You mean like we fought? Yeah. Did you ever yeah. duke it out with her? No, I don't think so. I mean... You'd remember that, right? That would be pretty... Yeah, I would think so. I pretty mean, specific. Th- you know, yeah, like I said, I mean, dramatic. obviously... Uh, I, you know, I mean, it just doesn't sound familiar. I mean, I mean, what are they saying? So I, I, I fought with her. So, so now I mean, I, 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 I'm get, getting the jump, the leap. Excuse me, I haven't eaten. Um, they're saying, okay, I fought with her, so I must have killed her. I mean, come on. I mean, that's, you know, I, I don't even know who these people are. I, I can't even say I met any of these people. I mean, that's it's insane. I, I, if it happened, I honestly don't remember it. That's all I can tell you. I mean. I mean, but, I don't know, I mean, would it be something you would remember? I mean, because it's, I don't know if any other intense incidents in your life that have occurred, I mean, you'd recall those, right? I mean, well, like a use of force at work or a car crash, something you're involved in, you'd be like, yeah, I remember. You would think I would remember. I mean, I would think if it was something that crazy, I mean, I, I can't say, you say, how many fights have you gotten into, you know, yeah. in your life? You know, I mean, a few at work. Well, um, fights at work are kind of know, different because we've all had uses of force or whatever. But well, I, mean, I haven't it, even had even a lot of those. I mean, right, but you know, if you're if you're actually, you know, I mean, I played like if if Dan and I got mad at each other and we threw blows in the squad room. I mean, twenty years later, I, I would remember it. I mean, I would it think would be I pretty, would remember it. But unique. that's that's what I'm saying. That's not sounding familiar to me at all. I mean, I, I, let me ask you. I mean, throughout your life, you know. Would you remember the number of fights you've been involved in? And I don't mean kind of like a bump or something, just a, a physical fight where you everybody's hitting each other, scratching, pulling, you know, whatever. Maybe. I mean, I can't say I've been in a lot. You know, I played sports. Yeah. You know, you get into scuffles there, and. Mm-hmm. Um, and you recall some of those, right? I mean, just. Yeah, I can recall games. some of them. Game, game, yeah, games get intense. Yeah, but like I said, this you saying this. This is just not ringing a bell. Nothing. I mean, but you know, I, I don't know what to tell you. It's it's just that's just not ringing a bell to me. It'd be something. I would think I would remember. Yeah. I mean, I'm. Uh, if you're in this, I would <coughs> think so too. If you're in this other girl's house and but words are exchanged, I mean, you figure you recall. I would think. Especially if it got physical, right? Well, I would think. And it's relating to, you know, a guy that. You were dating, and well, but she's dating now, you know, and it's just yeah. kind of like a whole love triangle type of thing. I mean, you figure you remember that, right? Well, I would think. So. I mean, I don't want to still tell you. Yeah. No, because I'm, I mean, I'm trying to, I'm looking at the notes, and these people are kind of, I mean, they're pointing the finger at you. <laughs> well, and I mean, that's not ringing a bell to me, so, uh-huh. you know. I don't know, you know, it's, uh, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, that just sounds crazy to me. Yeah, so you, offhand, you don't recall ever going into her house and having words and physically, you know. No. Attacking I mean, her, her attacking you. No. Nothing like that? No, I mean, that's, no. Nothing? No. No. Not at all. Okay. Well, on some of the, uh, on this case, you know, this is it occurred in '86, right? Uh, detectives processed the scene, things of that nature. Uh, they, they did fingerprints and all that stuff. You know, the, well, you know the standard mm-hmm. stuff. I mean, you've been doing this longer than I have. Uh, well, I'm not about that. <laughs> <laughs> I got 26 years on, yeah. going on 26. 19, so. <laughs> but you know, as they processed everything, uh, they did the best they could at that time, and they looked at a lot of a lot of people and different things in this case. And you're right. I mean, if you guys are claiming that I'm a suspect, then, you know, I, I got a problem with, you know, with that. Okay. Okay? So, you know, if you're if you're doing this as an interrogation, <coughs> you're saying, hey, I'm a suspect. Well, I, now I got a problem with, you know, now you're accusing me of this? Is that what you're, is that what you're saying? We're trying to figure out what happened, Stephanie. Uh, well, I'm, I was, you know, I'm just saying... <coughs> The, you know, do I need to get a lawyer if you're I accusing me of I this? I mean, 
you know. You, you don't have to. I mean, you know, I'm you're just, here of your own free will. I mean, no, you, you well, I, I know, but I mean, I mean you know you're, not, you're not under arrest. You can walk out. You can leave you whenever you like. Well, but you know, I, I, I'm trying <coughs> to give you some background of you know how I knew him, and now you're telling me that some somebody's saying that we had this big old fight, and I don't even know what you're talking about. Um, you know, and I don't want to you know get in trouble for something that I didn't even do, or you're saying I did something. Okay. Yeah, we understand. I mean, how would you guys like it if the tables were turned on you? I understand. No. Um, no, that's what we're telling you. I mean, you're free to go whenever you want. If if this makes you uncomfortable and you want to, well, you now you're starting to make me uncomfortable. The thing is, I mean, detectives did what they could at that time on the crime scene. Okay, and the burglary thing you're talking about—that is an angle that they looked at. Angle, but now we're looking at everything else on the case because nobody was ever arrested <laughs> on the case. I, I don't know that, or not. Okay. Now what we'd like to do is. Obviously, you know about all the DNA stuff and things of the nature that you know gets done on cases nowadays. You know, if we asked you for a, a DNA swab, would you be willing to give us one? Maybe, because <laughs> now, 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 yeah, because now, now I'm thinking I probably need to talk to a lawyer. Okay. I mean, well, I because I know how this stuff works. Okay, don't get me wrong. You're right. I have been doing this a long time. Yeah. And and I wish I had been recording this because because now it sounds like you know there's. You know, you're selling these people, say I'm a fighting with her, and now it sounds like you're trying to, you know, I've been doing this a long time. Yeah, we know. Okay, and it, and now it almost sounds like you're trying to pin something on me. No, now I, I got that sense. Well, what it gets to on these on these cases, and you know it as well as I do, our job is to identify and eliminate suspects. I can't believe this. So if we ask you to a point to give us a DNA sample, a buccal swab, so we can identify or eliminate you, would you be willing to do that? Maybe. Because I know this, I, 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 I well, That's where we're at, too. I mean, because right now, from looking at the evidence, it's, you know, it's possible we may have some DNA at the location. That's great. And we're going to do what we can to try to put this thing together. And your name's in the book. These people are pointing at you for whatever reason. <laughs> I don't know why. And that's just crazy. I mean, that's just, that's absolutely crazy. And... It would be irresponsible on our part not to look at it. I know. You guys have to do your job, and, and I guess I'm going to have to contact somebody. So That's fair. I mean, because I, I know how this stuff works. Sure. I mean, I, 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 I just can't believe it. That's I, I mean, we, we understand that. I mean, if we were in your position, I mean, we would feel the same way. I, I just can't even believe it. I mean, it's just, I, I mean, I'm shocked. I'm really shocked. That somebody would be blame saying that I did this. I mean, we had a fight, and so I went and killed her. I mean, come on. Well, that's okay. All right. Well, thanks for giving me the courtesy. I wish I could take the Thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you. All right, Stephanie, take care. All right. Hey, Stephanie. Hey, Stephanie. Hey, Stephanie. This is absolutely crazy. Let me see, Stephanie. This is insane. Okay. Okay, Stephanie, you know you have the right to remain silent. Do you understand? Yes. Anything you say may be used against you in court. Do you understand? Yes. You have the right to the presence of an attorney before and during any questioning. Do you understand? Yes. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed for you free of charge before any questioning if you want. Do you understand? Yes. Do you want to talk to us right now? No. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. This then. is crazy. Okay. This is absolutely... I'm like, I'm like in shock. I'm totally in shock. After the investigation, Lazarus was arrested. At the time of her arrest, her home, car, and office were searched. Police located her journals from the mid-1980s, and in the journal, she detailed her feelings of John's engagement to Sherry and her depression. Her home computer showed she continued to do internet searches on John Rutten on several occasions during the 1990s. As the investigation progressed, co-workers began coming forward detailing Lazarus's erratic behavior in the workplace. Her nickname was Spazarus, but all seemed shocked that she was capable of murder. Lazarus's ongoing cases were dropped. Prosecutors didn't feel that they could get a conviction when the lead detective was being arrested for murder. 
She was allowed early retirement from the LA Police Department, and she was held in the Los Angeles County Jail for six months before her sentencing hearing, to which the judge set a $10 million bail for fear that Lazarus may flee the country or harm herself. Her trial began in 2012, and the story made for a large media spectacle. For this case, there wasn't a lot of evidence. The main pieces were the testimony that Lazarus had stalked Sherry, for which her lawyer denied, the DNA evidence which her lawyer argued had been mishandled, and the journals. However, the jury decided to convict Lazarus of first-degree murder. She was sentenced to 27 years in prison, and she will be eligible for parole when she is 79 years old. The whole trial is available on YouTube to watch. During the trial, it was revealed that Rutan and Lazarus had kept in touch in the years following Sherry's murder, even vacationing in Hawaii together. Rutan broke down several times on the stand and described his time with Lazarus as a mistake. After Lazarus' conviction, Nails Rasmussen and his wife filed a civil lawsuit against the city. They alleged that the LA Police Department actively protected Lazarus. And the fact that Lazarus was able to have access to the evidence throughout the years was wildly inappropriate. A lot of evidence that had originally been in the file was missing forever, with only one DNA sample left remaining. Their suit was eventually dropped in the courts, and when they appealed, a judge ruled that they would have needed to have filed the suit on or before the year 2000. The California Supreme Court declined to hear the case in 2013. And Jennifer Butterworth, now Jennifer Francis, also filed a civil suit alleging negligence in the department, accusing the department of purposely destroying evidence. She also alleged that because she kept digging into the Rasmussen file, she suffered retaliation in the workplace from her supervisors until she agreed to drop it. The retaliation allegedly continued after Lazarus's conviction because she had cooperated with the detectives. However, there was no evidence to corroborate her statements and the judge ruled for the city in 2019. Lazarus's lawyers filed an appeal in 2013 and it unanimously upheld her conviction. Any updates to this case and I will do a follow-up, however it seems that there will only be appeals, which would be a miracle for Lazarus if she won. The investigation into the corruption and cover-ups is still ongoing in the LA Police Department, but unless more whistleblowers come forward, that also seems unlikely. The FBI hopes this latest video will stir new leads in the murder of 18-year-old Samantha Koenig. Authorities say this surveillance video from Alaska shows Keyes abducting Koenig from her job at a coffee stand in Anchorage on February 1st. Good afternoon and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you're new to the channel, hello and welcome, and if you're returning, welcome back. As normal, this is going to be a multi-part series, and videos will come out as soon as possible. If you could hit the like button and comment down below, that would be greatly appreciated as the engagement helps to my content get distributed further. And of course, if you're new here, please subscribe and hit the little bell icon so you never miss an upload because I'm bad at keeping a schedule. Today, we will be doing another serial killer deep dive, and this time we are discussing Israel Keys. Let's get into it. Didn't sleep much last night. <laughs> no, not that. <laughs> These are good work, apparently. I had muscles sore this morning. I didn't even know I had. Really? <laughs> Where's the muscles? Jeez, that's a good thing you didn't get a full on. This reminds me of like those uh, late night infomercials where you just sell those machines that shock your abs and stuff. Oh. <laughs> it's like that. On you grabbed one and you bought one of them. No, I can't really. Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> I tried it once. Just for a little bit. Can you get ripped from it? No. A little bit, so uh, you weren't too taken with the uh, machine, basically? No, all no. oh, the ab? 
yeah. shocker things, and all those things are like freaking fingernail on a shocker. Israel Keyes could be the most heinous serial killer in the United States. What we know about him is very limited, and until his arrest, he barely existed on paper. No one had any idea who Israel Keyes was. He was a killer that had no preferred victim type, no consistent method of attack. He had military training and knew how to evade detection from the police. He drove for miles and miles with potential victims in Canada, the U.S., and abroad. He drew inspiration from Ted Bundy and called Dennis Rader a wimp for expressing remorse for his victims. Many of his victims' bodies were never recovered, and he made the mistake of confessing to two. He allegedly went to Mexico to modify his body to be better at killing. Had it not been a few mistakes, he could have gone on for decades without being caught. Part 1. The Disappearance of Samantha Koenig February 2, 2012, in Anchorage, Alaska, a young barista opened up the Common Grounds coffee stand. When she arrived at work, she immediately noticed something wasn't right. The stand had been left unlocked, none of the closing duties had been done, and the cash register had been left open without any cash in it. She checked who had been in last and was surprised to learn it had been Samantha Koenig, an 18-year-old hire that had been a great employee so far. Samantha was still new, but she'd been working at the kiosk for less than a month and had always done thorough closes. She called her boss and told her about her concern. Her boss said that she would take care of it and open up the kiosk as usual. Her boss called Anchorage police and requested an officer to look into things. At that point, it did appear that Samantha had made off with the previous day's cash and disappeared. The kiosk had a panic button inside and it hadn't been pressed, and the kiosk didn't look like there were any signs of distress. Officers began an investigation, which initially wasn't taken very seriously. They interviewed her father, James Koenig, who had talked to Samantha the previous evening. She had asked him to bring her dinner. Then they spoke to Samantha's boyfriend, Dwayne. He said that the couple had been fighting. He said that Samantha had accused him of cheating and told him that she was going to a friend's house to cool off. James had attempted to find Samantha that evening. She didn't have her truck with her. Her boyfriend had it. When her boyfriend had gone to pick Samantha up when her shift ended at around 8.30 p.m., he had noticed that the kiosk was dark and it appeared empty. He said that he got out and looked in the window and saw that Samantha wasn't there. The tone of the investigation began to shift when the owner of the kiosk gave officers surveillance footage from the night before. It showed Samantha at 8 o'clock, calm, chatting with a customer through the window and making a beverage. The footage didn't have audio, and the customer was out of the camera's range. Something shifted when Samantha abruptly turned the lights off. That was when officers knew this wasn't a teenager that had gone off to blow off some steam. She had been kidnapped.
An abduction seemed so absurd. The kiosk was next to a popular gym, as well as a well-traveled road. The abductor had been bold. He also hadn't seemed to be in a rush, having been at the kiosk for over 17 minutes. He'd also been able to keep Samantha calm. She hadn't appeared scared until he began to lead her out of the building. Surveillance from a next-door building gave officers another angle. It showed a man forcing Samantha into a white Chevrolet pickup truck. From both cameras, officers could tell that the man was very tall. He wore a ski mask and a black jacket. Because Samantha had remained so calm, officers had been inclined to believe that she had known the abductor. He might have been someone she trusted, as she had seemingly left without so much as calling for help. Her father James hounded local police to investigate this as a kidnapping. James was a trucker by trade and was known to have a shady past. He raised Samantha as a single parent and he loved his daughter fiercely. He was not willing to let his missing daughter fall between the cracks of police bureaucracy. He arranged for a candlelit vigil, assembled a group of volunteers to put posters up, and he took donations and established a reward fund. He felt responsible. Had he brought Samantha dinner that night when she'd asked, he would have been at the kiosk at 11 p.m., he had been horrified to learn that he was one of the primary suspects, as well as her boyfriend, Dwayne. The only thing James could do was rile up the might of Alaska and keep the case in the public eye and to put pressure on officers to continue investigating. He helped to bring the case to national attention. Samantha was a senior in high school. She was kind and well-liked by her classmates. She was responsible, worked hard, and rose above them despite having troubles in life and was succeeding. She had wanted to work with animals or become a nurse. She was described as being someone who looked out for others, making sure they had enough and were included. Duane had seen something the night that Samantha had gone missing. He had received a text from her at 11.30 p.m. saying that she would be spending the night at a friend's house. Then he said something odd had happened. At 3 a.m. he felt a need to go outside to the front of the house where they parked their vehicles, and there was a man going through Samantha's truck. The men stood and looked at each other for a moment, and then the strange man walked away. He and James searched the vehicle and noticed the only thing missing was Samantha's driver's license that she kept in the top visor pocket. When asked why they hadn't called police, he said that he and James believed that the officers wouldn't file a missing person report for at least 24 hours after Samantha had disappeared. There was no physical evidence in the case. The crime scene had been contaminated when it wasn't contained initially. They had no indication that Samantha had left the state. There was no record of her on any ships, planes, or have crossed the border. By February 17th, Samantha had been missing for nearly three weeks when her father got a text message from her phone. The text said, Connor Park sign under the pick of Albert. Ain't she purdy? Officers suited up. They had no idea what they would find at the park. Connor Park was less than five miles from downtown Anchorage, and they're pinned to a bulletin board was a Ziploc bag containing a photo of Samantha and a ransom note. The photograph was a sign of life. In the photo was Samantha with a man's hand holding a recent newspaper. The picture was shown to James, and the first thing he noticed was that Samantha's hair was braided, and she never styled her hair like that. Along with the photo was a ransom note. It had been typed on plain white paper and demanded $30,000. The note said that if the demand was met, Samantha would be released in six months. The note contained the numbers on Samantha's debit card and had instructions to deposit the money into the account. This gave officers and the FBI investigators a way to potentially capture the kidnapper if he used the debit card to take the money out. At the FBI's request, James deposited $5,000 from the reward money fund into the account. The FBI thought it would be best not to put the entire demand, hoping that it would frustrate the kidnapper and force him to reach out again. Four hours after the ransom money was deposited, someone tried to withdraw $600 from an ATM in Anchorage. Then the person began to go from ATM to ATM to withdraw the maximum daily amount, totaling more than $1,000 on the first night. It took several days for the images from the ATM machines to come back from FBI experts, and the experts determined that the man had an athletic frame. He was wearing a dark hoodie with white paint splattered on the front. Another key piece of information was that the expert believed that the suspect was likely a Marine based on a logo on one of his hoodies. 
Samantha had been missing for a month by the time the officers and the FBI had a vague description of the suspect and had been able to confirm that they were still in Anchorage. However, on March 7th, they got an unexpected call. The debit card had been used to withdraw $400 in Wilcox, Arizona. The kidnapper had left the state. An hour later, there was another withdrawal on the debit card, this time in Lordsburg, New Mexico. Again, he attempted to withdraw more than the daily limit. Then at the same ATM, the suspect used the debit card again, this time to check the balance in the account, $3,598.91. He withdrew another $80 to get as close as he could to the daily $500 limit. The kidnapper had used a smaller bank chain, one that didn't use a sophisticated surveillance system. It took the FBI two days to get images, which confirmed it was likely the same suspect that had made the withdrawals in Anchorage. A tall, Caucasian man wearing bulky, excessive layers in an attempt to hide his frame. He wore a hat, sunglasses, and a face mask with jeans and white tennis shoes. Officers were concerned that the suspect had left Alaska. It didn't bode well for Samantha. Officers were unsure if she was with him or if she was still in Alaska. Were there more than one kidnapper? Did they take her across the border? And why were they still risking capture by using her debit card? Local police, all FBI offices in the area, and Texas Rangers were all distributed a be on the lookout bolo flyer with Samantha's picture and the blurry image from the suspect from the ATMs, and the car that could be seen in the back of the ATM photos, likely a rental. The Texas Rangers are a state police agency famous for tracking down Bonnie and Clyde. They specialize in criminal and special investigations such as apprehending wanted felons, suppressing significant disturbances, and assisting smaller local law enforcement agencies. They didn't have a lot to go on. They were looking for a white male driving a white rental car from Alaska and in possession of a debit card from a missing girl. He seemed to be traveling eastbound on the I-10 highway. The card had been used most recently on March 12th in Shepard, Texas. It had been used at 2.47 a.m., and the FBI were able to determine, based on the shape of the windshield, that the suspect was driving an older model white Ford Focus. Bolo flyers were distributed to Texas Highway Patrol officers, and there was another ATM withdrawal in Humboldt, Texas. And on March 13th, Texas Rangers Stephen Rayburn was patrolling local hotel and motel parking lots when around 11 a.m. he spotted a white rental outside of a Quality Inn in Lufkin, Texas. They decided to send an officer to stake out the vehicle and get a look at the driver. By 11.30, the ranger saw a tall white male begin to pack the Ford Focus and get into it. By now, the Anchorage PD and the FBI were all patched in and waiting on law enforcement in Texas to keep them updated. The suspect exceeded the local speed limit by 2 kilometers per hour and allowed the officer to pull the driver over. The suspect calmly pulled over and stopped in a cafe parking lot. The officer asked for his license and registration and was shocked when he handed over an Alaskan driver's license. The name on the license was Israel Keys. Backup was called and the Texas Highway Patrol officer Brian Henry joined Rayburn. Keys was in his mid-30s. He was wearing wraparound sunglasses and a white tank top with jeans. Without being asked, Keys told Rayburn that he was in town for his sister's wedding and was sharing a room with his brother. Keyes asked why he was pulled over and was told that they were looking into a kidnapping that had occurred in Alaska. The officer ran his license number and noted his address was listed in Anchorage. He also stated that Keyes had no criminal record, no warrants, or even a speeding ticket. The officers indicated that Keyes was beginning to display nervous physical cues. He was also rambling and offering up information about his recent whereabouts unsolicited. Keyes was asked when he arrived in Texas and how he got there. He said he came in on Thursday and said that he'd flown from Anchorage to Las Vegas and had driven from there to Texas. He mentioned his daughter and officers asked where she was. They had noted clothing in the car that looked like it belonged to a little girl. He said that she was with his brother in Wells, Texas. Officers asked to search Keyes' wallet and car and his demeanor changed to aggravated. From what officers could see from outside the car, there were white sneakers matching what the suspect had been wearing in the ATM surveillance, as well as several paper maps and rolls of cash in the passenger side door with red dye on it. Keyes was no longer cooperating with officers, and they had to make the decision to arrest him or let him go. 
Texas has looser probable cause laws. If an officer suspects that a vehicle has been used in connection with the crime, it's up to the officer's discretion to search it. However, they also had to take into consideration Alaskan law as any trial would take place there, and they couldn't risk having potential key evidence being dismissed in an unlawful search. Officers in Alaska decided to allow the search. Israel Keyes was arrested, which gave Texas officers authority to search for what they wanted. They were looking for Samantha's debit card, and upon opening Keyes' wallet, they found the card with the pin etched into the plastic on the card. At this point, there were five officers on the scene and one was documenting the car's contents. They located several hoodies and jackets in the trunk, as well as a face mask similar to the one seen in the ATM image, gloves, a cell phone with the battery and SIMS card removed, a gun, and a black ski mask. They got him. He was arrested in Texas in March after withdrawing money from Koenig's bank account, ending his cross-country killing spree. Uh, we're going to jump here, and the first thing i got to tell you is we're going to talk about a little bit... Uh, uh, earlier, that that stunt yesterday in the courtroom did not go over well. Um, with those, well, with a lot of folks, not the least of which were the uh, were the prosecutors. And that was the delay actually getting in here. Is we knew you had some legal questions, and so we reached out for him to say, "Hey, uh, Israel says he's got some questions. Are you guys available to speak to him?" And, uh, <laughs> uh, I could, I couldn't even get one. One of them was in court, and the other one said, "You know, basically." What the fuck? <laughs> after yesterday, so uh, they they didn't think that was too funny. Um, so and why are they afraid I'd actually get away? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that would be embarrassing for them, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's. Uh... Israel Keyes didn't have a criminal record, which was surprising. Usually, perpetrators of this magnitude had a lengthy criminal history that showed an escalation in criminal activity. Keyes barely existed on paper. Much of what we know about Keyes is from his own interrogations, his interviews with his mother, and journals recovered from his home. Keyes had all the markers of a psychopath, and he understood from a young age that he wasn't like everyone else, and had to hide his true nature to blend in with his peers. They know they're going to tell you something that does not line up with anything I tell you because I'm two different people, basically. And the only person who knows about what I'm telling you, the kind of things I'm telling you, is me. Okay. How long have you been two different people? <laughs> long time. Fourteen years. It was important for the FBI to learn as much as they could about Israel Keys. Like many other serial killers, they wanted to understand the key influences in his life that led him to become such a dangerous man. Asking the question asked for decades, are serial killers born or are they made the way they are? Keyes was born on January 7th in 1978 in Cove, Utah. He was the second of 10 children of his parents, Heidi and John Jeffrey, who went by Jeff, Keyes. His parents had met as teenagers in Los Angeles, California, and were fervently anti-government. His parents were both societal misfits and could never seem to find where they belonged. They had both been raised Mormons and had deeply instilled religious beliefs. They were married when Heidi was 21 and Jeff was 22. They wanted to raise their children in nature. They moved to Utah, where they had their first child at home birth. Heidi would give birth to all of her children without any assistance from hospitals. Neither she nor her husband believed in modern medicine. They also didn't want the government to interfere with their lives, and there was too much paperwork with hospitals, birth certificates, immunizations, social security numbers, medical records, were not something Jeff wanted his family involved with. While in Utah, they were visited by government officials who had concerns about the children. They packed up and moved to Colville, Washington, where they purchased 160 acres of rural property. Israel, along with all his siblings, were homeschooled in a one-bedroom cabin. They grew up without heat, running water, or electricity for most of their childhood. Jeff worked in the area as a handyman, appliance repair technician, and also did construction. Heidi stayed home with the children. On the Colville property, Jeff was slowly constructing a permanent home for the family by himself. 
mainly using resources found on the land. Heidi recalled her husband's religious beliefs to be extreme. Their children were raised with no interference from the outside world, not even a radio. They also had few friends and only interacted with other children within their church. Eventually, they left their Mormon church and instead became fundamentalist Christians. Their new church, the Ark, had extreme white supremacist ideologies, which Keyes himself recognized as impacting his formative years. Though he knew from a young age, he didn't have the same religious beliefs as his parents. The Keyes children grew up in extreme poverty. Israel had physical deformities in his toes from wearing shoes that were too small for his feet for many years. They ate what was grown and hunted on the property, and their injuries were treated at home, no matter how serious. Israel was the oldest son, and when Jeff wasn't home, he was the man of the house. He often was responsible for his younger siblings, more than both of his parents. The Keys believed their way of life made them superior to others. They didn't rely on technology, capitalism, or anyone else to help raise their family. They were proof that the old way of life worked, and they had ten healthy children to attest to it. But it wasn't a perfect life. In winter, Heidi would take the children to her aunt's house in Palm Springs to keep them warm. In their new church, Israel was exposed to guns and took a keen interest. He became interested in learning everything he could about how they worked, which ones were banned, and how to acquire prohibited weapons. In his teens, he began breaking into homes and stealing guns. He would then resell them as a way of making money. Israel also said that occasionally he would break into a home and just move things around, then wait in the woods to watch the homeowners come home and freak out. He described this as an entertaining activity. At 14, he started to get bored with breaking into homes and escalated to torturing animals. This was also when he began to hide his sadistic behaviors, as he discovered that his friends were appalled by this behavior. His friends had told their parents, who in turn told Israel's parents, and he didn't like that. When talking about his past, Keyes stopped being forthcoming with his escalating violent behavior. When asked directly if he hurt anyone during his childhood, he deflected indicating that he likely had sexual or physical assault victims beginning as early as childhood. When he was 15, he started the construction of his own cabin a mile away from the family's construction, and when he finished a year later, he moved into it. Israel also at this time started working on a construction company with other members of the Ark. Once Israel began living alone, separated from his family, he became obsessed with hunting. Through hunting, he honed his patience and learned to stay still for hours at a time. He also honed in on tracking and relying on all his senses to become a stealthy predator. When I was smart, I would let them come to me. This remote area. Come go to a remote area that's not anywhere near where you live, but that other people go to as well. He said that while he was practicing his stealth and camouflage, he would stumble upon people on these hunting trips, hikers, other hunters, or just people on their properties, and he would try to get as close as possible without them noticing. He would visualize killing and hiding their bodies. When he was as young as 13, he knew he had urges to kill. He was caught shoplifting when he was 16, and his parents searched his cabin and found a cache of stolen weapons. They forced him back into the family home, where he could be kept close. Heidi said that she could see that he was separating himself from the church and was more defiant at home. He was rebelling against Jeff and the constraints he imposed on the family. When Israel told his parents that he didn't believe in God or organize religion, Jeff exploded. He disowned Israel and kicked him out. Though Heidi didn't share the same sentiments as her husband, and she kept in contact with Israel, she loved her son no matter what he believed in. In 1996, Jeff decided to move the family to Oregon. Israel had been reluctant to join the family, but did in order to help support his mother and his siblings. In Oregon, he helped his father build houses to sell. In 1997, Jeff again picked up the family for reasons unknown and relocated them to Smyrna, Maine. There, they joined an Amish community. Jeff purchased a property in Malone, New York, and signed the deed over to Israel. Israel didn't live with the family while they lived with the Amish. He didn't believe in the Amish lifestyle and felt it was silly. 
He had enough with living off-grid and being dragged from one extreme religion to the next. Israel had been forced to leave behind a girlfriend back in Colville and expressed deep regret and heartbreak for leaving her. In his journals, he had mixed feelings about leaving his family, but ultimately decided he wanted to live his own life. Israel got his GED and in 1996, at 20 years old, he enlisted in the military. What was most odd about his enlistment was that Keyes didn't have a birth certificate or social security number. Technically, he didn't exist on paper, according to the US government. He had told people he had grown up Amish as an easier way of explaining why he didn't understand sports references or pop culture, or many things that normal people experienced. Keyes himself admitted that he enjoyed his life in the military. The structure and organization were a welcome change from his chaotic childhood, and he said he was a good soldier. He was an infantryman stationed at Fort Hood in Texas. While in the army, he began to experiment with drugs and alcohol. He would use cocaine heavily and go on weekend long benders, but always be able to sober up in time for duty, and only a few knew the extent of his substance abuse. He admitted to blacking out several times, but had learned to control and keep his growing alcoholism in check around his family. In the army, he had continued a long distance relationship with his girlfriend back in Colville but had also been dating a woman near the base in Washington. He had been engaged to the Colville girl at one point, but she could tell things had changed in their relationship. Eventually, he called off their wedding and said he had been seeing someone at the base. The woman's name was Tammy. She was 10 years older than Israel, and it started as a casual relationship until Tammy got pregnant. He was arrested and charged with a DOI by the military police and honorably discharged in 2001. When he left the army, he settled down in Nia Bay, Washington with Tammy. Tammy and Keyes got along well. They both had traumatic childhoods and bonded over their unusual upbringing. Tammy was half indigenous and half African American and lived on the Macaw Reservation where Keyes moved in with her. Keyes liked that Tammy didn't give him a hard time. She never questioned when he came home late or talked to other women. In Nia Bay, he would go on trips for days or weeks at a time. He was hired as a parks and recreation worker on the reservation, and when his daughter was born, he was a devoted father. He loved children, having helped raise most of his younger siblings, and he was an excellent caregiver. Tammy also had an eight-year-old son from a previous relationship, and Keyes took over as a parental figure when he moved in with Tammy. Two weeks after his daughter's birth, Israel's father died. He left to attend the funeral in Maine and was gone for over a week. During that time, Tammy had little communication with him. There were no records of a funeral for Jeff Keyes. There was also no death certificate or any record at any funeral home or cemetery. Investigators learned that while the family had been relocating again, Jeff had gotten very ill due to an ongoing thyroid condition that had never been treated and he died somewhere along that trip. Tammy noted that in their time together, she couldn't remember a time when Israel went into detail about his childhood experiences. They were always broad and vague. He also said that when he drank, he sometimes would say things that didn't make sense to her. Once he said he was a bad person and that she didn't know him, and he had a black heart. She brushed it off as leftover trauma from his childhood. It was also during that time that he had an upside down cross branded on his chest and got a pentagram tattooed on the back of his neck. She felt that he was rebelling against his religious upbringing and didn't think much about it at the time. In 2003, the couple separated and they shared custody of their daughter. Israel went on to date several women until he met Kimberly while she was working as a nurse in Port Angeles. And when Keyes was 29, he moved to Anchorage with Kimberly and he shared custody of his daughter with Tammy. In 2007, he also started his construction business in Alaska. In his relationship with Kimberly, he began taking long trips alone. He would fly into a state, rent a car, and put thousands of miles on the rental. He also started taking trips down to Tijuana, where he would get unknown medical procedures. One of those procedures was a nose job, and he also had dental work done, as can be seen in photographs. He simply wrote in his journals, medical procedure, but it was also speculated that he may have had Botox to reduce sweat and laser hair removal. Investigators noticed early on that he was extremely nervous about leaving DNA evidence behind on his victims, and it had been a point of pride that they never found any linking him to any crimes. 
What also shocked me was his travels to Victoria, British Columbia. He was here on April 22, 2006 for an overnight trip where he also rented a boat. There were no missing person cases during the time that Keyes was in town, but he traveled to Canada fairly often. Keyes generally traveled paying with cash when he could. He would also take the battery and SIM card out of his phones, though there were still border crossings, hotel reservations, and car rentals where he needed to give credit card information, though sometimes those bookings would be under Kimberly's card. The FBI releases interviews and a timeline of events of confessed serial killer Israel Keyes in hopes of identifying his homicide victims. I'm Molly Halpern of the Bureau, and this is Wanted by the FBI. Investigators say Israel Keyes, who took his own life in jail, committed 11 homicides across the country between 2001 and 2012. Case agent Jolene Godin says investigators have identified three victims. It's really important to us to be able to bring some type of closure to family members that are still wondering what happened to their loved ones. Keyes also admitted to multiple kidnappings, bank robberies, home invasions, and arsons. He told investigators he buried caches of money, tools, and weapons across the country to help him commit his crimes. Our primary concern is identifying additional homicide victims, but we're certainly also interested in identifying other crimes that he committed because it will help us put him in a particular place in the country. He's told FBI agents he related the most with convicted serial killer Ted Bundy. He didn't really have remorse. He didn't have empathy. Visit FBI.gov for details of Key's travels and interviews. Report tips to 1-800-CALL-FBI. That is where we are going to end this part. In the next one, we're going to go over his arrest, interrogation, and confessions. As always, please give this video a thumbs up if you like the content and subscribe for more if you haven't already. If you've done all that and want to support me and the channel, we have channel membership as well as Patreon to get early access, members-only content, and more. We also have merch and other goodies in the description box and links to all my socials. But until then, I will see you all in the next one. Bye for now. Upon Israel's arrest, he initially was held in Texas until he was extradited back to Anchorage, a legal process that took two weeks. FBI agents took over the investigation, which initially had the primary focus of locating Samantha Koenig, who at this point had been missing for over two months. While Israel was still in Texas, the FBI raided and tore through the house he shared with his girlfriend, Kimberly. They seized electronic devices, Key's vehicle, journals, and search for any clues of Samantha. Kimberly was initially uncooperative with officers, believing Keyes was innocent. After his arrest, his mother and Tammy were both interviewed, and officers were intrigued that neither of those women were surprised or shocked by the allegations. They were both fully cooperative with law enforcement. His mother, Heidi, revealed that while Israel had been in Texas, he was acting very odd. She said that he had been unusually emotional and agitated. She said that he had also visited her on February 13th, two weeks after Samantha's disappearance, and she said that that visit had also been odd. She said that he had snuck out in the middle of the night leaving a note in his room, gone to fix the window and find a place to hide my guns. Heidi had said that wasn't entirely unusual behavior, and at the time it made rational sense, Israel liked guns, and the windshield on his rental car had cracked on his drive up. He had left his daughter with Heidi and only answered messages sporadically, but had been gone for two nights. On the third day, he said that he was stranded in another town an hour away from where he had left. When they found him, he was disheveled, he and the car were covered in mud, and Israel was acting completely out of character. He was talking a mile a minute with a litany of excuses attempting to explain where he'd been for two days. He normally was calm, cool, and collected, but that wasn't what was happening now. They went back to Heidi's home, and again Israel disappeared several more times. No one asked Israel to explain any further, and he didn't provide any details of where he had been. Heidi mentioned that she'd noticed Israel had been drinking heavily, much more than she'd seen in years past. He was also willing to talk to her church's elders, which was also notable since he had taken such a strong stance of anti-religion in the past. Right before his flights back to Anchorage, he gave Heidi $900 in cash to pay her back. Then he and his daughter flew back to Alaska on the 18th. 
Once Keyes was back in Anchorage after his extradition, he told officers he wanted to talk. Keyes was realistic about his circumstances and told officers that if his demands were met, he was an open book. Initially, his demands were that the death penalty would be off the table and that he wanted what he was going to tell officers to stay out of the media. He didn't want his crimes to impact his family, particularly his young daughter. He didn't want his daughter to Google his name and have his crimes attached to him. Really big concern to me is, um, you know, my kid's going to be around. I don't want her to, like, type my name in the computer and have it pop up. At the time of his arrest, the FBI had very little to tie him to Samantha's disappearance. All they had was the fraudulent use of a credit card. Though in their first interview with Keyes, it was clear that he believed they had a lot more information on him and the FBI had to keep up that belief. They decided to go through the evidence in chronological order. They showed Keyes photos from the ATMs, clothing from the rentals that matched the photos, Samantha's debit card in his wallet as well as her cell phone, along with disturbing material on his computer's hard drive. They had also revealed that they had already interviewed Heidi and Tammy, threatening to release embarrassing details about his life to the press. In the first interview with Keyes, he opened up right away and began with the events on February 1st, when he kidnapped Samantha. He said that he had selected the Common Grounds coffee stand because it was open later than the other cafes, and he could see only one girl closing most nights. He had picked February 1st because there was a festival on the other side of town, and most police officers and residents would be there. He had observed the kiosk for several evenings to get a sense of the routine. Initially, he had only planned to rob the coffee stand. He said that he had never met or knew Samantha prior to abducting her. He had waited in his truck until it was close to closing before he went up to the kiosk. He noticed that the girl on shift didn't have a vehicle, as there wasn't one in the parking lot. He wore a ski mask as well as a police scanner in his ear and ordered a coffee. Samantha made the drink, an Americano, and handed it back to him. He made sure to examine the coffee stand carefully, confirming that she was alone. That was when he pulled out a gun and demanded her to hand over the money in the cash register. He directed her to turn the lights off, then told her to get the money from the cash register. Samantha had told him that her father was on the way to bring her dinner but slipped up, first saying he would be there in half an hour, then correcting to say he was on the way. At that moment, Keyes decided to kidnap Samantha. He said it hadn't been planned, and it was a spur-of-the-moment decision, based on the adrenaline rush from the robbery. Though it went against his rule, don't commit crimes where you live. He lifted himself into the kiosk window and told Samantha to get down. He warned her to not cause any trouble, and he told her he had an earpiece connected to a police scanner, so he would know if anything was to go down. He told her he was going to kidnap her for ransom, saying to her, I don't want to hurt you, but this twenty two is loaded with very quiet ammo. It will kill you, so don't make me do it. He bound her hands behind her, using zip ties. He closed and locked the kiosk windows, and took a stack of napkins and stuffed them in Samantha's mouth. He led Samantha out of the kiosk and towards his truck, but as Keyes hadn't planned on taking a victim or using his personal vehicle, he needed to clear the passenger's seat off. For hours, he drove her around in his truck. He said that he explained what was going to happen with the ransom. He said that he tried to keep her calm, and he was trying to act like a normal person, implying that he knew he wasn't a normal person, and he had likely done this before. At one point, he even had to return to the coffee stand to retrieve Samantha's car keys and phone so he could send a message to her boss and her boyfriend, Dwayne. Around 2 a.m., he brought her back to the shed in his backyard. His daughter and girlfriend were asleep in the house. He was leaving for a pre-planned trip later that morning. He knew he would need to get his daughter up in a couple hours, and he'd already ordered a cab to take him to the airport at 5 a.m. He went back to the shed and spoke to the now-tied Samantha and turned on a radio blasting heavy metal music. I'll make you comfortable, he told her. You just sit here, but I'm going to have this police scanner on me, so if I hear reports of screaming from this neighborhood or anything, any disturbance from over here, I'm going to be back here before the cops. He asked where her debit or credit card was. She said that she shared a bank account with her boyfriend and the debit card was in their truck. He got her home address 
and got back to the truck and then got back in his vehicle to retrieve it. That was when he had that encounter with Dwayne on the back porch, but he was able to get the card. He went back to the shed and got the pin from Samantha, which he carved into the card. With 5 a.m. quickly approaching, he sexually assaulted Samantha, strangled her, and then locked the shed up, showered, got changed. He then went back to the shed, rolled her body into a tarp, and hid her in a cupboard in the shed. He double-locked the shed, then he left for Alaska for his cruise. Investigators asked him, Was she alive when you left? Keyes said, That would seem like an obvious question. So she, so she was alive? Keyes then said, when I left, no. Keyes was asked if he was concerned about leaving Samantha's body in his shed while he went away. He said he wasn't concerned. He was confident that they would never be able to tie him to her abduction. He said that he'd been listening to the police scanners and based on what he heard, he knew that the Anchorage police were already facing dead ends. Keyes decided to make some additional demands before he gave investigators more information. He wanted them to stop questioning Kimberly, as he insisted she never had anything to do with his crimes. He also wanted officers to stop searching their home. He would give them what they needed, but the random searches needed to end, and they would need to get his permission to search. I don't want to hear about you questioning her again, Keyes told agents. There is no one who knows me, or who has ever known me, who knows anything about me, really. They're going to tell you something that does not line up with anything I tell you because I'm two different people, basically. And the only person who knows about the kind of things I'm telling you is me. How long have you been two different people? <laughs> long time. 14 years. Keyes said that he returned on February 18th. He said that he had continued to check the weather in Anchorage. When his daughter went to school on Monday, February 22nd, he began to dismantle the shed, working from the inside first. He was burning wood from the shed and working around the cupboard containing Samantha's body. He also burned his clothing and shoes he had worn, as well as her purse, keeping only the cell phone and debit card. Once he had made more space inside the shed, he got her body out of the cupboard to prepare for his next move. Samantha's body had been mostly unchanged at the time due to the cold preserving the body. He purchased a bunch of makeup and decided to try and take a photo to show proof of life for the ransom. The newspaper he had used was from February 13th, a day he chose specifically because it was a day when he wasn't in Anchorage. He applied the makeup, but wasn't enough to make her look lively. He used fishing line to sew her eyes open along with clear tape to make her look like she had life. He braided her hair and propped up her body and took a photo using a Polaroid camera. He then also admitted to defiling her body. The ransom note was typed up using a manual typewriter he got at the Goodwill, and he photocopied the Polaroid to make it an even lower quality photograph. He then placed a ransom note on the bulletin board and used Samantha's cell phone to send the text message. He said that he had decided on the $30,000 because that was how much had been raised by Samantha's father. When he sent the text using Samantha's phone, he said that he had parked nearby the ransom note and waited for officers to arrive. He watched agents, a CSI van, and officers investigate the scene. He watched them for a while before going home. Agents said that while Keyes had been retelling the events of Samantha's murder, Keyes would go into a trance-like state, reliving the events with guilt, shame, but also excitement. While in his trance, he went into detail and included his thought process behind his decisions. He seemed relieved to talk to someone about it, and the agents knew it was imperative to not act shocked or disgusted despite their feelings to the contrary. The more comfortable Keyes was, the more information could be gained with his trust. He revealed the location of Samantha's body. He had dismembered the body over the course of several days. He would pack out storage bins with parts and dump it into the Matanuska Lake, an hour away from Anchorage, using an ice fishing shed he had already built. He thought dumping the body over several trips would be unsuspicious, as it was common for ice fishers to bring a few things with them. He even recounted seeing other people at the lake. He said that he had struggled to use a chainsaw to cut a hole through the ice, and remembered another fisherman looking at him quizzically, 
wondering why he didn't ask to use his ice drill. He said that he weighed the remains, and once the body was completely disposed of, he dismantled the fishing shack and tried to hide as much evidence as possible, though he wasn't able to get rid of everything before he was called about his sister's wedding in Texas. Samantha's body was recovered by specialized divers on April 2nd, 2012, a tragic end to those who had hoped for a different ending. With Keyes' confession, the FBI now had evidence needed to charge Israel Keyes with the murder of Samantha Koenig. It also opened up the door for Keyes to talk about his other crimes, crimes that the FBI had no idea about. Though they had a hunch that Keyes had done this before, they had no evidence to connect him. It was now up to FBI officials to get as much information as possible out of Israel Keyes. Where we left off, Samantha Koenig's body had been recovered, and the interrogations with Keyes would continue. A few FBI agents had built a rapport with Keyes, and they continued to bluff that the FBI knew more than they did, with Keyes himself saying, I've got a lot more stories to tell. The FBI had to comb through years of cell phone records, multiple computer hard drives, travel records, and bank history going back several years attempting to piece together an account of his travels. Keyes' computer revealed hundreds of pictures, some of them attached to news articles, and most of them were missing persons, all of varying age, gender, race, from a variety of demographics. All or none could be potential victims, but the photos included a familiar face, Samantha Koenig. There were hundreds of photos. The FBI sifted through the photos, attempting to identify all of them. When Keyes was asked if he thought he was a serial killer, he said yes. While talking to the FBI, Keyes had implied several times that there were more victims. He used that as bargaining chips to get his demands met. And they did get met because the FBI needed him to admit or hint to some sort of crime. At one point, Keyes needed help firing his attorney. But he wouldn't say why, but it gave the FBI leverage. A victim in exchange for assistance navigating the process of representing himself. On April 6, 2012, Keyes set up a meeting for his confession, without a lawyer and representing himself. In that meeting, he made a new demand. He wanted to be given the death penalty, and he wanted it in one year. He revealed that he had wanted his lawyer fired because his lawyer was against the death penalty. I want an execution date. For you? Yes. I want this whole thing wrapped up and over with as soon as possible. Keyes did not want to spend the rest of his life in a max security federal detention center. He also wanted the media attention minimized. He said both reasons were for his daughter. He wanted her to live a life away from his crimes, and he wanted her to have a normal life really big concern to me is, um, you know, my kid's going to be around. I don't want her to, like, type my name in the computer and have it pop up. I want my kid to have a chance to grow up and not have all this hanging over her head. The FBI wasn't in a position to make those promises, but said that they would need another victim in order to get the ball rolling. Keyes agreed, though he said he would only confess to the crimes he knew that they could connect him to, either from DNA or from the contents of his computer. He asked to be brought a map of Vermont. In early June 2011, Keyes had flown from Anchorage to Chicago. He rented a vehicle and drove out east. He had flown out with the intention of murdering, though he didn't know who. He had pre-chosen the place, Essex, Vermont, as he had already buried a cache of weapons, tools, zip ties, Drano, and other items several years previous in an orange Home Depot bucket. He called it a kill kit and revealed he had several of them buried in remote areas around the country. He said it was for convenience. The caches made it easier to travel through airlines, and he thought it would make it harder to track. It was an elaborate system he had developed several years prior to his rest. On June 7th, Keyes arrived in Essex and booked a hotel. He had gotten a three-day fishing license and went fishing a few times. He said that he would drive around the different neighborhoods looking for a target. 
Keyes said, I decided I was going to look for a house with a couple in it. I was looking for a fairly easy way to get into the garage, and theirs was the first house I found that had all those things. It was after midnight when he found the house that he thought would be best. It was a single-story ranch-style home. He crept around their backyard, peering into their windows. He noted there was no sign of children or pets, and that the couple were likely older. I think I even had it pegged down just from looking at the outside because of the way they had their backyard set up. It just looked like an older couple that didn't have kids kind of house. The home belonged to retired couple Bill and Lorraine Courier. He staked out the home for hours, waiting in a wooded area. He had noticed a neighbor that kept coming in and out of his home, smoking. Keyes needed to wait until the man finally went to bed as he didn't want to have any witnesses. He wore all black, including a face mask and leather gloves, but he also had on a headlamp. He entered the home via a ventilation fan in the garage. Once he had access to the garage, he was able to enter the home by breaking a glass window pane in their door. He crept through the home undetected and confirmed there was a couple inside. He woke up Bill and Lorraine and zip-tied them. He said that they awoke dazed and confused and he barraged them with questions, asking for locations of their valuables, prescription drugs, weapons, and cash. He said that at one point, Lorraine had fought back, attempting to escape. He said that he became enraged by this. He didn't like that they weren't taking him seriously. He said that he was mad that they didn't understand who was in control in the situation. While he was searching the house, he noticed that Bill had a military insignia. He had realized that Bill had served in the same infantry unit he had served in, the 25th Infantry Division. He had exploited that information to manipulate Bill and keep him calm. He convinced the couple that he was only looking for drugs and money and wouldn't hurt them. Then he packed the couple into the backseat of their car and drove them to an abandoned house outside of Essex. At the house, he separated Bill and Lorraine. While trying to immobilize the couple in separate areas of the house, he lost control. Bill had gotten free of his bindings, and in a panic, Key shot Bill using a silenced handgun. Bill had fought to the very end. He tortured and sexually assaulted Lorraine before strangling her with a rope. Keyes had said that after the couple had been murdered, he poured Drano on their hands and faces and put their bodies in large industrial garbage bags. He then moved them to a corner of the basement and piled garbage, broken furniture, and wood on top. By the time Keyes was finished, the sun was already up and the morning commute had begun. Originally, he had planned on setting fire to the home, but it was too late. There was too much traffic and too much of a risk of the house not becoming fully engulfed before someone reported it, and then a fire investigation would reveal the bodies. Key said that he had rushed out of the house and left evidence behind, which had included the shells from his bullets, which was why he was certain the FBI would be able to connect him to the crimes. He felt that it might not be now, but they would eventually. The house the couriers had been murdered in was vacant and condemned to be demolished. Keyes had no idea at the time that he had confessed, but the house had been torn down with the bodies inside. The demolition company was none the wiser and all materials from the old home were disposed of at the local landfill. Despite an extensive search, the bodies of the couriers were never found. The couriers had been reported missing the following day. Their home had provided little evidence and their car was located abandoned in a strip mall parking lot. A witness had come forward having seen a white male with long brown hair driving the courier's car. Keyes hadn't been worried though as the sketch bore little resemblance to him. The FBI had noticed that Keyes was revealing an MO, similarities between the couriers and Samantha's murder abduction to a secondary location, restraining with rope, death by strangulation, sexual assault. He also planned his crimes around family events with tight timelines. By doing so, it gave him a strong alibi. It also gave him a reasonable explanation for his travels. Weddings, funerals, visiting his mother were easy to explain. He would be able to dismiss any questions about his complicated travel arrangements, by explaining it was cost-effective. 
In his confessions, Keyes revealed that he would rob banks during his travels, always smaller bank chains with less security. The robberies were more of a necessity, as he had racked up a lot of credit card debt and needed cash, but he admitted to enjoying the adrenaline rush. At the time of his arrest, it was already clear he had robbed at least one bank because of the marked cash in the car. He had revealed he was going too fast and a dye pack had exploded. He revealed that he had robbed that bank during the time that his mother had said he had gone missing. His computers revealed he spent a lot of time researching small towns, small towns that saw little crime and would have inexperienced law enforcement. He would note the towns on his maps and pre-planned places to rob while he was traveling. His computers also showed that Key spent a lot of time researching abandoned properties and remote churches. During his interrogations, he had been asked why he had looked at so many remote churches in Vermont, and he said he wanted to bring potential victims to a church for personal reasons, which investigators believed had a lot to do with his upbringing. Murdering and hiding bodies were no longer enough of a thrill for Keyes. He expressed a desire to have more media attention. He wanted infamy. Samantha's death had changed things for Keyes. His search history on his computer revealed that he read about it over and over and over. He even participated in online forum discussions and witnessed the pain firsthand that he had inflicted on the community. He had planned future crimes to have more media attention. He had spent hours planning how he wanted his future crimes to play out. He admitted he was arrested before he could enact his new methods, however he did try but he found it difficult to find victims in Texas. He said that people in Texas were more suspicious of outsiders and were less likely to take their personal safety for granted. He had been deterred from abducting a woman when he noticed she had a large dog with her. He did admit to setting a house on fire in Alito, Texas in order to cause a distraction so he could rob a bank during the time that he had been unaccounted for. In total, Key sat for more than 40 hours of interviews with the FBI over the eight months of his incarceration. During those interviews, he gave several clues to additional victims. He didn't give clues for free, though. He would exchange information for copies of the New York Times, access to the internet, cigars, Americanos, candy bars, and fast food. I can give you the rest of the story, like, you know, everything that happened. If I get a cigar. (laughs) We're going to go through some of those crimes he either alluded to or could potentially be linked based on interrogations and evidence found. The FBI believes his first murder victims were carried out when he was 18, when his family had moved from Colville, Washington, and there'd been about a month before Israel had joined them. Julie Marie Harris disappeared on March 3rd, 1996. She was 12 years old and was a Special Olympics athlete with two prosthetic feet. She vanished from Colville while waiting for a ride to church. Decades later, friends of Julie had been interviewed and one of those friends said that she remembered seeing Israel Keys. She said that she saw him having a conversation with Julie at the pool where she often swam. She said that Julie had given Keyes her address and phone number. Months after her disappearance, her prosthetics were found at the mouth of the Colville River, and her remains were found a year later. No forensic evidence was ever recovered in that case, and though Keyes said he wasn't involved, he admitted to knowing about the case and gave visual cues to investigators that indicated to them that there was more to the story. There was also another double murder in Colville around the same time. 12-year-old Cassie Emerson had been abducted on June 27, 1996. It was believed that she had been kidnapped from her trailer home, which had been destroyed by arson, and had also contained her deceased mother, Marlene Emerson. Cassie's body was discovered five miles away from her home in a wooded area near Logging Road. The similarities to Julie's murder tied the two crimes together, and it was believed they were committed by the same person. There were no other similar crimes in Colville or any area nearby after Israel moved from the area, and he had admitted to agents that the first time he committed arson, it was to a trailer home. 
The first crime that he admitted to was the sexual assault of a girl at the Deschutes River in Oregon in 1997 or 1998. At the time, he was living in the area in Maupin and was around 20 years old. He said that he'd been watching a group of teens floating down the river on inner tubes. He watched as one of the girls became separated from her friends. She was close to the shore, and he grabbed her and dragged her to an outhouse. He said that he had planned on killing her after he sexually assaulted her, but she kept talking to him, humanizing herself. And he said that he lost his nerve. That victim has never come forward, but FBI agents said it was her humanizing herself that had likely saved her life. She told him her name and just talked about anything and everything, trying to build a connection. She had also stayed calm during the entire thing, and Keyes had found that unsettling. He let her go, though he admitted it was one of his greatest regrets, as it plagued him for years. It was the only witness he had ever allowed to get away, and she'd seen his face. She was uh, talking to me and telling me, you know, saying, oh, you're a good-looking guy, why are you, you know, you don't have to do this. I probably would have even gone out with you and all this stuff. And things never got really violent like they could have if she had been fighting me or something. She was pretty smart. She was, I mean, because it worked, I didn't, I didn't, the main thing is I just lost my nerve right at the end. He claimed his time in the military had kept him busy. However, when he was discharged from the army, he started stalking and planning his next victim right away. He claimed to have committed at least four murders while he lived in Washington. The first was an unidentified couple in the early 2000s. He said he had murdered and buried their bodies somewhere in Washington, but he didn't disclose anything more than that. He had two additional murders in 2005 and 2006, though he wouldn't specify any further than that. They had been separate victims, and he revealed the location of where one of his victims could possibly be found, but relished that they would likely never find it. You guys know about Lake Crescent in Washington, right? I think that lake is about five to seven hundred feet deep. He had purchased a boat off of Tammy's ex-husband, and had used that boat to dispose of one or more of his victims. In 2006, Keyes' cell phone records had placed him in Washington, near where a high-profile murder had occurred near Pinnacle Lake on the Snohomish County Trail. A mother and daughter, Mary Cooper and Susanna Stodden, had been hiking when they were both shot and killed on the trail. Their murder has never been solved and remains a mystery. Though there is no physical evidence to link Keyes to the murder, it fit his M.O., and at the time of the murder, it was one of the times when Keyes' cell phone had been unable to track for several hours. Another one of Keyes' signatures. Over the years, he admitted to frequenting sex workers in the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. At his home in Anchorage, he had several phone numbers for people he liked to go out with. This was another trait he shared with several serial killers. Sex workers were potential victims. The vulnerabilities involved in their line of work make them a target for sexual sadists like Keys, often serving as practice knowing that missing person investigations were limited if they were even investigated at all. He said that he had another victim that he had abducted from the East Coast in 2009, then disposed of their body in upstate New York. Though Keyes himself didn't confirm, when he was shown a picture of the victim, he said, I'm not ready to talk about that one, leading the FBI to strongly believe that 49-year-old Deborah Feldman is a confirmed victim. Deborah had gone missing from her home in New Jersey on April 8th. Her remains were never recovered. Keyes had said something about one of his victims being a woman with pale skin who possibly came from money, and agents were able to place him in Indiana at the time when a young woman had gone missing. It had been a high-profile missing persons case, and one that Keyes had searched on his computer multiple times. Lawrence Spear was 20 years old, a University of Indiana student, and had gone missing in the early morning hours on June 3rd in 2011. She had gone out with friends and was seen heavily intoxicated. 
She'd been seen on surveillance, not wearing shoes, walking home around 4.30 a.m. She had left her cell phone and shoes at the bar and had dropped her purse and keys along the way. She never made it home and was never located. When Keyes was asked if he had anything to do with Lauren's disappearance, he didn't give a definitive answer. Without more evidence, it is unlikely that these cases will ever be tied back to Keyes officially. There is also no way of knowing for sure how many victims are out there. Based on his travels, cell phone records, potential evidence on his computer, the scope is just too wide. In addition to his time in the military and work as a park ranger, Keyes had also stated that he'd considered becoming a police officer. He felt that being a police officer would give him the perfect cover to hunt for victims. He imagined driving around at night and using the police lights to pull over victims, but ultimately decided being a self-employed contractor made more sense to him. In May of 2012, Keyes had attempted to escape court during a hearing. The FBI had wanted to move him to a more secure facility, but he couldn't get moved until he was charged and sentenced. They didn't feel that the correctional officers in Anchorage understood how dangerous Keyes was, both to himself and others. He was supposed to be monitored 24-7 with armed guards and frequent check-ins. He also wasn't allowed anything with a sharp edge or anything that could be a tool to harm himself. He had been given a pencil and had slowly worked to whittle it with his teeth into a lock-picking tool for his handcuffs and leg irons. He had been saving plastic wrap from his meals to make rope and was also found to be saving all the pieces of dental floss he'd been given daily. It was the plastic wrap and the lead lock picks that allowed him to get out of his cuffs and leg irons in court in May. Despite the warnings and this escape attempt, the Anchorage Corrections hadn't taken any of the necessary precautions the FBI had outlined, and it didn't change anything after. On December 1st, 2012, it was discovered that Keyes had committed suicide by cutting his wrists. He had managed to get a razor blade back to his cell and had been left unsupervised for several hours. A note had been found that consisted of an ode to murder letter, as well as 12 drawings. The drawings were in Keyes' own blood and were 11 skulls and one pentagram with the phrase, We are one, written on the bottom. It could be a hint detailing how many victims he has in total, or it could be completely meaningless. There really is no way to know for sure. A lot of people look at how Israel Keyes was caught as a reflection of how he was as a criminal. The kidnapping and murder of Samantha Koenig had been his unraveling. No one really knows for sure what was going on, but multiple people had speculated that his drinking was out of hand, and they thought he was likely using harder substances. Many people in his life had noted that he was calm, collected, and always put together, but in 2012 they had noticed a different side of Keyes, one that was impulsive, erratic, and disorganized. Keyes even said about himself, Back when I was smart admitting that he even recognized something had changed. Back when I was smart, I would um, do it. I would let them come to me. Many serial killers want to be caught. They also want recognition and notoriety. He also said that his long-term girlfriend Kimberly's relationship had run its course. Like we see with many other serial killers, disruptions in the home or close relationships can set off a chain of events. We saw that with the Golden State Killer. His divorce had led to a months-long murder spree. Keyes went for years, possibly decades, with methodical, organized, and pre-planned crimes. He had buried weapon caches for years, keeping track of all of their locations for sometimes years only in his head carrying out numerous crimes without leaving physical evidence, his elaborate traveling routes all using paper maps and keeping hours of research only in his mind. Up until 2012, he didn't make mistakes. We can only link crimes to him based on his travels. Many of his victims' bodies were never recovered. The FBI theorized that he would commit crimes in one state, bring them to a secondary location, potentially in another state, and dump their bodies in a third location. 
This is why he's considered one of the most dangerous, methodical, and Chilean serial killers of his time. Good afternoon, and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you're new to the channel, hello and welcome, and if you're returning, welcome back. As always, if you could give this video a like and comment with your thoughts down below, that would be much appreciated as it helps the channel to grow. And if you're not yet subscribed to the channel, go ahead and click that red button because I make more content like this and hit the little bell icon so you get notified when I post because I am bad at keeping a regular schedule. Today, we are discussing three hired hitman fails. Let's get into it. Number one, Lulu Durantes. Ramon Sosa was a fighter from a young age, originally from Carolina, Puerto Rico. He grew up boxing with his father and dreamed of making it big. When he was young, he moved to Houston, Texas, but returned to Puerto Rico at age 17 to become a professional boxer. He succeeded and during his career, he became known as the Puerto Rican Express. After a few years, he longed for a life outside the ring. He went back to Houston, Texas and began training professional fighters instead. He then met his first wife, had three kids, and opened up his first boxing gym. By 2000, his marriage had ended, but his business was thriving. Then, in 2007, he met Lulu. He was out at a salsa club when Maria Lourdes Durantes, aka Lulu, stepped on his foot. They instantly connected, and that night, they danced the night away. Ramon said in an interview, I was under her spell. Ramon proposed to Lulu after one year of dating, and they married on March 15, 2009. Ramon recalls a moment at their wedding when Lulu's mother came up to him and whispered in his ear, Now she's your trouble. Ramon's children felt that Lulu was cold to them. It seemed like she didn't want to do anything with them and didn't like him spending money on them. Animosity grew between Ramon's children and Lulu, so much so that they didn't attend the wedding. Ramon opened a second gym with Lulu in 2010, where she became a personal trainer and kept the books. But after a few years, cracks started to emerge in their marriage. Lulu told friends that Ramon had become lazy and that she was working more than he was. She also claimed that he had been physical with her, grabbing or pushing her and forcing her into sex. Ramon was never charged with those claims. Over time, Ramon grew more and more concerned. Lulu had been in the U.S. on a visitor's visa, but when she got her American citizenship, Ramon worried she wouldn't need him anymore. Around the same time, money started to go missing from the business. He wondered if Lulu was skimming money and what she was doing with it. Then he found out in 2015 when Lulu hired a divorce attorney, Julio Hoglar. Lulu had brought Hoglar photos of scratches on her arms that she claimed were from Ramon forcing himself on her. Ramon claimed it was fabricated. She also had a photo of a hole in a door which Ramon admitted he caused by punching the door out of frustration with Lulu's accusations. During all of this, Lulu and Ramon lived on different floors of the same home. Lulu continued to confide in friends that she feared Ramon would seriously hurt her. Then, in June 2015, a man named Mundo was working out at the gym and overheard a conversation between Lulu and her 16-year-old daughter. Mundo, who was friends with both Ramon and Lulu, said that they were discussing a client at the gym who allegedly had ties to Hitman, and they mentioned Ramon. The next day, Mundo confronted Lulu, and she told him that she was tired of Ramon and wished he'd disappear. He knew his friend was in danger, so he acted fast. He convinced Lulu that he believed her abuse claims and that he had trusted connections to a hitman she could use. He then told Ramon everything. They called the police and they were told nothing could be done based on the conversations alone. They needed hard evidence. And so Ramon and Mondo decided to launch their own undercover investigation. First, Mundo would pretend to hire a hitman for Lulu, named Paco. Using burner phones, he would text details of the murder for hire to the hitman so he could show Lulu it was legit, but the person on the other end of the text would be Ramon. Ramon was going to pretend to be his own hitman. 
At the same time, Mundo started recording his conversations with Lulu to gather evidence, including a conversation where she was explicitly saying she wanted Ramon killed. But they started worrying about Lulu. What if she had someone else hired as a backup? What if she ran out of patience and had the job completed herself? Ramon started carrying a gun, even keeping it under his pillow at night and becoming increasingly paranoid. Then, the police showed up at the house Lulu and Ramon shared. Ramon had gotten into an altercation with Lulu's son over a truck, and her son had video evidence of Ramon knocking his phone out of his hand while he was recording the incident. Her son accused Ramon of punching him in the face, which Ramon denies. I'm an ex-professional fighter, he said in a CBS News interview. If I would have hit the kid, believe me, he would not be standing up right now. I didn't put a hand on that kid. Lulu and Ramon attended a court hearing. Lulu wanted a restraining order against Ramon, but instead, he was ordered to move out and stay away from their Woodlands gym location, the one they had together. Ramon also got a restraining order against Lulu, so she couldn't enter his other gym, which he owned before they met. Ten days later, Paco, the hitman, aka Ramon, texted Mundo that he needed $200 for a 9mm gun he would use in the hit. Lulu paid the deposit, and that's when Ramon and Mundo decided it was time to go to the police. Lieutenant Mike Atrix at the Precinct 3 Constable's office in Montgomery County, Texas, got the call. He said getting a call from a man claiming there was a murder-for-hire plot against him was extremely rare. In fact, it was the first one of his career. The police took over the case from there, using Mundo as their inside source. He scheduled a meeting on July 20th between Lulu and an undercover agent acting as Paco. Lulu agreed and met with Paco in a parking lot near the gym. She brought with her jewelry, watches, and $500 as payment. Though this exchange gave police enough evidence to arrest Lulu then and there, they were still concerned about her abuse allegations against Ramon, and so they hatched a plan. The police said Ramon would have to fake his own death. They'd take a photo of him dead in a grave with a fake gunshot wound to the head to show Lulu the hit was completed. They discussed their plan with Ramon and he agreed to it. They watched YouTube videos on how to apply makeup to make the wound look as realistic as possible and referenced real crime scene photos as they staged Ramon's murder. They placed Ramon in a grave in a rural location with his hands bound behind him, wearing nothing but his underwear. Then, they covered him in more blood and dirt before snapping their photos. At that moment, Ramon remembered thinking, I cannot believe this. I cannot believe what I'm doing. This is what Lulu wanted. Right here, this is what she wanted. On July 23, 2015, the police arranged a second meeting between Lulu and Paco to show her the photo evidence and receive payment. The chilling interaction was captured on video by police and included footage of Lulu laughing. The chilling interaction was captured on video by police and included footage of Lulu laughing after seeing the photo of her supposed murdered husband. Pues, she paid him the rest of the money. Tengo mil. And I get upset about how Lulu reacted when they actually showed, when the officer showed her the picture of me dead. No se levanta ya. She started laughing and raising her hands, and I tell people, like, she hit the lotto. This is, this is her big shot. The next day, the police went to the gym Lulu was working at to inquire about her missing husband. They asked her about Ramon's whereabouts, but she said she hadn't seen or talked to him due to their ongoing divorce. The police then placed her under arrest, and she was charged with solicitation of capital murder. While Lulu awaited trial, her assault charges against Ramon were dismissed. She also agreed to a divorce settlement, which gave Ramon both gyms and their house. In October of 2016, 41-year-old Lulu Durantes pled guilty to a reduced charge of second-degree solicitation of murder, avoiding a trial and possible life sentence. She was given 20 years in state prison. And after looking at all the evidence, and I will hear all the audio, I would see her, and there was no remorse in her voice. There was no repent. There was just anger, anger, anger. Every time I heard those 
audios and it was to send chills down my back. Sosa planned out the murder for hire plot last year. She promised the agent $2,000 and her husband's truck once the job was done. Her husband Ramon spoke out in court and said he and his wife were going through a divorce and everything would be split down the middle. But it wasn't good enough. She wanted him dead all for the greed of money. And there was a time when I was thinking maybe, you know, I should just go forward and say, look, man, you're doing, this is wrong. But every time I listened to the audio, she wanted me dead bad. She wanted me dead bad. She even said it, that I was better to her dead. Number two, Belonga Kalala. In 2004, Noella Rocundo immigrated from Burundi, East Africa to Melbourne, Australia as a refugee to start a new life with her five children. During her immigration, she met a fellow Congolese refugee named Belanga Kalala. Kalala was a forklift operator whose wife and children had been killed by a rebel army in Congo before he came to Australia. They shared a social worker who would ask Kalala to translate for Noella as they both spoke Swahili. They quickly fell in love and got married. Over the years, they had three more children together. Then Kalala began to suspect Noella was cheating on him, though his accusations were never proven. He was convinced, though, and wanted to have her killed, so he devised a plan. In January of 2015, Noella was back in Burundi for her stepmother's funeral. She was staying at a hotel and got a call from her husband. She walked outside and was immediately confronted by an armed man who directed her to get into a vehicle. There, there were two other armed men who were waiting for her inside. She was blindfolded and taken to a warehouse where they tied her to a chair. But instead of murdering her, they told her everything. Her husband had paid them nearly $7,000 to kill her, but since they didn't murder women or children, they refused to follow through with it. Instead, the kidnappers were just gonna tell Kalala that they'd kill Noella and, she could, and they'd keep the money. At first, she didn't believe their claims about her husband. To prove it, they called Kalala and put him on the speakerphone to confirm what they should do next. He simply said, kill her. Noella fainted when she heard his reply. Noella didn't make it to the funeral and she was considered missing. Her brother started to worry. He called Kalala and asked him to send money over so the police could look into her disappearance, which he did. On February 19, 2015, the kidnappers dropped Noella off on the side of the road with the evidence she'd needed to convict her husband of his crimes, including a memory card with phone conversations and payments of receipts. The kidnappers left Noella with one final message. You have 80 hours to leave the country. Other people may not spare your life like we did. She immediately contacted the Kenyan and Belgian embassies to help get her back to Australia. She also called her pastor, explaining that she was indeed alive and that she needed his help. Back in Melbourne, Kalala told Noella's relatives that she died in an accident. He held her funeral at their home on February 22, 2015. That same day, Noella watched as her loved ones left her very own funeral. Then, she stepped out of the car. Kalala shocked asked if she was a ghost. He touched her shoulder to see if she was real, and Noella exclaimed, Surprise! I'm alive! <laughs> Kalala began apologizing for everything he'd done, but it was too late, and Noella called the police. The police obtained a court order against Kalala and secretly recorded him admitting to Noella that he'd ordered the hit on her. The police arrested Kalala, who first denied his part in the murder for hire, only to confess after they played the recording. Kalala was charged with incitement to murder on December 11, 2015, and sentenced to nine years in prison. At his sentencing, Chief Justice Marilyn Warren said, Had Miss Rakundo's kidnappers completed the job, eight children would have lost their mother. It was premeditated and motivated by unfounded jealousy anger, and a desire to punish Miss Rakundo. Number three, Lawrence Henley. All of you, thanks so much for joining us. We're learning more about an alleged kidnapping plot in Lafayette. It resulted in the arrest of an Acadiana businessman and the death of two men who were reportedly hired to kidnap the suspect's ex. August 6, 2017 was a hot summer night in Lafayette, Louisiana. Chandra Handley was at home with her 14-year-old daughter and a neighbor who had come over for a visit. 
The doorbell rang and Chandra answered and it was two men in blue uniforms who wanted to demonstrate a carpet steamer for her. Chandra declined and as she did, the men forced their way into her home holding semi-automatic handguns. They immediately pulled a hood over Chandra's head and handcuffed her and also handcuffed her daughter and the visiting neighbor. They pulled Chandra out of the house and pushed her into a van, leaving her daughter and neighbor behind. The men driving the van were Sylvester Bracey and Arsenio Haynes, both 27 years old, and they'd been hired by her estranged husband to kidnap her. Her husband, 53-year-old Lawrence Handley, was a business executive from Lafayette who'd become a millionaire by the time he was 30. He ran a software and vitamin business and was chief executive of a drug treatment center that sold in a $21 million deal in 2015. He himself had battled with alcoholism, which he blamed on his immense fortune. Shonda and Handley had married in 2006. Ten years later, they were filing restraining orders against each other due to abusive incidents. Handley filed for divorce and accused Chandra of attacking him, threatening him, and hiring a hitman to kill him. Chandra was charged with two domestic violence allegations. Chandra accused Handley of tracking her phone, accessing her emails, installing spyware on her computer, and sending her threatening messages. During their divorce, Handley constantly threatened Chandra, allegedly telling her that Armageddon was coming. At one point, Chandra had live-in security at her house due to her ex-husband's threats. I knew he was coming to get me, she said. It was around this time that Hanley began planning his kidnapping. His lawyer said Hanley had been using methamphetamine and cocaine for days beforehand and that he planned to rescue Chandra from the kidnappers so he could be seen as a hero and win her back. To pull it off, he needed hitmen. Enter Bracey and Haynes, both from Mississippi and both with criminal records. He met with them at his family camp near Woodville, Mississippi, which was captured on video surveillance. In the video, Hanley offers to pay the men for the crime in 19 gold bars. Detective Jared Istray obtained a video of Hanley planning the kidnapping, along with checklists and evidence of him renting the van and handcuffs used by the kidnappers. During the van ride, the kidnappers threatened, tortured, and abused Chandra. When they hit a traffic jam on Interstate 10, they decided to make their own shortcut and began speeding along the shoulder of the road. That's when they were spotted by an off-duty sheriff's deputy, who speculated the vehicle may be stolen and tried to stop it. They began a high-speed chase until the driver drove off the road onto a dead-end street. The kidnappers then abandoned the van with Chandra inside and attempted to flee the scene by jumping into the intercoastal canal. The police were unable to locate the men until less than a day later, when their bodies were found. They'd both drowned. Handley was arrested four days later at the hotel near New Orleans, where he was trying to escape the country by chartering a plane. In July of 2021, he pleaded guilty to two counts of second-degree kidnapping and one count of attempted second-degree kidnapping. He faced up to 35 years in prison. Handley originally pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, which was disallowed after he was determined to be mentally competent enough to stand trial. Since he entered a plea deal, he avoided an aggravated kidnapping charge, which would have landed him a life sentence. Good afternoon, and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you're new to the channel, hello and welcome. For everyone returning, welcome back. Today, we are going to be delving into cold cases solved by internet sleuths. Since the beginning of the internet, people have been using their skills, time, and effort into helping police agencies solve crime. Their genuine interest in these cases keep the cases alive. They dedicate innumerable hours to these cases, crowdsourcing skills. They use various social media platforms to breathe life into case files no one else is looking into and use their voices to speak on behalf of these lost cases. The catch? They aren't police investigators. They're everyday, average people, searching through crime files in their spare time in hopes of helping to solve cold cases. Let's get into it. Number one. Grateful Doe. 
Grateful Doe was a young male estimated to have been between the ages of 15 and 21 years of age at the time of his death. He was found in the passenger side of a VW Vanagon on the side of a road on Route 58 West. The vehicle had hit a pair of trees and neither he nor the driver of the vehicle had been wearing seat belts. The accident occurred in 1995 and the driver had been quickly identified as Michael Hager. The passenger, however, had no identification on him. He only had two scalped Grateful Dead concert tickets, a dollar and quarters, and a yellow Bic lighter. He was given the name because he was wearing a Grateful Dead t-shirt as well as the tickets. It was thought by police that Grateful Doe was hitchhiking and Michael Hagar picked him up because he'd been wearing a Grateful Dead t-shirt because Hagar had also liked the band. Neither young men had drugs or alcohol in their system and police theorized that Hagar had fallen asleep at the wheel. Grateful Doe had severe lacerations on his face, thus a post-mortem photograph wasn't released to the public. They input his fingerprints, but they never had any results. There had been a note recovered from the scene that said, Jason, sorry, we had to go, see you around, call me. Then there was a number, and it was signed Carolyn T. and Carolyn O. The police attempted to locate the Carolyns, but because the number had no area code, it was a near impossible task. Grateful Doe had brown eyes, long curly brown or a darker blonde hair color that had recently been colored red. He had a star tattoo on his upper left arm and another faded tattoo on his right arm. He had been wearing a beaded necklace, had his left ear pierced but wasn't wearing an earring, and had a scar on his back. He had been cross-referenced with over 200 missing persons, but never found a match. In 2013, police had released a digital reconstruction of Grateful Doe, and in 2014, the website WebSleuths put out a massive social media campaign to attempt to get the case solved before the 20th anniversary of his death. The campaign had his digital image shared on Imgur, Reddit, and on Grateful Dead forums, BuzzFeed, and local media. The mantra was simple, we just need to get this to be seen at the right place, at the right time, by the right eyes. The social media blitz was successful, and two men replied having known Grateful Doe as teens and were able to get the post to his family. January 13th, 2015, Margareta Evans posted on the Grateful Doe Facebook page, OMG, this is my son. Grateful Doe was officially identified as Jason Callahan. He had left home on June 1st to follow a Grateful Dead summer tour. He was 18 when he left home and hadn't even made it four weeks into the summer tour before the accident. He was never declared missing because his family had wanted to believe he had just picked up and started a life somewhere. After nearly 20 years, it hadn't been the news Margareta wanted to hear. Police credit the site Web Sleuths for organizing a successful social media campaign that had served its purpose to find someone who knew him. Number two, Jacob Wetterling. Jacob was 11 years old in 1989. He was from St. Joseph, Minnesota, and October 22nd, he was abducted. He had been out biking with his younger brother and his friend Aaron Larson at around 9 p.m. They had gone to a corner store only four blocks from their home to rent a movie. Before they had went out, they had called their parents who were at a dinner party to ask their mother for permission to go out. She adamantly said no because it was already dark and she was concerned cars wouldn't be able to see them biking. When they hung up the phone, they revised their plan and spoke to their father, telling him they would have flashlights and wear reflective vests. Their father felt it was a well-thought-out plan, and since it was the three of them, he said it was fine. On their way back, on a particularly dark stretch of road, a man in dark clothing and a mask jumped out of a driveway. He had a revolver and ordered the boys to throw their bikes into the ditch and lie face down on the ground. The boys complied. 
Then the masked man asked each boy to give him their ages. Jacob's younger brother was told to run to a nearby wooded area and not to turn around or he would be shot. He next demanded the remaining boys show him their faces. Then he told Aaron to run into the woods and not look back or he would be shot. Then he grabbed Jacob by the elbow and began dragging him away. This was the last time Jacob was seen. The two boys sprinted home, 911 was called, and their parents were contacted. Within six minutes of the 911 call, a sheriff's deputy was on the scene. When he found the boys' bikes, he immediately called for backup. Additionally, the FBI were alerted. Throughout the night, Jacob was searched for, and over the next few days, the search began to dwindle with no suspects or evidence. The case quickly went cold. Joy Baker had been 32 when Jacob had been abducted. She remembered the missing posters, the ongoing theories, the pleads of Jacob's mother on TV to bring him home, and it had haunted her. She often thought back on it as she raised her own children. Two decades had passed since Jacob's abduction when she started blogging about her investigation. She had heard of a man who had come forward with a story that was eerily similar to Jacob's abduction. Jared Shirel had been 12 when he was walking home from a local cafe in Cold Spring, Minnesota, only 12 miles from St. Joseph's. A man in a car slowed down and asked him for directions. When Jared stopped walking to point, the man grabbed him and pulled him inside his vehicle. He was driven to a remote area and sexually assaulted. The man drove him back into town and asked him repeatedly if he recognized him. When Jared said no, he let him out of the vehicle and told him to run, and if he looked back, he would be shot. The traumatic incident had happened nine months before Jared's abduction, and it made Joy think that maybe the man in the attacks was the same. Investigators on the case had told her they were unrelated and were convinced so. Baker pursued every lead available to her and then some. She reached out to Jared and the two began to piece evidence together and they found more unsolved sexual assaults involving young boys in the area. Each boy said the same thing about the man. He had told them to run or I'll blow your head off or something similar. Baker alerted the Stearns County Sheriff's Office, who had told them they had never heard of these assaults, but didn't believe they were connected to Jacob. Joy and Jared spent hours, hundreds of hours, searching for the other victims and getting their stories straight from the source. They relentlessly harassed the County Sheriff's Office, they did interviews with local media, they involved Jacob's mother. The story was featured on John Walsh's CNN TV show, The Hunt. This was the final media push that made the FBI take action and relaunch the investigation. DNA evidence that had been collected from Jared's sexual assault was retested in 2015 and it hit a match. Danny James Heinrich. Although the statute of limitations were up for his case, he couldn't be charged with Jared's assault, and a search led to the discovery of child pornography in Heinrich's home. Heinrich was offered a plea deal, and part of the deal was to reveal the location of Jacob's body. He accepted, and on September 1, 2016, he led investigators to the burial site. On September 3rd, an announcement was made that Jacob's body had been found and identified. Unfortunately, the plea bargain meant that Heinrich would only be charged for the child pornography possession and he would serve a maximum sentence of 20 years in a federal medical center in Massachusetts. Joy Baker and Jared Sherrill were the reason the FBI reopened the investigation. Jacob's mother publicly thanked the pair for their dedication to see this crime through to the end. Joy blogged the entire experience and I will link her blog in the description box below. Number three, Lyle Stevick. 
On September 16, 2001, a young man in his early 20s checked into a motel in the state of Washington. He was checked in under the name Lyle Stevick, which was an alias most likely derived from the book You Must Remember This, where the Stevick character contemplates suicide. His body was discovered by housekeeping the following day. He had hung himself in a closet with his belt. When he had checked in the previous day, he had only paid for one night, and when he was discovered on a nightstand was $160 with a note that said, For the room. Stevick had no luggage with him, only a toothbrush and toothpaste were found in the room. He had no identification, no bank cards, no driver's license. He was 6'2", but only weighed 140 pounds. His clothing hung off him loosely, making police think that he had lost a lot of weight recently. Detectives asked around locally to see if anyone had seen or interacted with the young man, or if any of the bus drivers had dropped him off near the motel. No leads. No missing person report matching his description. His dental records and fingerprints were run through all FBI databases and no matches. The name Lyle Stevick wasn't in any records, from a phone book to data census records. The address he had given was a Best Western in the next town over, which, according to them, he had never stayed at. Lyle Stevick's case, like so many others, had gone cold quickly. Although in his case, he had gone out of his way to make his identification challenging. His death had come right after 9-11, and it had been theorized that he may have been involved with the 9-11 terror attacks. He had become a somewhat popular subject on the website Reddit, where people shared theories but also spent hours trying to find his identity. They had put together a fundraiser to have his DNA tested, and the DNA Doe Project stepped in to help. He was identified after 17 years. His family was notified, and they decided to keep his identity withheld for privacy. It was confirmed, however, he had been a runaway, estranged from his family and struggling with mental health issues. He had been from California and was 25 when he died. His family had never reported his missing due to the estrangement. Some people in the Reddit community, at its highest point, the subreddit had over 4,000 people strong, felt it was hard to move on after the mystery was over. They had committed so much time and emotional investment in Lyle's investigation that it was hard to believe it was time to move on. A moderator for the subreddit thread was quoted as saying, It was a group of individuals working towards something really amazing, and yes, it was all worth it. Number 4. Griffith Park, Jane Doe In the early morning hours on June 8, 1968, a young woman was found slumped over on a park bench in Griffith Park, Los Angeles, California. Initially thought to be sleeping, the petite woman with bleach blonde hair was discovered to have died of an apparent drug overdose. Authorities noted she seemed well put together. She had manicured nails, freshly colored and styled hair, and had very uniquely shaped eyebrows. She was wearing a red and white polka dot bikini with a light overcoat and sandals. She looked like she had just walked off the beach. She had no identification, and the only jewelry she was wearing was a plain gold wedding band with the inscription CB to EJ 9420. Police had been certain that someone would be able to identify the young woman, but they were surprised when no one came to claim her. Police found she'd been staying at a nearby motel, and she'd been using the name Cheryl Miller. They couldn't find anything connecting her to that name and gave her the identification number Jane Doe number 18. She remained unidentified for 48 years. In 2010, Carl Kopelman was sent her file from the Doe Network. He was instantly drawn to her black and white post-mortem photo. He said that she had looked like Marilyn Monroe. 
Carl was a moderator on the website Web Sleuths and was the first to do a reconstruction of the Griffith Park Jane Doe. Once the image was generated, he had posted it to his Facebook page. A former colleague and friend of Copeland, Rita Ellen Hood, was on her lunch break and while scrolling through Facebook, she saw Copeland's post on the Jane Doe. He had included all identifiable information in the case, and Rita had become fixated on the ring with the inscription. She had noted that she had a similar inscription on her own wedding band. She went home that night and logged into the popular genealogy site Ancestry.com and began poring over records trying to find a marriage license that matched the initials and the date. Once her family would go to bed, the mother of two would continue doing the obsessive search for four weeks until she found a Charles J. Bush who married a Edna Lydia J. in Detroit, Michigan on September 4th, 1920. Finding this, she delved into Edna Bush's history. Edna had passed in 1932 of ill health when she was only 30 years old, but left behind two daughters. One of her daughters, Geraldine Bush, had married John Paul Manzo, and via Facebook, she found someone she'd hoped was their son. She messaged John Manzo Jr. on September 9th to ask him if he was related to Edna Bush and if Geraldine was his mother. Two days later, Manza confirmed that Edna had been his grandmother and his late mother was Geraldine Bush. Rita then asked if he knew who had been in possession of his grandmother's wedding band because a Jane Doe had turned up in California. He responded back with two words, call me. He and Rita were both nervous on the call and he had said his sister had been missing since 1968. Rita shared all the information she had on the Jane Doe, and John was sure Jane Doe was his sister, Cheryl McMillan. Cheryl had been 15 years older than John. She had been the result of their mother's first marriage. John had been from her third. He remembered her faintly but fondly. He said that he had fond memories of Cheryl and their cousin taking him to the beach to meet boys. He remembered his big sister being doting and spoiled him. Cheryl had moved to Los Angeles after high school and had moved to California on a scholarship for UCLA. She had lost contact with her family at one point, and her mother had hired a private investigator. The investigator had found her, and she told him to tell them I'm fine. John had been told by relatives that his mother had filed a missing persons report, but when Rita Hood had contacted him, he looked into it, and police couldn't find any reports on his sister. He had also begun speaking with other relatives, and a cousin had given some details she had previously withheld. His cousin Ellen had been very close to Cheryl as they were close in age, and she had spoken to her right before her disappearance. Ellen said that Cheryl had missed a dress fitting for her wedding, and when she spoke to her about it, Cheryl promised that she would not miss the wedding, reassuring her that she was the maid of honor and nothing would stop her from attending. But Ellen knew something was different with Cheryl. When Ellen had last visited her, she was introduced to new friends of Cheryl's. She had also been dating a new guy with the last name Miller that Ellen felt was bad news. Cheryl had confided in Ellen that she was being used as a drug mule to bring product from Mexico into California. Ellen had assumed that Cheryl's disappearance had been a result of her running drugs. Ellen knew that Cheryl had been using drugs for some years before 1968 and wasn't surprised she had died of an overdose. Her younger brother, although saddened by the confirmation that his sister would never come back, he was also grateful for the knowledge that she hadn't simply abandoned him wordlessly. He was also glad that she had never pawned off their grandmother's wedding ring, because if she had, she never would have been identified. Although police had no DNA to confirm, Cheryl had been cremated. Using photographs and family members' positive identifications, they confidently stated that Cheryl McMillan was the Griffith Park Jane Doe and she had died in 1968 at the age of 21. 
After the identification, John and Rita met in person and John said that he considers Rita to be a part of the family and is grateful that she was able to make the connection. These cases prove that everyday normal people can help solve cold cases. They are proving every week that if a story ends up in front of the right person at the right time, that someone can shed new light or bring new evidence into the forefront that could lead to a case being solved. There is also something that can be said about crowdsourcing for new leads in a case. When you're working on anything, it can be easy to get tunnel vision and sometimes a fresh pair of eyes is needed to look at something from a different angle. Hello everyone and welcome back to another True Crime Mysteries video. Thank you all for being here. Today we're discussing five most wanted fugitives that were located and arrested in 2022. Let's get into it. Number 1. Caitlin Armstrong On May 11, 2022, 25-year-old Anna Mo Mariah Wilson was discovered deceased in a friend's home in Austin, Texas. Wilson was a professional cyclist and was in Austin for a race. Earlier that evening, Wilson had gone out for dinner with a fellow cyclist and previous romantic partner. The two reportedly weren't seeing each other at that time, but had ended things recently amicably. After dinner, Wilson was dropped off at home. Around 10 p.m. that night, a black Jeep Grand Cherokee was seen on video surveillance arriving at the house Wilson was staying at. The vehicle was only there briefly before leaving again. Shortly later, Wilson was found with several gunshot wounds. Wilson was declared deceased at the scene. The murder investigation quickly connected the shooting to Wilson's ex-boyfriend's current girlfriend, Caitlin Armstrong. In addition to Armstrong owning a black Jeep Grand Cherokee, she also owned two firearms and one of them matched the shell casings found at the murder scene. Through Wilson's cell phone records, investigators were able to piece together a motive. Armstrong had likely discovered that her boyfriend had been seeing Wilson and had murdered her in a jealous rage. The boyfriend initially denied any romantic connection to Wilson, but after seeing cell phone records, eventually admitted that he had been seeing the two women romantically and they apparently didn't know. However, it appeared that Armstrong figured out her boyfriend's double life. Armstrong was brought in for questioning the next day and was asked why her vehicle was seen on surveillance outside a murder victim's home, and she offered no explanation. Soon into the interview, Armstrong lawyered up. Law enforcement had wanted to arrest Armstrong that day on suspicion of murder. However, there had been an issue with some paperwork and they were forced to release her. Six days later, on May 17th, they had an arrest warrant. However, when they showed up at her home, Caitlin Armstrong wasn't there. They discovered that the 31-year-old yoga instructor had been busy starting from the moment of her release. Armstrong had ID allegedly belonging to her sister, she had sold her vehicle for $12,000 cash, and had used that cash to elaborately travel from Texas to Costa Rica in order to make it more confusing. And we start tonight with an update on the Love Triangle murder case, one that we have been following closely for weeks. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Marnie Hughes. It has now been six weeks since Caitlin Armstrong took off, accused in the murder of pro cyclist Mo Wilson. The U.S. Marshals have upgraded the status of this case to major, which basically means they are putting more resources into finding the yoga instructor. There have also been several major developments. First, we have learned that Caitlin sold her Jeep for about $12,000 before she was going on the run at a dealership near Austin, Texas. Police are now trying to follow that money trail, determine if she cashed the check and where did she do it. 
There is also a major reward being offered in this case, at last check, up to $21,000. And then there is this, new images tonight showing what Caitlin might look like if she changed her appearance, specifically her hair. For 43 days, Armstrong had been moving around Costa Rica. In that time, she had plastic surgery to alter her appearance, she cut and colored her hair, and was jumping from hostel to hostel, teaching yoga where she could earn cash using a variety of aliases. U.S. Marshals apprehended Armstrong at a hostel in Santa Teresa on June 29, 2022. When arrested, she had denied that she was Caitlin Armstrong and was held in Costa Rica until her identity could be confirmed by fingerprint. From there, she was arraigned and deported back to Texas, where she remains in custody for the murder of Anna Wilson. She has pleaded not guilty and is currently being held on a $3.5 million bond. Her trial is scheduled for June 22, 2023. Let me know if you want any updates on this trial. There may be additional charges and arrests made if law enforcement can prove that Caitlin Armstrong was assisted in fleeing the country. Number 2. Quashon Burton Wanted fugitive Quashon Burton was on the run for nearly a year before he was tracked down after being spotted by a federal agent, Jeff Andre, on vacation at Disney World. Andre was also on vacation and in a strange cosmic coincidence had spotted Burton while at the Animal Kingdom theme park. The 32-year-old Brooklyn, New York native had been charged with fraud after stealing the identities of four people and applying for several COVID-19 relief loans. The fraud scheme had allowed him to collect over $150,000. He had been charged in November 2021 in a crackdown that discovered dozens of fraudulent schemes to collect on pandemic relief that had been created to help small businesses. When law enforcement went to arrest him back in 2021, they discovered he had fled his home and had been on the run ever since. Burton had a distinctive H tattoo on his neck, and it was this tattoo that caught the eye of Jeff Andre. Andre, with the help of Disney security, arrested Burton. Burton gave them a fake identity and forged ID at the time of his arrest. He was later brought into custody and fingerprinted, which confirmed his identity. He's being held without bail as he is deemed a flight risk and is waiting for extradition back to New York. Number 3. Lewis Flood Lewis Edward Flood was discovered living in British Columbia, Canada after 20 years on the run for criminal sex offenses with minors. Flood, now 77, disappeared from Idaho when he was released on parole in 2001 after serving three of his 18-year sentence. Flood had been featured on the television show America's Most Wanted in 2011 in hopes that the public would be able to help get him back into custody. It was in July of 22 that a tip came in into the Canadian RCMP in Creston, BC that had reported Flood in the area. The RCMP contacted the U.S. Marshal Service, Idaho State Corrections, and the Idaho State Police, and a coordinated effort was made to arrest Flood. He was arrested on July 21st and extradited back to the U.S. on July 25th, where he will serve the remainder of his 13-year sentence. No word yet on if he committed any further attacks while on the run or how he remained undetected in Canada for so long. Number 4. Usman Kasim 40-year-old Usman Kasim was wanted in Canada and recently apprehended by UK authorities. Kasim had been on Canada's 25 most wanted list for a variety of assault charges, criminal harassment, and failure to comply and attempted murder. In January 2020, Kasim was identified as a suspect in an assault investigation. In April 2020, Kasim allegedly had fired several shots at a couple sitting in a vehicle in a seemingly random attack. Then in October 2021, police were alerted to an attack in a parking structure where a woman was attacked by a man with a firearm. Surveillance connected the attack to Kasim. He was then placed on Canada's Most Wanted in 2022 and was recently discovered to be living in the United Kingdom. There had been a $50,000 reward for information leading to an arrest, and at this time, it is unclear if the reward had motivated someone to provide Kasim's whereabouts. 
He was arrested on November 7, 2022 by UK authorities and is currently being held while he waits to be deported back to Toronto. Number 5. Octaviano Juarez Coro On September 8, 2021, the FBI made an announcement. A Milwaukee fugitive wanted for murder would be added to the FBI's 10 most wanted list, 47-year-old Octavio Juarez Coro. He was wanted for an incident that happened on Memorial Day on May 29, 2006. Hundreds of people were gathered in the South Shore Park in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, all celebrating the American holiday with barbecues and picnics. One family was enjoying themselves when someone noticed trouble approaching them. Octavio Juarez Coro was walking up to the family. He wanted to speak to his estranged wife. It was her family who he had dropped in on uninvited. A friend intervened and tried to get Octavio to leave without causing a scene, but was unsuccessful. Octavio and his soon-to-be ex-wife were in the final stages of their divorce, but couldn't agree on a custody arrangement of their three-year-old daughter. It was this issue that had brought him to the park that day. Octavio refused to leave the family affair, becoming increasingly agitated, and then suddenly produced a handgun. He ordered his ex-wife, her boyfriend, and three other members of her family to get on their knees. In front of his daughter, he began firing, wounding three and killing two. His wife survived two gunshot wounds to the chest, but her boyfriend had been one of the victims killed along with a family friend. Octavio then fled on foot. Officers were not able to locate him, and he remained at large for over a decade. For 16 years, he was on the run, and he was recently captured. It had been thought that Juarez Coro had fled to Mexico, and those suspicions were confirmed when he was spotted in Zapopan, Guadalajara, Mexico. It was a tip from the public that allowed the FBI to capture him. Special Agent Michael Hansel said in a statement, quote, Juarez Coro spent the last 16 years running from law enforcement, hiding in another country, and believing time and distance was on his side. The FBI has a long reach and extraordinary law enforcement partnerships across the globe. I commend the tireless efforts of all our partners from Milwaukee to Mexico in closely coordinating with the FBI in capturing this wanted fugitive and helping to bring this violent offender to justice, as well as closure to the victims and their families. This is another instant of proving that discussing these cases and keeping them in the public eye is an excellent tool for getting these cases solved. After running for 16 years from police, the FBI, and a slew of investigators... If Mr. Juarez Coro wanted to answer to these charges, he had years and years in which to do so. Octaviano Juarez Coro, one of the FBI's most wanted fugitives, is finally behind bars and in court for the South Shore mass shooting. He pulled out his gun and in front of numerous witnesses who know him, including his ex-wife, he executed people. An assistant district attorney pushing for a $10 million bail replayed the scene police laid out from May 29, 2006. Witnesses and surviving family members told police Juarez Coro confronted his ex-wife at a family picnic in South Shore Park, then became upset she wouldn't let him see their daughter. Police say he ordered her and four other people to the ground, shooting them all. His ex-wife, who survived, got two bullets to the chest. We heard what appeared to be fireworks at the time, and when we turned around, there was a man standing over these people by the picnic table, and he was shooting them. Pushing back on the ADA's recommendation for maximum cash bail Wednesday, Juarez Coro's public defender argued he technically has no previous criminal records here and could be let out with an ankle monitor. There was no criminal record because Mr. Juarez Coro is a working man. He is a family man. Mr. Juarez Coro recognize that the allegations in this complaint are very serious and he has expressed he has no intentions of leaving Milwaukee. The court commissioner ultimately setting bail at a million dollars. Some 16 years on the run, Caroline, he's facing multiple counts of intentional homicide and could spend the rest of his life in prison. Hello everyone and welcome back to True Crime Mysteries. 
Today, we have our October Crimes of the Month. In our Crimes of the Month, we cover updates from previous cases, notable crimes covered in the news, and crime-related things that happened that month. As always, your friendly reminder to please give this video a thumbs up if you like the content, and subscribe if you haven't already because I make more content like this. But with that being said, let's get into it. First off, lots and lots of people said they wanted a deep dive into the Murdoch stuff. If you haven't seen it yet, I did that deep dive and I will link it in the description if you missed this. After this, I will keep all updates here in the Crimes of the Month videos unless there is a lot of new stuff to come out. Thank you all for your feedback and don't forget to check that video out. The first update is that there is a team who have said that they have significant evidence that has led them to believe that they've discovered the identity of the Zodiac Killer. Now, the mainstream media really took that and ran with it. Based on headlines, you would think that this was a done deal. But you know how we roll in this channel. We roll with concrete facts, not speculation. I put out a quick little article on Medium that I think this is premature. First, the man is dead, and it is now his family that has been caught up in this media blitz. It also isn't the first time what essentially is a theory has caused a huge media uproar only for that person to be eliminated as a suspect. In fact, it isn't even the first person Case Breakers, the group who made the newest identification, has accused. For those that don't know, the Zodiac Killer is an infamous serial killer from the Northern California area who has been linked to at least five murders from 1968 to 1969. He gave himself the name Zodiac Killer and sent several cards and letters to media outlets, including four ciphers. He claimed in those letters that he has 37 victims, but because of how he killed, it is difficult to link him to other victims. So the group that believes they have identified him are called Case Breakers, and they're a group of retired military, law enforcement, legal professionals, and forensic specialists that solve cold cases. They currently have over 40 members and work on a wide variety of cold cases. I'm going to refer to the man identified as Suspect A because I don't really want to add to any speculations and I also don't want to bring more attention to a family that may have nothing to do with this. Why they think they have identified Suspect A is based on the following evidence. Suspect A was an Air Force veteran and wore a similar sized shoe that may have been left by the Zodiac. There was also a broken watch found at one of the crime scenes that was military issued. They were also able to spell out this man's name using one of the ciphers, and he has a scar on his forehead that appears to be consistent with a police sketch from a surviving victim. Suspect A died in 2018 at 80 years old after suffering from several medical issues for many years. Now, as much as I would like to have this mystery solved as well, it isn't a lot to go on forensically. The FBI has announced that they do not believe this man had anything to do with the Zodiac Killer and have stated the case is still ongoing. Despite this, this man's photo and name are still being continually pushed in the media while investigative journalists are diving into anything they can find. In my opinion, it's irresponsible knowing how many people consume news articles and don't read the full articles and many people are walking away thinking that this is a done deal. But that's my two cents. If anything new comes about this or there are any new revelations or anything like that, I will let you know. As I was finishing up this video, I was alerted that there was an update in this case. We got an announcement from the Mariposa County Sheriff, Jeremy Bryce, and a cause of death was determined for the deaths of Jonathan Garish, Ellen Chung, their one-year-old daughter, and their dog. Over 30 law enforcement agencies reviewed the case, ruling out murder, lightning strikes, poisoning, drugs, and suicide, and the cause of death was determined to be hyperthermia a condition where a person's body temperature gets excessively high due to extreme heat and humidity. 
They determined that the family had likely run out of drinking water and temperatures soared to 43 degrees Celsius or 109 degrees Fahrenheit, and the family was ill-prepared for the extreme heat. The trail had been a very popular hiking area, but in recent years wildfires had devastated the area. The 8-mile loop had very little shade, and though they'd set out quite early, it was already pretty warm when they started, and by the time they got halfway through the trail, the temperatures had already skyrocketed. The family had a 2.5 liter water bottle with them, but it was discovered completely empty. The family made a statement through the sheriff's office saying, Some questions have been answered, and we will use this information as a way of helping us come to terms with the situation. Our hearts will never forget the beautiful lives of Jonathan, Ellen, Miju, and of course, Oski. They will remain with us wherever we go. This case is super tragic, and my thoughts and prayers are with the family at this time. Police forces across Britain are being asked to review their security arrangements for all members of Parliament after Sir David Ames was attacked and stabbed to death while holding a small community event at his church on October 15th. The 69-year-old MP had been serving as a Conservative since 1983 and is the second PM to be murdered in five years while holding similar events. Boris Johnson, the current Prime Minister and Conservative leader, put out this statement. Well, I uh, their investigation. The attacker was arrested and is currently in custody. What is currently known about the attack is that it was carried out by a 25-year-old male, possibly a British national, and it is being described as an act of terrorism. The murder weapon was recovered at the scene and police are saying the man acted alone. Interestingly, because gun laws are so strict in Europe, we don't often see gun violence, however, stabbings are on the rise. MPs generally hold meetings to get an opportunity to speak with their voters and people in the region they represent to hear about local issues. These meetings usually take place in common areas such as church halls or rented out spaces. Calls have been raised to offer more protection to elected officials, similar to what is offered when they meet at Parliament. Amos wrote a book in 2020 about the public and online harassment he had been receiving, saying, these increasing attacks have rather spoiled the great British tradition of the people openly meeting with their elected politicians. Amos was one of the longest serving politicians in the House of Commons and is survived by his wife and five children. I think this is super heartbreaking. No matter where you lean politically, this is horrible. My heart goes out to the families and colleagues of Sir David Amos in what I'm sure is an awful time. On October 13th, a man was arrested for assaulting a woman while on a Philadelphia train. The attack had lasted a total of 40 minutes and was only ended when an off-duty employee of the train intervened and called for law enforcement. The victim, an unidentified woman, said that she boarded the train around 9.15pm. She was intoxicated and alone. She became aware she was on the wrong train and was attempting to orient herself when a man she didn't know came and sat beside her. She had asked the man for help, and he was able to push her to an area with fewer people around. The man is seen on surveillance grabbing and groping at the woman while she was trying to push him away. For 40 minutes, he harassed her, and despite there being several witnesses, no one helped. The attacker was 32-year-old Fishton Noy and was arrested at the scene by police. Noy was charged with rape, involuntary deviated sexual intercourse, sexual assault, and assault. It has also come to light that Noy was not an American citizen. He came to the U.S. in 2012 on a student visa, and his visa has been expired since 2015. He is a Congolese national and has had several convictions, including one for sexual assault in 2017 in Washington, D.C. He had been scheduled for deportation following his arrest in 2017, but had been released when a parole board found that his crime hadn't warranted his deportation. Surveillance shows that at least two witnesses may have recorded the incident on their cell phones. The victim was seen very obviously attempting to get the man away from her. It is disheartening that this very preventable attack happened. 
police are still asking for what they estimate to be about 10 passengers to come forward with any information. They are also urging people to be vigilant and to call 911 or the non-emergency line if they see anything suspicious or criminal in nature. It was 4.30 a.m. on October 20th at the Chevron gas station in Arizona when surveillance captures two individuals dressed in black entering the gas station. One of the individuals that entered was brandishing a weapon and attempting to rob the establishment. What the suspect didn't know was that as he entered, he walked past a customer in line. That customer just so happened to be a former Marine Corps veteran who was able to disarm the suspect within eight seconds. The vet was able to detain the individual until law enforcement was able to arrive and arrest them. The other suspect fled the scene and is still at large. The suspect that was arrested was determined to be a minor and they were booked into the Yuma County Juvenile Justice Center. The investigation is still developing, however, there were no deaths or injuries. Law enforcement applauded the veteran's ability to de-escalate the situation in a way that led to no one getting hurt. So we have another story out of South Carolina. I don't think I've ever talked about this state so much. Is it becoming the new Florida? 27-year-old Victoria Weiss Farish was arrested when it was discovered that one of her students had a package of stoner gummies, a high-dose THC edible product. The student had the package confiscated and when they were asked where they had gotten it, they said it had been a prize from their teacher. According to the student, they had picked a different candy initially, but Miss Weiss had taken it away and told them to grab another one. It was an after-school program caretaker that had discovered the error when the student requested help opening the package, then alerted senior faculty at the elementary school. The assistant principal checked the classroom and discovered another package of cannabis gummies and called law enforcement. A search warrant was issued and deputies discovered that Weiss's home had similar products there. She was arrested and charged with possession of a Schedule I drug as cannabis edibles are not legal in South Carolina. She allegedly stated that she got the candy from a mixed bag at Dollar General. However, it does seem that she knew there was a mistake when she asked the student to pick another packaged candy. No students ate any of the edibles, and Weiss was relieved of her position as an elementary school teacher. She has a pending court date that hasn't been scheduled yet. I just want to know how this happened. I'm not judging people who partake in cannabis products, but how did they end up at school and in a candy prize bin for students? I am just so confused. This is so irresponsible. Continuing on the subject of irresponsible, 47-year-old Shannon O'Connor was extradited from Idaho back to California. She had been arrested following several teens coming forward about what had happened at O'Connor's Los Gatos home in California. The mother of two teen boys is being accused of organizing several wild parties and small gatherings at her home. At these parties, Shannon would buy alcohol for the young teens and encourage them to engage in sexual acts sometimes even watching. Shannon used several Snapchat aliases and generally used the social media platform to communicate with teens. Shannon would foster inappropriate friendships with some of the girls and use them to recruit others to come to these parties. The victims have reported disturbing accounts. Many girls were sexually assaulted and one girl was severely beaten by a boy. O'Connor encouraged this and would even bully and harass teens if they refused. A parent stated that Shannon would coach her daughter on what to say and do to sneak out of the home at night to attend these gatherings. They noticed that after their child had attended one of O'Connor's events, that their daughter started regularly lying, consuming alcohol, and generally being more secretive. They went through their daughter's phone and found hundreds of messages their daughter was having with Shannon. As they came forward with their story, more and more parents came forward saying that their child had spoken up about being victimized at one of O'Connor's parties. One mother said, 
We were really all fooled by the cool mom thing. Looking back, the red flags were there. I'm shocked. I can't believe somebody would do this to the kids. You know, they're, they're not adults. Even you, you shouldn't do this to adults too either. Why do this to kids? When deputies arrived to arrest O'Connor in Idaho, where she had recently relocated with her sons, there were a dozen teenagers at the home. O'Connor had been charged with 39 charges, including felony child endangerment, child molestation, sexual assault, and contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Her husband has not been charged in connection, and their children have been removed from their custody. Their Los Gatos home has been recently listed for sale for $4.7 million. Shannon O'Connor also has 15 protective orders protecting victims and one of her children from being contacted. Shannon is also facing several criminal fraud charges following $120,000 in unauthorized charges to her company's credit cards. She had been working as an administrative assistant for Aruba Networks. Her company card had been used to purchase limousine rentals, clothing, and alcohol deliveries. She faces 20 years in prison if convicted on all accounts, and was denied bail as the judge felt she was likely a flight risk and posed a threat to the public. Let me know if you guys are interested in hearing more about this case. At this point in time, it looks like there may be a trial going forward. Is it just me, or are these stories just getting more and more bizarre the more we do them? For our last story, we have a Massachusetts man who has been found to have fraudulently gained hundreds of thousands of dollars in COVID relief benefits and then tried to fake his own death to avoid going to jail. Spoiler, it didn't work. David Staley is the first person in the U.S. to be charged with defrauding the government from COVID relief loans that were set aside to help small businesses. 54-year-old David Staveley and his accomplice David Andrew Bootsiger claim to own four businesses in Rhode Island with dozens of employees. The pair submitted applications and received nearly $550,000 in funds shortly after the small business loan program was announced. The program was put in place to help small businesses stay afloat and keep their employees on payroll, but upon an audit, it was discovered that the two men had used businesses that they had no affiliation with. Three of them had closed during the pandemic. Apparently, a concerned citizen came forward and tipped off law enforcement while the applications were still pending. Both men had been arrested in May of 2020 and were released while awaiting court proceedings. Weeks later, it was discovered that Stavely had cut off his electronic monitoring device, left several suicide notes with family members and those who had worked with him in the past, and left his vehicle unlocked near the ocean. Despite the appearance that he had committed suicide, those closest to him believed it was very unlike him and an investigation began to look into his disappearance. He was located in Georgia on July 23, 2020. He had used several different aliases, stole license plates, and had used multiple cell phones to evade detection. Stavely had served two separate convictions in federal prison for stealing $284,000 from a minor league baseball team and committing mortgage fraud in New Hampshire. Upon his recapture, he pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit bank fraud, as well as failing to appear in court. This month, he was sentenced to four years in prison and three years of supervised release. Butziger also pleaded guilty to all charges of conspiracy to commit bank fraud, and his sentencing date is on November 1st. <laughs> 